is a conversation that we can all be proud of having participated in, regardless of the outcome. Uh, with that, um, we will now introduce item 612, interim clerk. Thank you, Council President. Item 612 is an informational item and it is the City of San Diego's comprehensive shelter strategy. All right, if our um, speaker would like to introduce yourself for the record and let us know how much time you'd like for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Council President. I'm Mayor Todd Gloria. I'm here uh, with our staff and we need about 30 minutes for the staff presentation on this item. Um, good afternoon, Council President Ilo Rivera, Council President Pro Tem Montgomery Stepp, as well as members of the City Council. I'm pleased here today to be here today to introduce the City's comprehensive shelter strategy, which reviews the shelters that we're providing now our current and future shelter needs, as well as how we intend to fulfill them over the short, medium, and long term. There's no question that we're facing an acute crisis, one that has been building over decades as our housing shortage became more acute. And there's no question that solving homelessness itself has become a more complex puzzle to solve. No longer is the city facing merely a safety net for folks who fell behind on rent or lost job. Today's homeless services providers are faced with thousands of complex situations and reasons for resistance to coming off the streets, a host of personal circumstances that can include serious me medical and mental health conditions, substance use disorder, partners or pets they can't part with, and so much more. Recognizing the diversity of the people experiencing homelessness and their unique needs, we've endeavored over the past two and a half years to create spaces that are suitable for everyone who's ready to take that step to get them to yes. We've opened shelters focusing on women, seniors, people with behavioral health and substance use challenges, families, LGBTQ youth, and the list goes on. We've greatly expanded safe parking in our city for those who are living in their cars to do so legally and safely. And with the proposed launch of our safe sleeping program, we'll address a population of people who have been resistant to congregate shelters, but who do want to come off the street where they can be safer and have access to basic hygiene and get connected to services. All told, with your support, we've added 700 beds to our system, a system that not only has a high utilization rate, but one that has helped to move more than 2,200 of our neighbors into permanent housing. Now, there's still so much more that we must do to get people off the streets safely, and the comprehensive shelter strategy is the roadmap for our continued efforts. I'm exceptionally proud of the work of our city's homelessness strategies and solutions team for their relentless push to bring all of these beds online, while also substantially increasing our outreach program and making it much more effective at helping homeless San Diegans. I'm especially proud of our new director, Sarah Jarman, who has launched headfirst into this challenge and led the development of this strategy that you'll hear about today, as well as its future implementation. I hope that your takeaway from this presentation is that my administration has a clear plan, one that is consistent with the City Council's priorities and informed by national best practices, and we will be executing upon it. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah to provide the details of this strategy. Thank you. Thank you, All right, folks, we're, we're never going to get through the meeting if um, that is how every single comment is responded to. And so um, I'm going to ask that we keep our responses um, quiet, um, signal your support or displeasure. Um, in ways that don't disrupt or slow down the meeting. Thank you. Ms. Jarman. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the City Council. My name is Sarah Jarman and I'm the Director of the Homelessness Strategies and Solutions Department. And joined with me today are Deputy Director James Carter, Assistant Deputy Director Sarah Ferry, and Senior Program Manager Ketra Carter. Today we are here to present the City of San Diego's Comprehensive Shelter Strategy. I would like to take a moment to thank my entire team for the heavy lift of putting together this strategy in collaboration with many, many city departments. We will cover a range of topics, including the current shelter system and city-funded homelessness programs, analysis of the shelter composition and needs assessment, commitment to addressing disparities in our system, our evaluation of potential sites and recommendations, as well as upcoming potential opportunities for the future. Now, I will turn it to James Carter to discuss, to discuss the shelter strategy overview. The comprehensive shelter strategy was developed at a point in time and based on the current environment and available data on hand. This is truly a living document 
and meant to be updated to meet the evolving needs of this population. The plan seeks to define the current city funded shelter system, outline, outline shelters that are in need of transition, and lastly, the plan seeks to provide an analysis of the overall shelter need in the region. The comprehensive shelter strategy also responds to the request from city council members at a recent meetings, including a request from council president Leila Rivera to provide an analysis of potential shelter sites and their viability. And moreover, subsequent requests from council member LaCava and council member Moreno for information on potential sites and various homeless programs, plans, and projects current shelter system and homelessness programs. Now we will present on our current shelter system. The city currently funds 1,784 emergency shelter beds, which serve different populations, including single adult men, single adult women, transition age youth, unaccompanied minors, older adults, and families. The information on this slide is based on 2022 data which was the most up-to-date data on hand while the strategy was being drafted. I'll make mention again that this plan is meant to be updated and changed as new data are available. And now that the 2023 point in time count has been released, we plan to update the strategy once we have had the chance to review those numbers. According to the 2022 HUD man mandated housing inventory count, there was a total of 2,794 emergency shelter beds in all of San Diego County. Of that, 2,401 beds were located within the boundaries of the city. This number includes beds funded by the city, as well as those beds that are not funded by the city. The city accounts for 85% of the countywide inventory of facility-based emergency shelter beds, even though 57% of the county homeless population lives within the city, according to the 2022 point in time count. Last week, the 2023 point in time count results were released. The report shows a 22% increase in the region's homelessness population. Out of 21 San Diego cities, 11 cities provided no shelter beds at all. Five cities reduced their shelter bed availability, and only five cities increased their shelter bed count from 2022 to 2023. The report shows that only 10 cities and regions in the county provide any shelter at all. Meanwhile, the city of San Diego is providing for 908 more people than, we're, than we did last year. Action from all regional partners is necessary to make meaningful changes to, in reducing homelessness in our region. This slide provides a breakdown of the current city funded shelters that make up the 1,784 emergency shelter beds in our system. The city recently expanded the availability of shelter beds with a focus on bridging gaps in the system including a new non-congregate shelter for older adults and several new shelters for women. In addition to traditional shelter beds, the city's homelessness system also includes four safe parking lots funded by the city. Two of those lots provide 60 spaces each for standardized size vehicles, while the Mission Valley lot has capacity for up to 40 up to 84 spaces for a combination of both standard size vehicles and recreational vehicles. The city recently expanded the safe parking program at the Rose Canyon Operations Yard. Differing from the original three locations, this new site includes spaces for standardized size vehicles in addition to 12 camper trailers with beds for families to reside in. The city has several types of street-based outreach teams operating on a daily basis. In total, there are 52.5 full-time outreach workers from various local service providers who offer street-based outreach throughout the city funded by the city. These outreach teams use a person-centered, compassionate approach and work to build relationships with individuals experiencing homelessness. 
to connect them with the resources that best meet their specific needs. As mentioned, the outreach teams are spread across all city council districts in the city. The assignments are based on previous point in time census tracts. The assignments shift as new unsheltered data become available. The distribution also includes five dedicated workers for Caltrans right-of-way, in addition to 11 outreach workers who provide citywide coverage. Outreach teams provide access to an array of services, including case management, health education, public benefits, mental health, and substance abuse treatment, primary care referrals, access to hygiene, key, hygiene kits, transportation, and basic needs essentials. Ongoing street-based case management is provided to develop and execute individualized housing stability plans. So far this fiscal year, there have been over 30,000 instances of outreach services. Of that, there were almost 9,200 instances to provide basic needs assistance, over 1,000 instances of housing assistance, over 4,000 instances to provide transportation, and 401 connections to medical and behavioral health services. The table on this slide presents a summary of program outcomes from July 2022 through April of this year. Please note, the number of people served in this table may be duplicative, and people may fall in more than one category or may have been served more than once during this period. City-funded outreach and safe parking programs have been successful in placing individuals into permanent housing. Based on program performance since the beginning of this fiscal year, these intervention types, of which there are multiple programs within each type, have permanently housed 1,250 individuals. Now, I will turn it over to Sarah Ferry to discuss the shelter composition and needs assessment. Thank you, James. Now that we've discussed the existing system, we'll move on to addressing the needs. There is a critical need to increase shelter capacity in the city. While the city has increased shelter capacity by nearly 70% over the last few years, the current shelters have low and consistent vacancy rates indicating a need for additional shelter beds. In October 2022, the Regional Task Force on Homelessness reported that an on average, over a 12-month period, 10 people found housing for every 13 who experienced homelessness for the first time, illustrating that more people are experiencing homelessness at a faster rate than those exiting the system into housing. According to the Regional Community Action Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness in San Diego, released by the RTFH in September 2022, the city's increased need in emergency shelter beds is between 430 and 600 beds on top of the city's existing shelter capacity. It is important to note that this addition of city beds assumes north, south, and east county regions will also add 450 to 690 beds in the re that the regional community plan states are needed to support people at the regional demand for shelter. <laughs> to ensure the city's shelter strategy reflects the current demographic needs and addresses current gaps in the shelter system, the strategy seeks to increase bed availability for seniors, youth, and survivors of domestic violence. Increased bed capacity for youth is anticipated to come online this month with opening of a new shelter for LGBTQ plus youth consisting of approximately 25 beds. In addition, an emergency shelter for survivors of domestic violence is currently in the planning phase and will be implemented in the new fiscal year. The information on this slide presents self-reported medical and behavioral health demographics. Over the past two years, we've worked with the county to open shelters with an emphasis on providing behavioral health services. We will continue to strengthen our partnership with the county to make available the appropriate resources required for acute medical respite disabilities 
behavioral health and substance use disorder. In addition, we acknowledge that there is a critical need for detox beds as there is a significant gap in the system with zero detox beds available within the city limits. And we will work with our county counterparts to address this. The city is committed to addressing disparities in the system, including race, age, gender identity, and people with different abilities. Last September, the San Diego Regional Continuum Cares Ad Hoc Committee on Addressing Homelessness Among Black San Diegans released the action plan to address the findings that they had found. Based on data from the 2020 point in time count, the action plan reported significant overrepresentation of black people in the homeless system, even though black people only account for a small portion of the general population in San Diego County. While only making up 5% of the population in the San Diego region, the, the plan found black people are five times more likely than non-black people to experience unsheltered homelessness. We recognize we must do more to address the disparities in our homelessness system, and we are committed to taking steps to make progress, including incorporating action items from the plan whenever possible. We are also committed to addressing other disparities in the system, including gender identity, age, and people with different abilities. As previously mentioned, the city has recently expanded and is in the process of expanding shelter opportunities for LGBTQ plus youth, older adults, and more shelters specifically for individuals who identify as female. We will continue to work with our partners, including the San Diego Housing Commission, County of San Diego, and the Continuum of Care to identify and address gaps in our homeless system. Now, I will turn it back over to Sarah Jarman to go through our site analysis. Thank you, Sarah. Now I will move on to share the site analysis for potential shelters, safe sleeping sites, and safe parking sites. Before diving into our analysis of new sites, we need to address the necessary relocation of some of our existing facilities. In the next year and a half, the city will need to locate 930 existing shelter beds. Some of these relocations are based on an expired use of the facility as a temporary shelter, while others are due to either necessary tenant improvements or planned future developments to increase the stock of housing in the city. As we have done in the past, we are committed to ensuring each client will be moved into housing or relocated to a new shelter facility. We will work with the San Diego Housing Commission and our service providers to ensure that each and every client has a plan in place. With the relocation of 930 beds and the regional plan's estimated need for upwards of 600 additional shelter and or safe sleeping options in the city, the city is looking to site 1,530 beds in total. Our office worked with multiple city departments to explore every space and opportunity to place homelessness services. I'd like to give a quick thank you to DREAM, General Services, Engineering and Capital Projects, Fire Rescue, and many other departments for the time and effort they put into helping us find and analyze each opportunity presented here. The chart on this slide provides an overview of the short, medium, and long-term shelter options we reviewed. You will see here that there are various options with additional detail later in this presentation and in the attached memorandum. In the short term, we intend to leave no stone unturned, increasing capacity at existing locations, identifying city-owned property for use, and leasing options citywide. In the medium term, we are analyzing the use of the former H barracks as an interim shelter option until pure water is built out. In collaboration with the Housing Commission, we are looking forward to hundreds of new units coming online for Project Home Key. Additionally, San Diego Unified has offered up two properties that will be vacant at the end of this school year to serve families and students. Long term, the city is excited to reimagine two existing buildings, the Homelessness Response Center and the Old Central Library. Similarly, we analyzed options for safe sleeping. As you are all aware by now, 20th and B is still on track to open July 1st with a capacity of 136 tents. City teams are also working diligently to open OLOT this fall, which will have a capacity of up to 400 tents. 
With regard to safe parking, short-term options include a reconfiguration of Arrow Drive, an expansion partnership with operators not currently under contract with the city, and a potential small-scale lot downtown at 4th and Beach. I want to specifically thank Misty Jones, our city librarian, for offering up the opportunity to use her facility parking lots. These lots were identified based on utilization of these existing lots as pseudo-safe parking lots. In addition to the parking lots at the San Diego Unified School District properties, there is a potential opportunity to co-locate shelter and safe parking at the H Barracks location, in addition to siting oversized vehicles. Here, you will be able to see and refer back to a breakdown of all of the locations, capacity, projected timing from when a location could be operational, and the associated budgets. The next portion of our presentation highlights a selection of shelters, safe sleeping, and safe parking sites detailed in our written report. While we have already started planning and preparing some of these sites for future operations, other locations are being presented as potential opportunities for future programming. We welcome the input from the council and the public. While we've been looking for new locations to build shelters, we've also examined our existing sites to see if there are opportunities to expand bed capacity. In doing so, we found that we can increase capacity at 16th and Newton by adding an additional 50 beds. This will bring the total capacity up from 276 beds to 326 beds. The addition of 50 beds would cost approximately $500 to $550,000. In addition, we would also be able to increase the number of beds at 17th and Imperial from 128 beds to 140 beds. The 12 beds would cost an estimated $100,000 to $120,000. Lastly, families at the Golden Hall Shelter are anticipated to be moving out soon and transitioning to a new non-congregate facility. The move of families out of Golden Hall makes available 120 beds which could be repurposed for single adults. The city has entered into a lease agreement for a former Travel Lodge Hotel located in Barrio Logan. The shelter has 42 rooms total and will serve families. As mentioned on the previous slide, families from the Golden Hall Shelter will transition over to this facility once ready. We anticipate that to be in mid-July. The site is currently finalizing preparations, including upgrading security features such as cameras and fencing. Another opportunity for our office, as mentioned previously, is exploring the San Diego Unified School District surplus properties. The two properties that have been identified include the Old Town Harold J. Ballard Parent Center and Central Elementary. We are at the beginning phases of analyzing these sites to determine the best use of space, capacity, budget, and timeline. We will keep the council apprised as we develop project proposals. Moving on to safe sleeping, we are currently in the process of setting up safe sleeping sites in the parking lot of the city's operations yard located at 20th and B. The site will have a capacity for 136 spaces and it is expected to open next month. The program will cost approximately one to two million dollars annually. In addition to sleeping accommodations, the site will also provide access to restrooms, meals, and connection to supportive services. Another location that we are currently preparing for is the safe sleeping site at the O lot located south of the Naval Medical Center and adjacent to Balboa Park. This site could include up to 400 tents, and like the 20th and B lot, the program would include access to restrooms, meals, and supportive services. As of now, we expect the site to be ready by fall of this year. The budget for this program is dependent on multiple variables, but a ballpark estimate is between 7.3 million to 11.5 million at full build out. In addition to new shelter locations and safe sleeping sites, we also evaluated where we can expand capacity for safe parking. Looking at the existing safe parking locations, there is an opportunity for us to increase capacity at the city-funded safe parking lot on Arrow Drive. The site has a space for an additional 20 standard size vehicles, which would increase the capacity from 60 to 80 spaces. This would cost an estimated $60,000 and could be operational by summer. There is also an opportunity to expand the Dreams for Change safe parking lot location located on Imperial Avenue. While this lot is not city funded, the city could provide partial funding of approximately $100,000 to $115,000, which is what is needed to expand the lot by, addition, by an additional 15 to 20 spaces for standard size vehicles. Lastly, 
One option, as mentioned, that we have looked into is the NTCH barracks. This large space could be used for multiple services, including a combination of sprung structures, tiny homes, and or safe parking, which could include space for oversized vehicles given the amount of land available. Project costs will vary depending on how the site is configured and what programs it will include. Right now, a ballpark estimate would be anywhere between $7.7 million to $20 million. Through a combination of these projects, including o the opening of 20th and B and OLOT safe sleeping sites in the near term, we plan to increase shelter opportunities by that 600 bed goal. This is increasing our shelter capacity from 1,784 beds currently to 2,384 beds in the next year alone. As we work to stably increase shelter opportunities, we are also focused on increasing throughput from shelter to permanent housing. To close out this presentation, I will now touch on some upcoming potential opportunities that may provide support in increasing capacity in our shelter system. The state released another round of Project Home Key, which provides funding to convert existing properties into permit or interim housing for individuals experiencing homelessness. The San Diego Housing Commission led the application efforts in partnership with the city to apply for two projects, including the Abbott Street Apartments, which post rehabilitation will be a 13 unit facility. In addition, an application was also submitted for the Ramada Inn property to be known as Pacific Village, which post rehabilitation will include 62 units. In addition to those two already submitted applications, the San Diego Housing Commission is also working on two additional proposals for two extended stay America hotels. One located on Murphy Canyon Road with 106 affordable units and the other located on Hotel Circle South with 163 affordable units. These applications will be submitted at the end of next month and awards are expected to be announced 60 to 90 days after application submittal. Last month, Governor Newsom announced the state will be providing four jurisdictions with small homes to provide safe interim housing for people experiencing homelessness. The County of San Diego was identified as one of the four jurisdictions and is expected to receive 150 units. Of the 150, the city anticipates to receive at least 50 tiny homes from the county. At this moment, we do not have any additional details on when we can respect to receive the allocation, but as you've seen in the report and in our presentation, we are already underway in scouting sites for these units. As you are aware, the city is exploring the potential opportunity to redevelop the old downtown central library. The new development could be a mixed use space with the potential to include a combination of emergency shelter beds, affordable housing, and potentially a resource center for individuals experiencing homelessness. As we're in the beginning phases of exploring this opportunity, the timeline and budget are unknown at this time. This completes our presentation of the comprehensive shelter strategy. As a living document, we plan to make updates to this plan as needed and look forward to sharing our updates with the council in the future. We are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We will now turn to the Office of the Independent Budget Analyst for uh, their analysis of the shelter strategy. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the City Council. Amy Lee with the IBA's office. Thank you to the Department First for their thorough report and presentation. Our office reviewed the comprehensive shelter strategy and our main assessments can be found in our report on unauthorized camping that was released on June 8th, starting on page 11. Briefly, we consider the assumed per bed night cost to be reasonable. The strategy assumes the state, the system wide per bed night cost of approximately $79 for new shelters and the O lot safe sleeping site. For the latter, we note that because the city does not currently operate a safe sleeping program, the actual costs of operating a program will be, not will be unclear until a site operators are identified. For the 20th and B Street safe sleeping site, per bed night costs are lower, ranging from $20 to $40 due to the use of existing homelessness outreach and case management services. Looking to other cities, we found per bed night costs ranging from $88 to $164 for safe sleeping. 
Because the city has limited experience with safe sleeping, we think this, the council should consider the capacity of these first few sites to ensure that operations can run smoothly before moving to the maximum capacity of 536 beds outlined in the strategy. Our understanding is that the department does plan to scale up operations incrementally and use multiple s service providers for subpopulations, especially at the larger OLOT site. That concludes my comments, but happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's proceed with public comment, please. Thank you. If you are here in chambers, please be sure to come up to the reserve seats that are in the front row as I call your name in order to make sure that we have proper meeting management. And as a reminder, in-person testimony will conclude before virtual testimony begins. If you are in the virtual webinar, please note that this is only for the informational item. This is not for the encampment ordinance. So this is only for the comprehensive shelter strategy. The next item will be the encampment ordinance. So if you have your hand raised, make sure you're speaking to the correct item. Starting now, we have Mandy Lynn, Strong, Strong Stallion West, Aaron Surot Monograssi, Hannah Scraper, and Michael McConnell. If you can please start coming up to the front row, starting with Mandy, who can come up to the microphone. Everyone will be receiving one minute each. Starting with Mandy. Please begin. Hello, I'm Mandy Lian, and I just listened to your comprehensive shelter strategy report, um, which seems like uh, has a lot of what ifs, and there doesn't seem to be any firm strategy on how to increase shelter capacity. Your safe sleeping sites are not going to um, keep you from a lawsuit with Martin versus Boise because it says you have to be inside. So that is gonna cost the city money because you are gonna get sued um, if you enforce people um, or you try to criminalize folks um, when you do not have enough shelter. The point in time count has increased, as you all know, so even the count that you just gave is still going to be too little. Um, shelter is not housing. It should be temporary. It should get people through until you can get them housed. So all of this information we're hearing, um, I don't hear anything about housing on the back end, and um, that's that's pretty disappointing, but not um, not surprising. Thank you for your comments. Next is Strong Stallion West. Hello, uh, my name is Strong Stallion West, and I strongly disagree with the OLOT. Uh, representation of what they're planning to do. All only things I heard was analysis, projections, future analyzing proposals, options, could, ballpark, no details, exploring, no time, no budget. It doesn't seem like that that's a plan. That's a bunch of hoping and wishing, and it sounds like a Hail Mary pass. And as far as the OLOT is concerned, in order to have it run and be effective, it, it sounds great in theory, but in, in practice, you're going to have to. Uh, for this to work, you're going to have to um, allow crack cocaine use, you're going to have to allow fentanyl use, you're going to have to allow meth use, cocaine use, uh, you're, going have, you're going to need to allow drug dealing, you're going to need to allow sexual activity, and you're going to need to allow people with pets that are service animals and non-service animals, as well as alcohol use and marijuana use. Because that's a lot what a lot of the homeless people are into, and if you put that up, they're not going to come and camp there, okay? So that's just the reality of it. So it sounds nice, it, it sounds pretty, Thank you. but it's going to be ineffective Thank and Thank you impotent. for that concluding comment. You're welcome. And next is Aaron. And then behind Aaron, we should have in the front row, Hannah Scraper, Michael McConnell, Joseph Coyne, and Evelyn Smith. Um, you did have time ceded to you by Andrea Guerrero. Yes. Andrea Guerrero, can you raise your hand? She's an overflow. Can she please come in during your comments? Andrea Guerrero, please be sure to come into chambers. I see her running up. You have two minutes. Please proceed. <laughs> please proceed. Hi, my name is Aaron Sermoto Gras. I'm the Policy Director at Alliance San Diego. I want to thank city staff for putting this together and for the hard work that you do every day to try to make certain that we are creating solutions. And I want to thank the city for looking for solutions um, to being able to help the current crisis that we have going on. That being said, shelters are for emergencies. There is a place for them to fill the gaps, to make certain that we are getting people inside, but they are for emergencies. And we must not forget that our end goal is not shelters. Our end goal is housing for every San Diegan. 
This strategy addresses a short-term need, not a long-term need. And as long as we only focus on the short term, we will never solve the problem. This is why we need the mayor and you council to return back to the 2019 Community Action Plan on Homelessness. That, that plan had over 100 action items and included both short-term and long-term goals that we need to actually reduce homelessness and truly create transformative change. We need to go back. We need to go back to the plan. We need to be looking, instead of being reactive, we need to be proactive and use courage to tackle the hard problems. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Hannon Scraper. And you have time seated to you. If you can please raise your hand by Zach Schlegel. Thank you, Tyler Renner. Thank you, and Kaylee Levy. Thank you so much. You'll have three minutes. Please proceed. Good afternoon. I'm Hanan Scrapper, Regional Director for PATH San Diego. We currently have 134 interim beds here in San Diego, 80 of which are city funded. We appreciate the city putting together the shelter strategy and agree that there is an urgent need to expand the number and type of shelter options across the city. This mayor and council have done an admirable job of bringing more interim beds online, but we're not able to keep pace with the number of people coming into the system. The city has upheld the shelter strategy as a document that would allow them to implement the proposed anti-camping ordinance, yet it leaves us with more questions than answers. How can the city proceed with criminalizing homelessness when we do not have enough beds to house the, the people on the streets who are asking for shelter? The city currently has 1,784 interim beds, yet they also indicate a need to relocate 930 of these beds before the end of 2024. The point in time count numbers for 23 showed at least 6,500 people experiencing homelessness across the city. Our team members encounter those individuals every day and most are willing to take shelter, but the large majority of these interactions don't end with shelter placement. To rectify this, the, the city is proposing between roughly 2,700 to 3,600 new shelter beds. This would cost between 40 to 80.6 million, and it's not clear if that includes staffing, which would be much needed. The FY24 city budget is proposing a 78.3 million to service and fund the existing beds, and many of these proposed new beds lack any plan for funding. It's clear that additional communication with providers is necessary and more time is needed to develop a viable funding strategy. It is vital that both the county and private donors also be an active part of this conversation. I would also ask that both a prevention and outreach strategy be developed in tandem with the shelter strategy and I would volunteer myself and any of our team members to help support this important effort. PATH has 32 of the 52.5 outreach team members in the city. Like our fellow service providers, our team members are juggling large and complicated caseloads and could, not use the, could use the additional support to ensure that underrepresented neighborhood, neighborhoods are being covered and supported. We have seen progress from PATH coordinated outreach efforts where the city and providers coordinate solely, closely to address a particular encampment. We should really be implementing the encampment solution strategies and teams across the city to address the ongoing need. We would also recommend speaking with other cities, other California cities like Los Angeles and San Jose that have intentionally cited new shelters equitably across the city. In many instances, those cities also invented, invested in outreach services in the surrounding areas to make sure that shelters and housing are a benefit for every neighborhood. In the most recent count, LA saw a decrease in the unsheltered population and San, San Jose saw a total decrease in homelessness. We understand that the city does not have an endless budget. We support the city's continued advocacy for ongoing funding for homelessness from the state. We stand ready to assist you on all these efforts, but urge you to re-engage with providers with this shelter strategy. We all share the same goal to get people safely off the streets and into housing with supportive services so they can survive and thrive. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next we have Michael McConnell. <coughs> and for the record, she did receive four minutes. It was for three seating time and her own. Please proceed, Mr. McConnell. Thanks for the uh, comprehensive report. Um, 
but it's pretty easy to tell you how many shelter beds we need. I think we all know we need a lot more than what we're talking about here today. The problem is getting the beds up and running. Uh, this report offers no accountability or responsibility to add any beds. Uh, in fact, the city was given trailers about three years ago and still hasn't used them all. So at that pace, I don't have a lot of confidence in, in this plan. The fact is people are becoming homeless much faster than we're adding beds. And this report talks about adding five to 600 beds in a year. Well, just in 2022, we added many more people to the homeless population than that, meaning we are getting further and further behind every day, every day. This report isn't going to fix that. In fact, this report is telling you that we are going to have more people on the street. If we follow this, we're not going to get anywhere. Meanwhile, Thank you for your it's comments. talking about losing 930 beds. Sir, we do need to be fair. Math Thank doesn't add comments. up. Now, next is Josh Coyne. Behind him should be Evelyn Smith, uh, Rachel Hayes, and Colleen Cusack. You'll have one minute. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. I'm Josh Coyne, Vice President of Policy with the Downtown San Diego Partnership. In January of 2022, the Downtown San Diego Partnership recorded then historic high unsheltered numbers in downtown and called for implementing a safe village to include non-congregate shelter options, including wraparound services. I'm here today with gratitude for the mayor and Sarah Jarman and her entire team for finally compiling a a comprehensive menu of options to continue to address the homelessness emergency. Our unsheltered care team is a proud outreach service provider with the city and is proud to have housed 478 individuals this year through our family reunification program. It's time for our entire region to take note and step up. The city and downtown cannot continue to address this emergency alone. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Evelyn Smith. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Member Pro Tem. I'm Evelyn Smith. I chair the Emory Hill Neighborhood Town Council. We, I am in opposition of what they want to bring to our community. We are not in opposition of shelters or providing safe parking for the homeless. Our community is already overwhelmed by many things that we cannot continue supporting. The residents is very unhappy. I catch a lot of flack because I chair the council and I'm just asking you guys to think more when you put these parking spaces into the residential areas because where they want to put it at in our community is five schools thank a you library for and i thank you next is rachel hayes hi council i'm rachel hayes and i live on commercial street and i'm clean and sober a plan not enforcement simple what you're planning is backwards it won't work the current shelters do not meet clients' needs, specific needs, especially if they are senior or disabled. Those that need 24-hour care, bottom bunks, etc. Because of this, we are deemed shelter resistant. We meet the needs, meet the needs of homeless humans will come. 500 some odd safety camping will not put a scratch on the homeless plight in our fine city. Even if you get into a shelter, I know clients that have been waiting for housing on the housing list and been waiting for years. There are no ultra open shelter beds because there are no housing to put homeless humans in. Housing first works, not handcuffs. Next is Colleen Cusack and behind her in the seats if we can have David Roger, uh, Justine uh, Kaufman and Peter Kamiski. You'll have one minute, please proceed. I know you're not serious about ending homelessness or treating homeless humans the, properly, or you would have a 24 seven homeless response center. You can't have ho hospitals releasing people to the streets and not have anyone able to process them into shelters. We have zero shelters for LGBTQ plus over the age of 26, zero. We have zero shelters for anybody in a wheelchair. 
We have zero shelters for seniors who have not yet been placed in housing. That 60 bridge shelter space is only for shelter for seniors who have already found a house. We have zero detox. We used to have treatment beds, forget treatment. Now they're just lucky to get detox and we don't even have detox. One week of detox and you're back on the street and they don't even have that. You're not serious. Next is David Roger. Good morning, my name is David Roger. Um, I'm with Felipe's Peace Grotto, 73 years. And what we really need to do is that the mayor was put on this plan that we're gonna talk about after this, that they had to actually have something in their hand before it moves to vote. And, and I'm really sorry to see what the city has put forward. Um, it's a lot of ifs, buts, maybe someday. Um, I, I really think the city council needs to hold the mayor accountable to what the committee that sent this bill, I mean, sent this to you, is that he needed to have this done. And in what we've seen doesn't really show it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Justina Kaufman. Justina Kaufman, not here. Peter Kamiski. Behind him, we should have Joy Sanyata, Carrera, Christopher, Maya, Little Sonia, please. You'll have one minute. My name is Peter Comiskey, representing the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, a collaboration of 25 arts and cultural organizations within the Balboa Park Cultural District. Thanks to Councilmember Whitburn, Meg Loria, and, and, uh, and associated staff for their considered process to both evaluate and work with us to identify the safe camping locations in Balboa Park. Just a small part, but I think an important element of the comprehensive shelter solution. As the cultural partnership sought to be educated and fully informed on this issue, I contacted additional in council members, as well as operators of services, both within the city and outside to better understand the needs and opportunities. I'd like to express my uh, appreciation to council members and their staff who provided invaluable advice and particularly to council president Rivera, Leo Rivera for his guidance and insight. I encourage other organizations within the city and throughout other cities to undertake a similar education process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Joy Sanyata, and behind her in the front seats we should have Carrera, Christopher, Maya, Little Sonia, John, Brad, and Levi Jeffer Leone. Please begin. Joy Sanyata, District 3. Hello everybody. It's great to have you. Uh, it's time to keep all our feet to the fire regarding our comprehensive shelter strategy plan and its real implementation. We need an ongoing conversation and data and on implementation. So I suggest we have a regular monthly agenda item at a city council meeting, uh, <clears throat> rotating the presenters. We could have city, county, regional task force, police department, housing commission, and so forth. Our governor, Newsom, expects accountability regarding homelessness of the resources and the funds that we get and use. Let's seize this opportunity and keep all our feet to the fire with a regular information item, keeping the conversation alive and well now. Thank Love you for to your all. comments. Next is Correa. Hello, career Christopher, on behalf of the homeless population, I'm appalled that the mayor of 1.4 million citizens would come up here and say that he's proud of what San Diego is doing for the homeless. That part, that part, that part. There's another issue. This foundation of this whole meeting is about homeless. No one on that side of this fence has ever been homeless. Why isn't there homeless representatives that have actually lived on the street here speaking in their own behalf? I've spoken to many of them. They know how to speak in their own behalf. Why do you all keep choosing people outside the community and outside the city to speak in their behalf? <laughs> Next is Maya Little Sonia. And to that I say amen. 
<laughs> this is a feeble plan in comparison to the 2019 Community Action Plan, which I urge you to revisit. As aforementioned by my colleagues and friends, we want housing. Shelters, much less safe sleeping sites, are not suitable shelters. We want housing. The slide delineating the 2024 program budget allocates solely 4% of the budget to housing. That is not enough. This plan is woefully underbaked and an absolutely dreadful precursor to the monstrous, monstrous anti-homeless ban proposed by Council Member Whitburn at the behest of Mayor Gloria. Todd is a joke and so is his plan. Thank you. Next is John Brad, and behind him we should have Levi, Catherine Rhodes, and Francis Matuolo. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Gloria, and Homeless Strategies and Solutions for this overview of potential shelter expansion sites. It's really heartening to see the city take a look at how to expand solutions at this point in time, and fortunately, we should have done it a long time ago. We must point out the facts. Our existing shelter system is gridlock. We have more people entering into homelessness than ever, and it's all about housing affordability. We also want to ask, how was 400 to 600 people our target shelter expansion number? We have 3,500 people without shelter in the city alone, and they have l nowhere to go regardless of any new ordinance. What about the shelter for seniors? People with disabilities who cannot go into shelters right now, our LGBTQ community. It costs us $2,000 a month to shelter someone right now. Where are we going to find that funding and are we going to divert more funding into interim solutions or housing? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Levi. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Levi G.F. Leone with Lived Experience Advisors. Um, I wanted to say thank you for being able to present some more shelter options. Um, I do feel that this could have happened much sooner than now. We've been talking about non-congregate options for a long time. Um, individuals have certain issues uh, living in certain shelters because of previous trauma. One of the ways that we can fix that is by having options. So. Having non-congregate options, places that can accommodate people with disabilities, LGBT people, is much needed. I don't think that this ban needs to come along with this. This is something that we can do without the ban. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Catherine Rose. Uh, hello, Catherine Rhodes, and um, very much thank you for, for doing this. Of course, I have a funding solution, but not one of you has ever um, talk to me about it. It's the 33 million annual, $33 million in the 1992 agreement for cooperation between the city and the county. And um, council member Montgomery Step, you wanna be on, on the county. You could actually do something and have the county and the city use this $32 million that come in every year. What the county is doing is siphoning it to their general fund without telling anybody. For how many years is it? What, 30 years they have stolen this money, and for 30 years, not one single one of you has asked me about it. Please ask me about it. You could be a hero. <laughs> so anyway, um, I agree that the 2019 Community Action Plan should be uh, is better than this plan. I don't know why you're doing it. So far, you, you don't even have one tiny home in the whole city. You have not approved one tiny home from DSD. Why is that? Next is Francis Matawala. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Francis with Activist San Diego. Um, I want to first ask by show of hands, who knows what NYCHA is? The New York uh, City has a, a housing in their city charter, and I want to propose that there's no reason San Diego can't add housing to their city charter and get it done. Um, it, we don't need shelters, we need housing, and unfortunately, while you know, some tenant protection ordinances were passed recently, there was loopholes. So all of these things are compounding, uh, and I want to ask everyone who is here speaking uh, in support of the encampment ban later to consider what if it was your family member, what if your uh, family members who were in this situation, uh, and you might say, well, that would never happen. Uh, not everyone is lucky enough to have a family or other support systems to support them, so just want to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. One last call for Justina Kaufman. Justina Kaufman or Justina Kaufman. Okay, we will now be concluding. 
uh, testimony here in chambers. I'm starting the five minute timer and going to those that are participating virtually. Please note you will have one minute per your comment and please note that this is regarding the shelter plan, not the encampment ordinance ban. That is the next item. So please do not speak about the encampment ordinance ban. That is the next item. Starting with Sally, please unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm Sally Small. I'm a resident of Emerald Hills, and I live just a little bit away from Malcolm X Library, which is one of the sites that was chosen for uh, having over 120 parking spots, which I think is still too many. Anywho, um, our area in D4 already has excessive numbers of uh, affordable housing at the extremely low level. We're getting the Live Well Center right across the street, which will bring even more uh, poor and low-income people. We feel like uh, the area of equity that we keep talking about and disparities, you're putting stuff into D4, D8, D9, but you're forgetting about some of the wealthy communities, and I think that's, that's sad. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ann Minash. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi. We need a plan to solve homelessness, and this plan is not it. The plan makes no sense. The cost of shelter is estimated to be $79 a night or $23.70 a month. That's enough to pay to put someone in a one-bedroom apartment at market rate. The plan only provides 1530 new beds for a 4,000 plus shortfall, and that shortfall is likely to continue to grow with the rising rents. Only permanent affordable housing solves homelessness. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Paul Henkin. Please unmute yourself, Mr. Henkin. There you go. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, thank you to Councilman Lee for recognizing that the homeless ordinance is unenforceable without more shelter beds, but we need more than shelters. There are too many causes of homelessness. This glib to call uh, people without homes homeless, uh, I'd rather call them like society's castaways or something which uh, I feel they are, we need a multifaceted approach. Jobs, mental health, drugs, crime, for and against the homeless, housing last, which may take five or 10 years. Um, the number of shelter beds is inadequate uh, and um, obviously not suited for everyone. And there's a low vacancy rate, and you're closing centers, and the plan doesn't make Your sense. Your time has concluded. If you have additional comments, you can send them in to City Clerk at San Diego.gov. Andrea Hitheru, please unmute yourself. Andrea Hitheru, Andrea Hitheru. Please unmute. I'll give you another second for technical difficulties. We will come back to you. Lori Saldana. Lori Saldana, you are unmuted. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. So as former chair of Assembly Housing and Community Development, I need to tell former Assembly member and now Mayor uh, Todd Gloria, your plan is not sufficient uh, in light of what is needed for housing. And as I have said to this council before, you will be sued. You will be in court. You will incur additional charges trying to defend this plan in light of what is being proposed in, on the next item. So. Uh, I, I encourage this council to put this on hold and put the next item on hold 
because it is not sufficient and it will result in additional costs and additional pain and suffering of people that will be criminalized without having housing sufficient to meet their needs with other plans that are being proposed. So this is fear-based policy making. The mayor is afraid of being pushed by people in his mayoral reelection. And I can tell you from serving in the legislature for six years, fear-based policy making harms people in the long run. Please remove this from consideration. Next is Leila Aziz. Please unmute yourself. And as a reminder, please keep your comments to this item. Leila, please proceed. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. I looked at the report and I had a You are cutting in and voice in 2020. Okay, I'm sorry, can you hear me better now? Yes, now we can My hear you better. My issue is this. I why black San Diegans can continue to have such a high proportion of unsheltered and sheltered people and nothing has been done culturally specific around that that we've been hearing about. Um, there was supposed to be a uh, black kind of organ task force created um, years ago. We should be at implementation now and yet the numbers keep going up. And I just want to know why this hasn't been taken. This is not being taken seriously because we are in an emergency situation. There are people that are in um, where you guys are now who've actually held press conferences around this issue and nothing is being done and it doesn't seem like there's a fix. So I just want to know what is being done. And I didn't hear that in the plan. I just heard statistics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is PhD FADM White Buffalo Eagle. Please let me. Yeah, so this is White Buffalo Wolf. Um, I do agree with some of the things I've heard so far in regards to this uh, deal. The only issue I see with it is we're dealing with homeless people that have been homeless for multiple different years. I've been advocating for homeless people for over 90 years. So with that being said, I've actually met and introduced myself to homeless people, getting to learn them as individuals and found out that there's more to homelessness than what's being introduced in the meeting. Uh, yes, housing is part of it, but documents is another part, and that's the part that's keeping a lot of us from getting housing. So what are you guys' plans in regards to fixing that solution? Because there is a vicious cycle in regards to homeless people getting their credentials. So um, is there like something you guys can top on that? That concludes your comments? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The timer did uh, expire here in chambers. We have 15 speakers on the line when it did expire. No other speakers will be taken after that. 6273, please unmute yourself. 6273 plus star six to unmute. There you go. Hello, this is Martha Sullivan. And I, I want to point out that there's no funding or time for the 2,671 new shelter beds this plan says are needed for seniors, persons with disabilities, and those recovering after hospital stays. So where do these people go? It's a problem now, it's gonna to continue to be a problem. San Diego City Council members, you must vote no on the ban, which this plan was written to justify and you need to go back to the community action plan for homelessness and first implement that plan before you ban survival camping by your houseless residents. Please be sure to speak Thanks. to this. Thank you. Next is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for public comment at the beginning of public comment time. Uh, a, a woman spoke very elegantly about the things uh, this item has to work on. Uh, you talk about this as a comprehensive shelter plan, yet it's not very comprehensive, I'm feeling, about how to address, also address uh, affordable housing ideas for the future as well. In San Jose, where I'm from, we're going through kind of the same issues where the current mayor wants to work on shelter ideas uh, more than affordable housing ideas. And I think that's not quite the way to go. And I think as what was previously stated, he's in fear of uh, concepts like middle income housing development that can help uh, be flexible to the future of affordable housing and uh, market rate housing. 
but yet the mayor wants to work at just market rate housing. We need to talk to Governor Newsom and, and try to get loose some funds uh, for, for develop, housing development of low income. I think he can do that. And we just have to work really hard to be more open about things. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we're going to go back to Andrea Hetheroy. I see your hand is raised twice. We'll see which one allows you to speak. Please unmute yourself. There should be a box that appears. We will come back to you. Going to Danny Avitia, please unmute. Good evening, Council. Can you confirm that you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Wonderful. Um, so I, I want to echo everyone's comments regarding the concerns that this this um, this mayor um, has proposed this this shelter comprehensive supposed comprehensive plan uh, just to go along with the second item on the agenda today, um, as to seem as though we are prepared or as to seem um, there is a plan in action. Although this action has no actionable items, um, we have nothing. Um, when we're talking about shelters, we need to prioritize um, making sure that these shelters have not only the resources that um, help these individuals transition out of the situation that they're in, but also making sure that we ha don't just have um, cots and beds. If I was a homeless person, I don't want to just sleep in a cot and bed. Um, my sister is homeless, and um, I tried to call 211 to help her get some shelter. Thank you for your I comments. Next is Rose Harris. Hi, yes, this is Rose Harris, a former program manager for Downtown San Diego Partnership and also a former program supervisor for Father Joe's uh, shelter of 324 men. And I uh, honestly feel like this is an internment camp. If you know 60% of unhoused neighbors are on disability and probably another 20% should be, but they're too uh, mentally delayed or disabled to be able to get on it. And the shelters that are currently in, in, in the running for these are really places of bullying. And I have witnessed myself people watching pornography on campus, people bullying clients, uh, housing vouchers not being used. Uh, so I would really like to see more than just a housing plan and then more of about a wraparound service plan to the people that really need these services. I don't wanna put them all in a tent uh, city and have disabled people just sitting there waiting for help for years on end. And I think that's an inhumane treatment of people. Thank you. Thank you. Next is John Stump. Mr. Stump, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. The teaching in this matter is Luke 16, 19 through 31. I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, but please, Luke 16, 19 through 31. Next comment is the term homeless uh, separates us from one class of San Diegans to another class of San Diego. There are no homeless people in San Diego. There are people who need services, care, and shelter. As long as you keep calling them homeless, you're never going to address the challenge. So please find a different term. Third, in the fourth and ninth district, we have just as many unsheltered and needy persons as any place else, and we need to house them and care for them in the fourth and ninth district. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Darwin Fishman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Uh, thank you. I'm Darwin Fishman, he, him, his, Racial Justice Coalition of San Diego. And I just wanted to say this plan for the mayor, the main glaring part that's missing is about enforcement. This still leaves law enforcement, the police, to make this plan happen. And I'm shocked and surprised. Most cities are going away from law enforcement solutions. You not only need to provide the housing and services, but a way for folks to get to those ha that housing. The housing plan right now 
and we have to admit it, is jail. Jail is a really stupid plan for homeless folks, and unless you subsequently change the way law enforcement operates, that's going to be the way it goes. I was at a meeting with downtown Democrats where Whitburn openly said, Councilmember Whitburn openly said that the mayor is responsible for law enforcement part. City council has to take responsibility for this. You can't kick it to the mayor. You can put in your, for the information, long-term plan for the mayor, as well as for the ordinance, you can take responsibility for what is done. Thank you for your comments. Your time has, has concluded. Al Del Mastro. Uh, hi, my name is Al Del Mastro. And um, uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a small mom and pop landlord and the tenant protection program has pretty much destroyed my business as a senior, as a disabled veteran, it's pretty shameful. I'm wondering why there is not means testing. How in the world should the mayor or the city council president that make $200,000, $125,000 a year, how should they be included in, how do they have any fear of homelessness? Why would they be included in the plans? Uh, I have no idea why that is. I know that Jen Campbell was correct when she voted against it because I just put one property in the market and it's going out to developers and they're going to kick the existing families out of there that's rented for me from a long time and they're going to build the program. They're going to wreck the neighborhood and they're the only ones that are going to have the renter exception rules applied to them. Thank you for your comments. Next is the original. Uh, yeah, so it's just so sad that we sit here and have these people on this diet say humanitarian crisis, so we must keep humanity in mind. Yet this whole plan is juvenile, messy, messy and pedestrian. It's not comprehensive and there is no plan, but it was only brought forward because of the next item that you guys are going to bring forward. It, it should have, if you really did care, this should have been in the works a long time ago to find temporary housing that leads to permanent affordable housing. But that's the problem is that this is just a makeup. It's it's this ordinance should be dependent upon um, this. And if this actually worked, but that's not the case. This is only here because you're bringing the next item forward and you want to act like you're doing all this work. And, you know, look at all the things that we can do. This is going to help. It's a dollar late and a day short. OK, you guys are whatever, a day late and a dollar short. But this is just proving that you guys don't care about people being homeless or not. Your time has concluded. Thank you, Joseph Charles. Um, yes, it's Doris Charles, actually. Um, yeah, I'm living in Canto and I'm against having the parking at Malcolm X Library simply because there's the elementary school of science that's right there and the library, which many of the children in our neighborhood attend because they don't have computers or a place to study. So there's kids walking back and forth all the time. And on another thought, um, we are general contractors and we have spoken to um, Monica Stepp's office and Monica Stepp. We've talked to representatives from the mayor's office and we have property where we want to put ADUs on property that we own and we would rent them out to as affordable to people who live within the city of San Diego. We don't get any substantial replies. All we say is call this one, call that one. Uh, we don't do that. You have to do multifamily. Well, multifamily units do not help people thrive. They just merely- Your time survive. has concluded, ma'am. The next speaker is uh, Brendan Keller. Brendan Keller, please unmute yourself. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Brendan Keller. I'm in District 3. Uh, I support the mayor's uh, program. Um, I mean, so far, you know, I know there's a lot of complaints, but I haven't really heard any tangible solutions. This seems like a tangible solution. And it makes me wonder if some of the people complaining, you know, actually like the status quo, because I don't, you know. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Andrea Heathrow. We'll go back to you again, see if we've been able to handle your, I see uh, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I understand that the homelessness is a humanitarian crisis, 
you know, we, it's, it's an emergency. But you don't treat emergency patients by moving them into intensive care units. Putting a, a parking location designating that at Malcolm X Library, Valencia Park, those people are going to migrate to the neighboring streets, which are the streets that are just like a half mile, less than a minute drive from um, the four corners of death. And we're struggling mightily. We're picking up bottles of urine as it is with people who are sleeping overnight. People are going to migrate. And the, the police department is already understaffed. So whatever ordinance gets it put in place to keep them from migrating and camping overnight and to, to keep it from ballooning, they, they're not going to be able to do it. They don't have the staffing to do it. So all you're doing is just in the long term making more homeless people because it's coming from p poverty areas. We're struggling mightily. Please don't bring more of it to us. We're trying to keep our, 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 our mouth above water. Thank you. Thank Your you. time has concluded, and your hand was up twice. We'll lower that. Patricia Follett. Hi, yes. Patricia Follett. Contact the Lucky Duck Foundation. They say they have industrial-sized tents for temporary shelter and are ready to install. Follow with supportive services. We are way behind. This is a crisis. The Ballard Parent Center, this is home to many generations of students educated here and currently serves as an annual regional powwow site and is recognized as a significant historic community resource. The community plan has been adopted by City Council in 2018 as a continued educational supportive site. In fact, the Old Town Academy, a charter school, has been advocating for a site. How do you choose one over the other? Does that conclude your comments? Yes. Thank you. Next is Shane Harris. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Yes, this is Shane Harris, the president and founder of the People's Association of Justice Advocates and longtime resident of San Diego City Council District 4. I'm calling in today in opposition to the Malcolm X Library being used as a overnight lot, uh, safe site lot for our unsheltered neighbors. Certainly, District 4 uh, is, is upscaling in the amount of people uh, that are living on the streets and people that are migrating. I thank all of the residents who have called in today who have voiced their concern. Uh, to vote for this would be a failure and a lack of policy insight. The Malcolm X Library is near the Elementary Institute of Science, right across the street from the, Live, the new Live Well Center. It's not enough space and it's not the proper space for our unsheltered residents. We need to open up a site, but that is not the right place. I'm asking you to look in the ECC or somewhere out of the way and out of that middle section. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker on this item is Lydia Morales. Lydia Morales, please unmute yourself. There you go. Please unmute yourself. You muted yourself again, if you can please unmute yourself. There you go, please proceed. We cannot hear you. If the device you're speaking into is muted, please unmute the device that you're speaking into as well. You are unmuted, and I've asked you to unmute, but we are not hearing you here in council chambers. If you're speaking into a smartphone, maybe the phone itself is muted. Your last speaker, I'll give you another few seconds to handle the technical difficulties, but we cannot hear you here. I'm sorry for your technical difficulties. We do have to proceed. We cannot hear you here. My apologies, you can definitely send in any comments to city clerk at san diego.gov. This is an informational item, no action will be taken. That does conclude public comment on this item. Thank you, Ms. Fuentes. All right, we will now uh, turn to the council for discussion of this um, informational item, beginning with council member Whitburn, followed by council member LaCava. Thank you very much, council president. And I would like to thank the mayor and chief operating officer, Eric Dargan, and our hardworking city employees for putting together this strategy. In particular, I wanna thank Ms. Jarman and her team. Ms. Jarman, it is great to have you back leading our homelessness strategies and solutions department. I also wanna thank the office of the independent budget analyst for your review of the shelter strategy. 
And thank you to everybody who provided public comment today, both here in chambers and virtually. I think people raised some important points. We need more housing. I'm sure everybody on this dais will agree, shelter is intended to be temporary. There is no question that the goal is to help to get people into housing. This city council has approved every single housing proposal that has come before us, including income restricted affordable housing. The city has also hired additional staff to speed up the permitting process so that we can accelerate the pace that we add housing. In fact, we regularly have people in this chamber who are unhappy with us because of everything that we are doing to add housing. As we work to add housing, we do need shelter. Uh, I think that we see that by how many people are using our shelter offerings. The presentation demonstrates that San Diego offers a variety of different shelter options and they serve thousands of people every year. And just to reiterate, there are definite shelter additions included in this strategy. The expansions of existing shelters, the new travel lodge, non-congregate shelter, the addition of safe parking, the safe sleeping sites that I requested are the latest option. Those safe sleeping sites are essentially outdoor shelters. They will have bathrooms and security and meals and connections to services. They will provide a safer, healthier place for people who prefer an outdoor option instead of an indoor shelter. The first safe sleeping site will open in a few weeks. And I would like to thank the mayor and my colleagues on the council for adding $5 million to the budget this year to support this new option. The safe sleeping sites will be a big help. I've spoken to people currently living on the streets downtown who would like to go to a safe sleeping site. For example, during the point in time count, I met Thomas, who told me that he became addicted to opioids after his wife died and he had surgery. He's been on the streets for several years, but he doesn't want to be there. He would prefer a safe sleeping site with bathrooms and security and meals. Eventually, he would like to be able to move back into housing. Other innovative shelters like the harm reduction and the safe haven shelters help people experiencing homelessness who are struggling with their mental health and their behavioral health. I met Barbara on the street. She told me she planned to go to the new shelter for women at the old library. Uh, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill is the operator and provides that kind of care that women like Barbara need to take the first steps to solve their homelessness crisis. The medium range plan to develop a larger site in San Diego to serve more people in a campus type setting is consistent with the need to increase scale and keep pace with the need. And I have strongly supported at previous council meetings, uh, as have my colleagues, pursuing the development of the old library or homelessness navigation center as long term solutions. I do have some questions, Ms. Jarman. Uh, one of the most successful and cost effective homelessness solutions programs that the city has does not require a shelter at all. It is the family reunification program. Why is that program so successful and is it as successful for the chronically homeless? We are very proud to work in partnership with the, San, uh, the, with the downtown San Diego partnership for the family reunification program. Yes, it is extremely successful and cost, effect, cost effective as you mentioned for about $500,000 a year, we we're able to serve well over 450,000 individuals and reunify them with family and friends. To your point on chronic homelessness, I believe, and I have Ketra Carter here to correct me, of the people that we've served in the family reunification program, 28.5% are chronically homeless. Thank you. Can you expand on the fact that while the city funds about 1,800 shelter beds, we serve far more than 1,800 people annually with shelter and services. How many do we serve on average? Right now, the numbers I have in front of me, we have 1,874 shelter beds, and through April 30th of this fiscal year, we've served well over 6,000 individuals. Uh, I will say, I don't know if Lisa Jones happens to be here yet, but she might have uh, even more updated numbers, but, but well over the amount of uh, shelter bed count that we have. And I see Ms. Jones coming to uh, the microphone. Ms. Jones. Good afternoon, Council Member Whitburn. Uh, yes, uh, that, those numbers are fairly accurate. We see anywhere from seven to 8,000 annually in our system. And some of those folks obviously sometimes come into shelter and leave again, but the majority of them find their way somewhere else. Thank you. There are questions about the amount of shelter we have and will create in the future. Uh, I will note that 85% of the shelter beds are in San Diego, 
while 57% of the homeless population lives in San Diego, uh, according to the RTFH. Will we have adequate shelter moving forward? I think it's a two-part question. Of course, within this shelter plan, we know about the relocation and the goal based on the information we've received from the regional task force. If we receive updated information from either the regional task force or the community action plan update, we will update this document appropriately. Um, but if we are able to increase that capacity, increase throughput, um, really be creative with the dollars we have with programs like the family reunification program, we will do well. I will caveat that by saying the 600 bed count does also assume that on the upwards of 690 beds region wide that those would be developed as well. And I know that that uh, has been important to both the mayor and to both many of the members of the city council that the region also builds the shelter they need to build too. Our partnership with the County of San Diego is an important piece of this. We currently partner with the county to provide behavioral health at the Rosecrans shelter. Uh, you've described the great need for more detox beds and beds for people with high acuity needs. What is the status now of conversations with the county to collaborate to provide the health and human services support for those needs? We are working very closely with our Department of Government Affairs and our counterparts over at the county to really emphasize the need that we have within city limits for detox beds. So we can we continue to have those conversations and we continue to advocate for those beds within our region. And my last question, could you describe the gap that the safe sleeping sites will fill when it comes to getting people in encampments into a shelter solution? Safe sleeping does provide a new intervention into our shelter system. One, of course, it'll be increased capacity by up to 536 tents, which very well could mean more individuals. I will say one of the gaps it fills is, is provides a little bit more creativity for caretakers, for couples, for pods of individuals that would like to go together and provides a new alternative that, that may be a better fit for some individuals. Thank you again, Ms. Chairman. I look forward to opening the first safe sleeping site in just a few weeks and continuing to add shelter and housing options for people experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Whitburn. Councilmember Lacava. Uh, thank you, Council President. So thank you, Mr. Arman, Ms. Ferry, Mr. Carter, and all the city staff that contributed to this effort. And thank you to all those that spoke. Not a plan? Yeah, I agree. It's called a strategy. We need housing. I agree. But to put this pursuit of expansion of shelter options on hold or to do nothing is not acceptable. There will be more discussion where this strategy fits with the next item. At the Land Use and Housing Committee in April, when we first heard the ordinance, I requested an analysis to expand congregate and non-congregate shelter options. That request matched with previous asks by my colleagues. So the presentation we heard, the strategy, the documentation is in fact a comprehensive overview of our existing shelter operations and what it can be on the horizon, can be. Make no mistake, this is a candid and transparent discussion of where we are and where we need to be, something we have not seen in the past. This is also something that the council has been eager to see and I'm grateful uh, for this department's uh, commitment to bring back updates on a regular basis. Mr. Chairman, I think you were offering comeback quarterly? I, I was, yes. Thank you. There's no question that we need more shelter, and I appreciate the open perspective in considering all options. Regardless of location, we must continue to take a client-centered approach that creates an individual bed or unit for every individual need, seniors, families, single women, folks that are disabled, youth, and others. As we will be discussing on the next item, our shelter system must meet the needs of everyone it serves. Shelter, though important, is not the end game. Shelter must be the intermediate step between the streets and permanent housing. That is our goal. But until there is housing, shelter fills that gap. The value of a shelter strategy that truly rests in the effect is, the value of a shelter strategy truly rests in the effectiveness of a throughput strategy. To put, so as I said before, to put this on hold is not acceptable, do nothing is acceptable. Now the one thing I think the public raised that you did not that was not touched upon the strategy. You were just looking at the totality of where you could create uh, shelter beds, safe uh, camping, safe parking. When you take those next steps, will we be drilling down to what are individual needs and how we will tailor these sites to individual needs? Yes, and 
to be very clear, we did provide all of the options available to, uh, available to us per the request from many members of this body. In outlining the population that we are, our unsheltered population on the street, in outlining that in this same document, our commitment is to making sure that as we move forward with additional shelter options, that we're matching up the needs of the population that we're seeing. Okay, and I believe the recently released point in time count gives you more data to actually work with in terms of actually understanding the populations. It does, and, and I can reiterate that this is a living document. Of course, when we drafted this document, we did not have the 2022 point in time count data. So now that we do, we will be able to update it and re-release the document. Uh, the document's currently posted on our website, so any new iteration we'll make sure to include there as well. Okay, terrific. Look forward to uh, the expansion of this and we start moving from a strategy to actual plan and implementation. I think we all can agree that implementation is what we're really looking for, uh, but I appreciate the very good work. As I said, uh, this is something that's been a long time in coming. I appreciate the good heavy lift, uh, especially you, Ms. Jarman, have been recently there, uh, but uh, Ms. Harry and, and uh, 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 Mr. Carter, for the good work that you've been doing all along on this. So, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member LaCava. All right, we will now go to Council Member Von Wilpert. Thank you, Council President. Um, thank you very much uh, to the Homeless Services and Strategies and Solutions Department. Um, Ms. Jarman, it's great to have you on board as well. And thank you to the Mayor's team and the Regional Task Force and the Homeless, everyone who has put, or not homelessness, excuse me, we changed the name everyone who's put effort into this uh, shelter strategy. Um, I know it's no question that we need more shelter and more permanent housing. I, I agree, shelter is not housing, but shelter is a crisis mechanism we do have to take on given what's happening um, on our streets. And uh, Council Member Whitburn is right. This council has approved every affordable housing project, every market rate housing project, every special ADU project that's come before it. But all we can do up here is approve housing. We are not allowed to build it. Um, hopefully we can change that at the state level and it's up to developers, affordable housing developers and market rate developers. And that's taking time, but we're hoping to set up the future of the city for success by, by increasing the housing stock in San Diego. In the meantime, I also wanna thank the Housing Commission for taking the initiative to purchase uh, empty hotels that can be used to help folks. And I, want, I think Ms. Jones is still here, how many how many rooms are we hoping to have on, in, open soon, provided that uh, these hotel purchases go through? Good afternoon, Council Member Van Whipler. Um, right now we have two applications into the state, one for 13 units, another one for 64 units. We have three additional sites that we're currently doing due diligence on, which could get us up to around 460, but again, we wanna go through the due diligence first with those. Fantastic. Uh, f over 400 units would be wonderful. Um, that's obviously non-congregate shelter to get folks in. Uh, in Rancho Bernardo in District 5, I'm very much looking forward to the opening of the Radisson Hotel, which is now the Tizon Project. We as the city helped purchase that, fund it, and turn it over to uh, an affordable housing developer to build that out for seniors, uh, homeless seniors. And I think that's a fantastic project. I am very proud to be supporting that project. And if there's other hotels in my district, I'd be more than happy to support that work. Um, Dealing with the crisis portion of this in terms of the shelters, and in ter I'm really glad to see we're opening our first LGBTQ shelter for youth. I think that's a great idea to do for adults as well. I know that the LGBT center itself is taking on some of this mantle to help us with this. I also really love that we're talking to school districts about using, because there are families who have students who are homeless, so making sure that that is a safe space for folks to be in. I think that's a really great idea. Um, I'm really hopeful that we're going to be able to move the housing navigation center. We're calling it the homelessness resource. I hope we can move that operation to another facility, tear down the indoor skydiving diving center and actually build housing there. And I know we're on the way to do that. Um, in terms of the safe camping, safe sleeping areas, um, I know that is a crisis management tool. We all know that we do not anticipate people being in the safe sleeping areas permanently but for now it is a good crisis management tool. So I got the opportunity to tour the first lot yesterday and um, I wanted to ask more questions about it. So it will be private tents for individuals, um, but also we're not going to force people to split up, correct? People can come as couples, they can come as pods with neighbors, all of that. That is correct. 
Okay. They can come as couples, they can come as pods, caretakers, what, whatever they whatever they would like. Okay, because I have heard that some best practices are getting folks who are together because they have communities and they support each other on the street so they can all move together, which is fantastic. Um, same thing with pets will be allowed and service animals will be allowed? That's correct. Okay. Something I am particularly worried about, which we'll talk about later this afternoon, is the skyrocketing rate of death from fentanyl and overdoses. So how will we make sure that people are safe in their tents? We will ensure that people are safe in their tents by ensuring that we're doing wellness checks when appropriate. I will also say that we will have our outreach teams doing in-reach into the 20th and B safe camping site. Um, that will have the ability to be able to refer people to uh, medically assisted treatment or any sort of beds, the limited ones that we have that may be able to be offered up. Uh, but regular check-ins with individuals so that we can ensure that we're keeping people safe. Wonderful. Um, I'm, I know that we are already having Narcan available, uh, which is very important, is a huge harm reduction strategy. I actually just gave out a Fentanyl Awareness Day proclamation this morning at 7 a.m. at UCSD's Hillcrest Hospital. And they had four people inside who had already overdosed. And they said, you can come to any ER in the county and walk up to the counter and ask for Narcan, no ID required, no questions asked, and we need to use this to save lives. So I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I think I'll have more questions as we go forward, but I, I really appreciate the fact that we're trying to do both long-term strategy for housing and um, making sure that we have shelter. We, do, we don't have enough, I know that. Uh, my last question is about senior citizens. Uh, that's the highest population, growing population of homeless individuals. I know we are trying very hard on some of the prevention strategies, in, including in the budget we just passed, is increasing the senior um, shallow subsidy to make sure that seniors can pay the increased rent they get every year. But what is our strategy to help make sure seniors aren't forgotten in this process? We're very well aware that we need to be taking care of our seniors. Um, there's a very good opportunity for us to have a senior subpopulation at the future OLOT. Seniors, of course, will never be precluded from 20th and B. And I do also want to make sure that it's pointed out, I know it's within the plan as well, that we do currently have seniors landing. So we have an opportunity for seniors to be able to use that facility. Uh, they must have a housing resource, but while they're waiting for their permanent housing solution, we're able to uh, house them in non-congregate options. Okay. Got it. And I understand that this is going to be an ongoing conversation. This is just the beginning of the strategy document, and um, I'd like to continue hearing more updates. But thank you to Councilmember uh, Whitburn and Council Lacava for their great questions as well, and thank you for the time. Thank you, Councilmember Von Wilpert. Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Council President. Um, first off, thank you, Mr. Armand, for um, and, and for your entire team for uh, this extensive analysis, um, both of our existing shelter, but also um, opportunities moving forward. I actually want to take a moment to commend your work because I understand you've only been here for several short weeks. Um, it seems a little bit longer than that already, um, but assembling this strategy for additional shelter, um, I do believe is ultimately comprehensive um, and I think um, certainly should be commended. Um, I also want to especially acknowledge that you have a monumental task ahead of you, um, especially since you're working to identify not only new shelter opportunities, but you're looking at how to relocate um, 900 plus existing shelter beds, um, shows that it's going to be a significant challenge not only to, to, con to achieve that, but to really net um, new shelter opportunities at the end of the day. Um, given the presentation today, there are certainly significant opportunities identified um, for additional shelter pets, safe parking, safe sleeping, um, as well as new sites um, ranging in cost from anywhere from a million dollars to $20 million. Um, as we all know from the budget that we just passed um, yesterday, our limited resources mean that we have only allocated about $5 million towards new shelter opportunities, um, and that's including safe sleeping, which from what you presented would exceed that cost um, in itself. Um, I know there's work being done to try to amplify those dollars. Can you share more about what that is and, and really how we would actually implement this plan? I can. You are correct. We do have $5 million for increased shelter. We also have $1.5 million for the relocation of shelter beds. We have $850,000 for new safe parking. So with those three buckets of funding, we will we are seeking to really leverage that, one, with private and corporate philanthropic dollars, um, making sure that we are really 
doing our best to get private, corporate, and philanthropic dollars into our shelter system, uh, but also looking at ways to both reduce any sort of overhead costs and increase our donations. I'll, I'll say, for example, for 20th and B, we, for COTS, for instance, we did receive donations from the Red Cross for additional COTS and really making sure that we are doing our best to be good stewards of that money to expand the, the dollars that we do have available to us. And just so that folks understand, um, with the relocation, um, those costs for operating new shelters that we are relocating are based on existing um, operational costs that we already have budgeted? That is correct. Thank you, Council Member. You, you make a very good point that 16th and Newton, for instance, currently is not tapped into uh, utilities. Uh, so that provides an increased cost at that site. If we were to move that sprung structure to say something like the H barracks, we would make sure to tap into existing infrastructure so that we could receive some sort of cost savings for what's currently budgeted at 16th and Newton. Thank you. As um, shelter increases, do you anticipate a need for increased outreach services um, that would uh, align with that increase of shelter as well? With increase of shelter, we would want to see an increase of outreach services. I will say, in addition, what we would like to see and what we'll work with our regional partners on is the long-term resources. So I know it's outlined in this document, but we did receive a significant amount of housing and long-term resources during the pandemic. Those have essentially dried up. So in addition to outreach on the front end, we also want to make sure that we're encouraging the throughput out of the system into the permanent housing units. Thank you. Um, and in the report, I believe uh, there was a bit of a detail and breakdown of some of the different types of demographics um, that we are trying to individualize shelter for. Um, I, I was wondering, are there more detailed demographics that really help to break down? I know you mentioned, for example, caretakers, um, the LGBTQ population, um, those with limited mobility or other disability needs. We can get you additional information. I might actually ask Lisa Jones, I don't know if she's too far away, but that may be an additional option for us in the community action plan update to really detail different subpopulations. I don't know, Lisa, if it does or not. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the community action plan update doesn't get into that level of detail, but we can pull some of that out of HMIS. The caretaker couples, that's one of the biggest challenges and frankly is a known gap in our system. We hear from outreach workers all the time. So I think as we talk about what this plan looks like on paper, what it looks like in implementation is going to be really critical and getting some opportunities to get feedback from folks with lived experience and do additional survey work um, with our unsheltered population is going to be important. Important. So we are starting to bridge some of those gaps. Uh, folks with challenges with their activities of daily living and mobility challenges and caretaker couples being really high on the list. Thank you. And Lisa, thank you for being here to answer some, some questions too. I actually have more for you if you if you don't mind staying for a moment, especially because I think um, you're addressing a, a significant concern of ours, which is just knowing that shelter availability isn't um, as simple as we all think of it, just having beds available, but really ensuring that there are beds that match up with the needs that exist. So what, I think what you were saying is that in the intake system as it exists currently, are we getting data about um, the, the data that shows the types of needs that folks ha have? Yes, so we um, collect data and we're actually working on migrating it to a new system right now, which will make it easier to sort of run just in time reporting. But to give an example, um, over the last three and a half months, uh, March through March 1st through June 11th, we had 4,742 referrals into our coordinated intake shelter system, of which we were able to place 1,504. So the need significantly obviously outweighs what's available. Um, typical reasons are um, not being able to manage their activities of daily living. So folks that have really high need, we don't actually have a shelter system that's resourced to support them. Um, not enough bottom bunks or not enough you know, female bunks, something of that nature. Um, those tend to be the main reasons. Got it, which means I think, I think I've seen reporting on this as, as well. It means that there are quite a number of referrals that are being turned away. On, yes. a, on a regular basis, unfortunately. Yes, over the last three and a half months, 3,238 incomplete referrals. So of all the referrals, um, only about 30% um, of our referrals actually complete into shelter. My, my understanding is that, is there a, a daily report that is typically sent out to providers? And in that, um, can you detail what the latest occupancy rate is? of our current shelter system? Yes, so first thing in the morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning, um, available shelter beds go out to providers throughout the system, including all of our homeless outreach teams and, and homeless providers. 
an occupancy um, email goes out at the end of the day, um, basically saying how the system performed that day, how many referrals were placed. Um, as of this morning, our occupancy rate over across our shelter system is 97%. So that leaves um, 55 beds in the system. At what point during the day then is um, typically would it be considered full? Usually by 10 or 11 in the morning, we're already full based on the referrals that we start getting at about 8.15. Got it. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, as my colleagues have noted, I think the creation of shelter is just one step, um, especially given its temporary and emergency in nature. Um, we continue to have significant work uh, to address the economic and the housing affordability challenges that many San Diegans who are housed today are already facing. Um, I believe the Regional Task Force on Homelessness has continued to report that we are seeing 13 individuals entering homelessness uh, for the first time each month uh, with only 10 individuals exiting, um, which means that even as we embark on um, more strategy for more shelter, which again is certainly welcomed, um, the, the challenge is significant considering the, those who are experiencing homelessness each month outweigh um, the capacity that we have to support them getting out of the system. Um, so again, thank you, Mr. Arm, for your work, um, to the entire department for your work, and uh, thank you for your willingness to step up to this challenge. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Council President Pro Tem Montgomery Step. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I appreciate the quick turnaround here, um, and, and, and I know that there have been pretty consistent asks from council members uh, probably at least for the last six months uh, for something like this, but um, I, I appreciate um, what you all have put together and us, us being here today. I do have um, some questions about the facility options summary um, and how uh, th there are ranges uh, within the chart, so there's not uh, an exact number of, uh, with regard to capacity, but um, what, you also mentioned in the chart um, the increased number of shelter beds. Um, could you repeat that for me and, and, and tell me how that coincides with the facilities uh, options summary? And, and what I mean by that is like, for example, for warehouses, you have 50 to 300. So within your total goal of 600 over the next year, what numbers were you using specifically in this chart? I'm happy to start and then I'll ask Sarah Ferry to talk a little bit more about the budget. Uh, but with this summary sheet, we wanted to give an overview on each location, the capacity, the warehouses that we've looked at could hold between 50 to 300 individuals. And what we went ahead and did with that is we used the cost per bed night that Sarah Ferry and, uh, and thank you, Amy, from the IBA as well had mentioned to really assess what on the low end would that budget be for a warehouse of 50, what would it be for a warehouse of 300, just to provide a very, um, a, a very public r reality of what the cost for something like this would cost at the low end and the high end. But I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add anything to that. And pertaining to the cost, as Amy mentioned, we did use an average. Um, and to earlier comments, we are um, yet to site specific populations with specific sites. Once we do that, we'll, the cost will also vary depending on the um, service level needs for the different populations. Currently with these sites, we're about to embark in that process of really fine tuning. Um, who will be at which site, which site is most conducive to which population. Um, that will impact the actual capacity for the site and then as well as the subsequent budget that's developed. Okay, and, and for the safe parking sites and with specifically to the libraries, uh, are you budgeting those out to be 24-hour spaces? No, those would not be 24-hour spaces. So with all the library locations, those would be overnight only. Uh, it would require that participants of the safe parking program exit about a half an hour to an hour after library closing and be gone before the library opens again the next morning. Uh, but those would be in, those would be programs similar to how Balboa and Arrow currently operate for that overnight only program. Okay, and then for those, we have heard concerns from folks who are there about how those operate since they're not 24 hours. We, we, we have had heard concerns from clients there. 
Just yeah, and, and these facilities just in general, we wouldn't be able to use them 24 seven because of the daytime library use. Okay, and, and I think that, you know, with the time that you all had looking at our own facilities, I certainly understand this list. Um, however, I do think, as we heard in public comment, there's a there's a component that we can use with our service providers to maybe find uh, some some alternative sites. Uh, heard from District Four members today about Malcolm X in particular. There are other sites on this list in District Four that our uh, constituents did not mention. However, I, I don't. I also don't think that that's a good site. And then I also we've been having conversations with community members. Um, that actually own land that that may uh, be better for this use or some other use. So I would like to just you could further those conversations with you all because um, we don't we don't think that this is a good site. So with my um, remaining time, I wanted to ask, um, is there any any consideration in, in the strategy with regard to residential care facilities? We have a lot in District Four, um, and they. Um, you know, they essentially house folks that may otherwise not be able to afford living here. And so is that been brought up as a part of a, an overall uh, comprehensive strategy? The residential care facilities, although not in this comprehensive shelter strategy, are still an option. And I would say we would likely want to work with our community partners. We, of course, do not fund any of those at this current time, but we would want to work with some of our partners to be able to look at those connections. Okay. We did hear from the Hill Network um, last year, the Public Safety Committee. Um, I think it was, the, was it just the Public Safety Committee last year? We changed the name anyway. Um, we we did hear from the Hill Network, and I think one of the things that I got um, um, from that conversation was that there there was a desire to have um, smaller homes um, be a part of this overall strategy um, that we are considering, and that came from folks with lived experience. And so I really have not heard that conversation being risen up to the levels of what we're talking about now. I think that it should be included, especially when we have things on this list that you know are expanding things by like 12 or 20. You know, then we can talk. Then if we're going that small, then we can talk about some of these other solutions. Um, I also wanted to ask about um, the a memo um, that we submitted. And Sarah, you were not here at the time, so, um, but um, February 16th, 2023, um, submitted to the department by the council president and uh, council member Joe LaCava and I with regard to the recommendations in the, um, the recommended action items. Um, with regard to the ad hoc committee on addressing homelessness among black San Diegans and that act, that plan. Um, within that plan, um, there were six action items and I will just read them, development of HMIS data dashboard to track our progress on equity goals. Inclusive procurement um, was the second one, training and education, mentorship of black led organizations, center the voice of people with lived experience who are black, transform the crisis response system. I know that there was a reference to it in the report, and I do appreciate that, but if, is there more detail as to those six um, action plans that we have before us? I would point you to the section that we did include, the items from the ad hoc uh, committee. I will say that, Council President Pro Tem, if you want additional detail, I never go anywhere without my document, so I'm happy to provide that to you. Otherwise, we can follow up with additional detail. I did mention this is a living document, and if you have any recommendations for us to be clearer to make sure that we're addressing those action items, we are happy to include that. Okay, so number one, has there been a data dashboard to track our progress goals on equity? Has, has that been um, established? We have not established it as a department yet. I will say that, uh, as I mentioned in my bu budget presentation, it is on our work plan for this year, not only in addition to that, but working with the Housing Commission in their dashboard and the RTFH in their dashboard. So okay. Making sure that they're all communicating with each other. Okay. I just, I think I need a couple more minutes. Have I used eight minutes already? All right. About three. Okay. Um, inclusive procurement, um, I think that is also a reference in the overall action plan. Have we made steps to ensure that that is happening? 
Yes, we have, Sarah. If, do you wanna take this one or, or I can? But one of the items that we have been reviewing is the in, internal city procurement policies to see if we can incorporate um, additional inclusive policies, but I'll let Sarah also talk about the SBLE program and nonprofit status. Yes, we are engaging um, in conversations internally within uh, cross city departments to make sure um, nonprofits, small nonprofits, grassroots organizations can also be um, included within our procurement um, priority list with the SBLE as well. Okay, what about mentorship of black led organizations? For action item number four? Yes. Uh, so for action item number four, we are still working with the RTFH on ensuring that this, I know that for um, the first action item, the continuum of care will acknowledge and help do strategies and outreach. So one of the things that we're looking to do is encouraging um, one leadership from the RTFH on that mentorship, but two, any way that we can work with our contractors and potential options for subcontractors for that mentorship. But we are committed to working with the RTFH on action item number four. Okay, is a member of the R uh, representative from RTFH here to provide a little bit more detail to that? Okay. Um, That's a President Pro Tem. Ms. Kohler is on her way oh, up. Oh, Tamara, okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I very much appreciate you lifting up the work of this committee. It's critical and important. Uh, on our dashboard, which will be a regional dashboard, we're just doing the Q&A on that, so we'll let you know when that's available. It's important it will update every month, similar to our inflow and outflow data report that we do. The uh, importance of mentorship, we're working on that in the ad hoc committee for this next round identifying what those organizations truly are, what is the mentorship they're looking for from us. So really leaning into leadership in grassroots organizations, those led by black San Diegans, and how we can also lift up emerging leaders in this work and invest in that as well. Okay, I will just say I, can, I cannot uh, speak for uh, any individual organization and what their mission and vision and goals are. What I have seen in, in my years of doing this is that there is, um, um, there is a struggle with understanding how the system works, especially with regard to procurement. So like my experience is that black led organizations know how to tackle the problems on the ground. That is not an issue. Um, the issue is the system and the barriers. And so I'm thinking that the mentorship that is involved there is kind of maybe a little bit more of a technical Yeah, I mentorship. agree, absolutely. And that's what we've heard. And I think that's why it's really important when we say mentorship, it actually is technical assistance. They are really good at this work. It's really that we've created barriers. It's different things like having uh, financial uh, stability or record keeping or other things. Um, at a level that we've required that keeps a lot of our grassroots and smaller organizations who are so nimble and so effective in their communities from being able to receive the funding. And so as we look at procurement practices, technical assistance is what we need and also giving additional support and points to smaller grassroots organizations in their communities. Yes, absolutely. And, and the last thing always is just capital and being able to operate um, uh, without you know, certain reimbursement clauses and the like. So thank you so much um, for, for answering those questions. I appreciate it. Um, I won't go through the other two, although I will say that centering the voices of people with lived experience who are black is very, very important. I have always advocated, especially within our departments, that, that we hire people with lived experience and not just put folks on a task force or you know, other things that people may or may not have the time or money to volunteer for. So I think that that's still important in a way that we can center the voices. Um, I um, want to just close with a couple of th additional things that I've heard. One is, monitoring the wraparound services and how the services are being deployed with our providers is very, very important. I am hearing stories of bullying. Um, I'm hearing um, stories of things that are happening within the, 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 the institutions or within um, 
the, the, the congregate settings, especially some even within the non-congregate settings, I am hearing this. And so I don't know that we have a framework in order to monitor and hold accountable at that level. I, I think we're just really trying to rush to get, you know, more beds available for people, which is, which is certainly what we're supposed to be doing. But I think sometimes people are turning away services because of the conditions. Um, and so anyway, um, thank you again for the reporting and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time, Council President. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem. Council Member Moreno. Um, thank you for the presentation. and. Uh, Ms. Jarman, I, I do appreciate the work you, you and your team, uh, the effort you guys put in producing uh, this report. Um, this has not been done previously in such a straightforward way. And I do want to take the time to thank you for taking this assignment on and providing the information to us. Um, I think it's clear with the updated point in time count number that our efforts thus far to reduce the amount of individuals experiencing homelessness in the city have failed. In fact, the opposite is true. The number of unsheltered individuals has actually increased by more than 30%. I think this makes the city's efforts to bring more shelter beds online just even more urgent. Um, I did hear you make a comment about um, the 16th and Newton site, uh, the one that is temporarily gonna expand beds and then is gonna close. Um, you mentioned that it's, it's your thought that that is gonna go into the NTC H barracks. Now, is that, um, you said they might. So I'm hanging on your words here. Is, is it the intention of this administration to put the individuals on 16th and Newton to um, relocate them to NTC H barracks? H barracks being one of the largest city owned parcels that we have, it is, one of our better options for constructing a new tent to be able to transfer all 324 individuals from 16th and Newton uh, with that increased capacity if it were the council and the administration's, um, you know, uh, under the purview to do so if we wanted to expand 16th and Newton. Got you. And and I know that some of the folks of, at Golden Hall are going to go to the old library, but not all of them, right? So is it is it the intention of this, of this administration to take the folks from Golden Hall and put them at the barracks as well? Uh, the, the 930 in, in its entirety for the relocation of shelter beds, including the single adults downstairs, could go to a myriad of locations that we have outlined, including the expansion of 16th and Newton, including the expansion of 17th and Imperial, the ability for us to use the north side of the second floor of Golden Hall, NTCH barracks, and also any available warehouses that we have. I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the other options on the list, uh, but we do have available options for the individuals, not only at the downstairs of Golden Hall, but the entire 930 over the next year and a half. Got you, so Newton and 16th, Barracks, Golden Hall, a plethora of other. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we get that clear on the record. Now, regarding the location at um, the barracks, once the city converts the space for sprung structures or safe parking or safe sleeping, um, how long will that location remain available? And uh, where might those beds be replaced if that site becomes unavailable in the future? So we will likely have that site until about 2028, at what time we are looking at the long-term strategy for the old Central Library and for the Homelessness Response Center. So those would be two long- Homelessness response, sorry to interrupt you, is that- The old Sky navigation dive? center. Okay. Yep. Just navigation Yep. <laughs> I get There's been many names for it. Uh, so those two facilities would be two longer-term options. As I had mentioned, we are really excited about the old Central Library because we could continue to have the homelessness response center in that ground floor, but then also build congregate and semi-congregate shelter options on top with a tower as high as it can go with affordable and permanent supportive housing. Got you. Um, also, can you expand on the locations related to, um, and I quote, warehouses and vacant religious facilities that you mentioned in the facilities options summary on the uh, page 10 of the report? 
I can. So we did ask Dream to run a report and we regularly ask them to run reports of available vacant warehouses and religious facilities. So we currently have a list of about 10 to 12 of those two types. Uh, they are, it, we've looked citywide, they're sized between 50 and 300. We are currently still doing evaluations for building code to see what would be the best ones moving forward. We did not outline all of them for two reasons. One, warehouses can come and go based on when they were leased up. We did do the initial search many weeks mm -hmm. ago. And two, if we were to publicize them openly that we would lose any negotiation, we may lose negotiation footing uh, if we were to move forward for those leased facilities. I will also note really briefly, we had never looked at vacant religious facilities before, but as I outlined in the report, it's a unique opportunity for us uh, because religious organizations are restricted from leasing and selling commercially. So we would be able to get uh, somewhat of a better value if we were to find one that suits our needs, a large congregate space, often have kitchens, often have large parking lots. But even those are temporary in nature, right? Because a lot of those facilities are actually developing housing as we speak. So, some are, yes. Uh, warehouses, not so much, not so but much, uh, vacant, uh, the, the religious facilities, yes. Got you. Well, thank you for your candor. Thank you for this report. I, I truly appreciate the effort you guys have put in um, with the increase in unsheltered individuals in the latest point in count. I am concerned that the city, even with the locations and timelines outlined in this report, is not gonna be able to keep pace with the amount of people needing shelter. Um, I think this is especially true if the proposed ordinance we're discussing next goes into effect. So um, that concludes my comments, Council President, and thank you for the time. Thank you, Council Member Moreno. Council Member Campillo. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Mr. Arman, thank you for your presentation and your good good work in identifying the data and presenting uh, future options that uh, completely, uh, I think there's a complete agreement in this room that this is uh, not the circumstance that we want to see in perpetuity. We want to see people housed. Uh, to, that, to, to that point, uh, I'm noticing that from the general fund, we plan to spend, I just had it right here, $43.4 million. And there's grant funding, so because that's contingent on other things, let's just consider the $43.4 million we're gonna spend. Um, that goes to shelter, outreach, safe parking, family reunification, and any number of other uh, prevention, supportive services, things like that, and administration, of course. Uh, do we have data on how many uh, unhoused individuals have jobs or have streams of income? I don't have that with me at this present moment, but we can follow up with your office on Okay, that. does anyone from the regional task force have the data on how many individuals who are unsheltered have a job or are uh, have a stream of income, whether it's SSI, whether whatever it is? Tamara Kuller from the Regional Task Force. I forgot to introduce myself before. Uh, thank you for the question. We do collect that information and we can share that with you. One of the places uh, that we collect information on that many times is a point in time count. We saw through the pandemic a number of individuals experiencing homelessness, both sheltered and sh unsheltered, uh, lost their streams of income. And I think that's important to recognize. You also are seeing an increase in an aging population where they do have a fixed income, but it isn't sufficient to meet their housing. So we're happy to share that information with you. Uh, we can probably turn that around within 24 hours. Very good, please do that, hold tight. So the reason I ask is because uh, I believe that one of the most efficient and most direct ways to have people housed is the shallow subsidy idea, it's something that we funded yesterday uh, to the tune of a few million dollars. Um, I know that Several council members also advocated for an extra uh, several million dollars, but it didn't make it in the last, uh, that extra additional $2 million on the idea that if we give about $500 a month to folks over the course of 24 months, they can stay housed. 
the reason I ask about that income stream issue is because I'm wondering why we simply don't have the shallow subsidy uh, program for people who are already in our shelters so that we can give them the $500 so that they can stay in their apartments, get into an apartment. Obviously, you need to also have security deposits, other aspects of that too. Um, but if we, is that contemplated anywhere with, well, with your organization? Yeah, and, and I appreciate you talking about the shallow subsidies. That work came uh, together through the regional task force in partnership with uh, serving seniors. Uh, their CEO, Paul Downing, is here. We did a survey and found r really unexpectedly that uh, folks 55 or older were saying as little as three to $400 was the difference between uh, keeping them housed. Yeah, it was 58% of seniors needed yeah. $300 or less, right? Absolutely. And it's important we lean into that where we know on your unsheltered population from the point in time, it's now 29% of your unsheltered are 55 or older. And so the importance of those shallow subsidies, there has been conversation nationally uh, about a uh, cash payment, just a, a, a payment to, uh, to folks experiencing homelessness. So it is something we're considering. Diversion work is another really good one for first time homeless, a little bit of income, a little bit of, uh, of uh, financial assistance sometimes is all people need. Understood. Uh, I don't know, if, I haven't heard this idea from anybody, but um, do uh, service providers try to essentially put multiple individuals who are unhoused, who have streams of in income, together with a common shallow subsidy to try to have housing so that we can open up spaces in the shelter. Because if we're at 3% uh, you know, available every morning and they're taken up by 10 or 11 in the morning, it seems to me that we could be doing a lot better by giving people the money to be housed to open up the shelter space for others who don't have a stream of income. And I think also important is having the capacity to house people. We have a significant number of veterans, over 200, that have a housing voucher in hand, are sheltered and unsheltered, and are struggling to find units to lease up. So it's not just being able to have the income or being able to pay rent. We struggle to have the capacity of units available to folks to house them. And so a significant amount of work is being done. I'm just going to give a shout out to uh, Melissa Petersman and townspeople and funders together who are looking at really good strategies for roommate matching so that you can have multiple incomes. You don't have to be of a, a familiar uh, relationship and can be housed because we need to expand how we house folks. I mean, roommates are how a lot of us do it. I happen to be married to mine, but that's how we put two incomes together. Uh, we need to look at all of those strategies and we could really lean into uh, additional throughput of folks in shelter to have those conversations. I know our providers do that. They have conversations about multiple ways to, to solve their homelessness. They're not just waiting for permanent supportive housing. And our inflow and outflow report shows that the majority of people who end their homelessness do with a little bit of financial assistance and have to use our market uh, rate rent to be able to do it. So I know providers have conversations about that. It's important for us to create more flexible funding streams for them to really have that additional funding to be able to use the strategies that you're suggesting. Isn't, isn't the most flexible funding stream just to hand people the money and let them do it? That is the most flexible. Okay. Uh, I think um, I do have a question for the Housing Commission, please. Thank you very much, Ms. Kohler. I, I think it's important that we, the word community has come up several times, and I think that as individuals who have formed a community uh, while being unsheltered, uh, need need that assistance to be paired together, figure out what what it's going to take to actually get them to rent somewhere on their own with the self-sufficiency that comes with that because I think that a lot of people are ready for that, but $500 more a month is essentially like a $3.12 raise. So jobs that, you know, paying, if, if what we're saying is people need a $3 raise to be able to afford housing, that's that's not the, the worst, that's, that's not very dramatic, uh, it's just a little bit more. Ms. Jones, good to see you. Uh, with a few seconds I have left. Um, I think one of the reasons that there wasn't more advocacy to expand the housing instability prevention program uh, yesterday at the budget vote probably came from a sentence in the IBA report that says, however, the Housing Commission will likely need ramp up time to hire staff to support ad additional households. 
uh, likely resulting in unspent funding. I'll just need one more minute, Council President. Yes, sir. Uh, to hire staff to support these additional households, resulting in some unspent funding by the end of fiscal 24. I believe that sentence was exactly the same from the previous year when we first put in place the roughly three million or so the first time. Uh, what is what is that sentence telling me? Uh, so that it's it's telling you what we're experiencing as a commission as well, which is get it's harder and harder to attract and retain staff. Uh, it's taking longer for us um, by I'd say several months to attract and retain staff. Uh, we are fairly competitive from a wage perspective and a benefits perspective. The budget that you approved yesterday approved additional full-time positions, which is better than short-term contract hires, which is what we often have to do. So that's actually going to make it easier as we're going forward. We're changing our recruitment to full-time positions. It'll make it easier, but it's it's not just something our shelter and homeless system is experiencing. We're experiencing it too. Okay. So ramping up time to hire staff to hand out $500, like uh, bottom line, that's what the sentence is saying. It, it $500 a month, yes. On average, we also are providing case management as part of these programs. And 60% of the folks that are coming in and enrolling are 55 years of age or older on a fixed income. So 24 months and then an end is going to leave them a cliff. It's really important from a case management perspective that we are case managing them off ramping to another program or subsidy source. So it's not just the $500, it's actually the case managers that are gonna make the difference. Understood. Uh, how many vacancies do you have in that particular program? That particular program, uh, we have 136, I think, enrollments, 125 right now, which gives us about 170 spaces left. I, okay. Um, what I mean is, how many vacancies oh, for sorry. staff do you have? I thought I was thinking how. I'm interested to know how many vacancies. <laughs> um, staff, yeah. uh, we have four right now. So four. Half of our program. Half, half, half of what you need. Okay. Um, I think this is something that we could hire unsheltered individuals to do. If we're going to say lived spaces, lived experience for this, I think we have people who understand that, and we could give four really good jobs to help several hundred more families to do that. So they're, they're on our website and we share that um, through RTFH. We also share it through the peer program at San Diego City College that we have um, partnered with. So yes, absolutely, by all means. <laughs> Understood. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, I, I, remain, I remain very committed to the idea that handing, handing people who simply need a $3 raise to be able to afford housing is we, we can do that with the city funding we have, and I look forward to advocating for that in the upcoming year even further. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman Campillo. All right, um, I wanna uh, thank my colleagues for the thoughtful questions and, and comments. The feedback was pri provided here. Um, that's why we wanted to do this um, and have this conversation on the dais. Uh, Sarah, thank you for the work that you've put into this with your team. Um, as has been mentioned multiple times, this. You were responding to request, multiple requests that were made um, over a pretty extended period of time. Um, my frustration aside with that part of it, um, the initial request was I think made on June 27th of last year um, for a presentation on the parking, safe parking um, expansion, the potential for new sites. Um, one thing that does stand out, though, in in your work, and it's a good, it's a, in a good way, is the changes and the and the options that are available. So, can you talk to the to the council a bit about how it was that a list that was provided a few months ago in terms of potential safe parking sites is now much more expansive, and that's just the beginning of the various sites that you'll have identified that could potentially be sites for for shelter. I would not be doing this city justice if I did not give credit to a significant number of city departments that have been convened together in order to really take a look at every available option citywide. So I know I mentioned for safe parking um, libraries. As you are all aware, I had been in this role previously and, and we did not contemplate libraries or rec centers at that time, but to know that Misty had offered up opportunities that her librarians are actually very excited about was wonderful. Uh, San Diego Unified did come recently to us. We are looking forward to potentially other parties coming forward with additional sites that we may be able to use, but it really was a look citywide at what options were available and we keep track of all of that as well within Dream, Penny Moss, um, make sure she's she's keeping us on, on our toes to keep track of what we looked at, why it might not have worked uh, and any new options that come forward. 
Thank you, Sarah. Um, Along those lines, um, well, so first of all, I, so to me what that sounds like is a change, change in approach in terms of making it more of a all hands on deck approach to addressing shelter capacity when it comes to the, the mayor's office and this administration's approach. Is that accurate? I can confirm that it is an all hands on deck approach. Thanks, and I know that uh, Mr. Dargan, our COO, has played a, an important role in that, and so I thank you for that, Mr. Dargan. Um, can you talk to us about to what extent, and, and Council President Pro Tem touched on this, Council Member Campillo touched on this in, in, in another way, how people with lived experience were included in the development of the strategy? I will say that one of the biggest components of the strategy is, of course, the site analysis, where we would like to make sure that the voices of persons with lived experience are moving forward is really the developing of programming for the facilities identified within this report. That, that's everything from actual site layout to needs of, of what would like to be included at each of these facilities. For instance, especially our longer term projects like OLOT, um, H Barracks and Old Central Library. What, what is the vision? What do the people that are going to use these facilities need from us and need us to build? I appreciate that. One um, idea I will offer is that um, we have an employee and empower program um, which provides paid internships to folks. Uh, that would seem like an excellent opportunity to provide people with lived experience um, who qualify for that program, an opportunity to use their, utilize their expertise in the identification of sites and um, as a way of vetting those sites while also providing them with a paycheck that not only provides them the benefit of the wages that they'll be earning, but also potentially even the ability to access permanent housing, um, which oftentimes requires a paycheck. Uh, is that something that you'd be open to? Absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of shift the conversation now to, to access. Um, this has been touched upon by um, some of my colleagues. It's one thing to have a bed. It's another thing to have a bed that someone can actually access. Um, the entry point of our system there's, a, there's various entry points. One of them is supposed to be the navigation center. And I think a fair critique that we've heard from the public that I've shared at times is that we have a, a navigation center that is meant to be, a, I mean, it, we're responding to homelessness, right? It's to, to navigating the experience of homelessness. Um, and it operates with normal business hours. And that is just not how homelessness works. Um, talk to us about the barriers to expanding hours, perhaps 24 seven or something along those lines and what the council needs to know in order to make that navigation center operate in such a way that is more consistent with the needs of people experiencing homelessness. So go ahead and take that. <laughs> so uh, the homelessness response center currently operates from eight to four Monday through Friday and from eight to I think noon on Saturdays. Um, also part of the homelessness response center is the coordinated shelter intake program, which currently runs eight to four, seven days a week. So it's not running in the evenings or overnight. Um, it's really a funding challenge. Obviously when we have funding to council member Campillo's point, we also then have to staff for those resources and bring staff in, but it's, it's a funding issue. It's about 1.5 million that the city invests in the homelessness response center right now, the housing commission about another 700,000 um, to get up to 24 seven coverage for coordinated shelter intake. And then to run the homelessness response center seven days a week from eight to four would cost about three and I'd say about $2 million more than what we've got right now. So about one and a half to $2 million more. And that's even with the skeleton crew during certain hours and trying to minimize costs? Yes, so it would be eight to four, seven days a week where we would have staff on site and then coordinated shelter intake would run 24 hours a day. I will say that outreach now runs till 10 o'clock every night. So there might not be a lot of value add in keeping coordinated intake open from 10 to 6 a.m. without also understanding what our conversations with hospitals or on hospital discharge would look like, which is a whole other conversation to contemplate. Got it, thank you. Uh, while you're up here, I've, um, just to make it, to save you a trip, um, are youth, um, are, are young people who are experiencing homelessness um, are incredibly vulnerable. Um, can you, and many of them are, are housed at, or sheltered at Golden Hall right now. Um, we've had many conversations about this. We spent some time with them. And can you share with the council what the plans are to transition them um, to, to a different place and 
what uh, additional plans either you have or Ms. Charman would like to share with respect to youth who are experiencing homelessness? Certainly. So currently there's 34 youth at Golden Hall. We started transferring uh, along with the new partnership with the center, um, some of the LGBTQ affirming youth um, into the new sites. We have up to 21 beds available with the center and their project with San Diego Youth Services and YMCA. And then Urban Street Angels will start moving youth into their new additional 32 beds that the city has funded um, starting about mid-July. Uh, with those two projects and the number of existing beds that were at Golden Hall, that ends up with a net about 10% increase, so a small increase in youth overall as the Golden Hall beds turn down. So it's certainly going to be something that we'll have conversations about as we talk about program modeling with the new shelter resources and creating targeted and safe spaces um, within other programs for youth. Thank you, Ms. Jones. And then I think there's a model being developed there, not just in terms of the space that's being created, the beds that are being opened up, but also in the inclusion of those most impacted in the design of that, right? We spent some time um, walking through the potential site, the Achievement Academy at the Housing Commission's building with those youth, and they were able to provide feedback. I think that's gonna be really valuable um, and, and probably provides a template for how we can be more inclusive of people with lived experience as we expand our shelter capacity. Um, Moving on to throughput, all of this, you know, is is really important. We need to expand shelter capacity, uh, but we need to move folks into permanent housing. As we've noted multiple times now, shelter is not a house. Uh, we need folks to be permanently housed. Um, Ms. Kohler mentioned the um, some of the, the strides that are being made with respect to shared housing. Uh, this is a model, and I'll just go ahead and add the time, if you would like to add the time now. Um, the, the shared housing is, is when two or more people who choose to live together in permanent housing and share housing costs. Um, the model is underutilized in the homeless system, even though it's allowed by, by HUD, if I understand correctly. We have very low uh, vacancy rates, high housing costs, lengthy build times, and a, a growing unhoused population. Um, this would seem to be a creative and innovative way um, to allow folks the opportunity to move through the shelter system more quickly uh, as relationships either are built on the streets or in shelters, um, providing those opportunities for folks who have built those relationships to then move into permanent housing together uh, would seem to be a way of making better use of the homes that we already have. We all agree we need more homes. We also need to make better use of the homes that exist. Um, so. I understand that this is a shelter strategy, but it's hard to have a conversation about a shelter strategy and and figure out if it's adequate without figuring out ways to uh, expedite how quickly folks can move from shelter into permanent housing. So I'm curious about, um, Sarah, your um, response and, and Lisa, yours, in terms of the opportunities to utilize something like shared housing as an opportunity to speed up the throughput through our shelter system and into permanent housing. Absolutely. I think, Council President, this iteration of the comprehensive shelter strategy was truly on expansion of shelter. I think a new or next iteration could very uh, could very well be those creative options in the absence of uh, new units coming online at, at a rapid pace. Shared housing is something we've explored. We've actually started to have conversations about what shared housing would look like for former short-term vacation rental properties. So I know that other cities are utilizing those properties for such a purpose, uh, but that is one creative solution that we are starting to identify amongst others in the absence of long-term housing and or long-term subs rental subsidies. I'll say additionally, um, when we talked about, and Ms. Kohler mentioned that, you know, um, the majority of folks that are exiting the system into housing are exiting without a coordinated entry system resource. That is problem solving conversations. And sometimes what happens is we don't capture that there's roommate sharing happening, but a lot of folks that are having to figure out their own resources or a little bit of resources from the system to exit are looking at how they can minimize their rent and maximize their opportunities to get housing. We also use the landlord engagement and assistance program. So that's one of the 
sort of lower or shallow subsidies or short-term subsidies where we're providing security deposits, um, utilities supports, and other moving costs to help folks move into housing. And those work in our shelter system now. Case managers can access those resources for folks that want to have identified housing or need help identifying it. So that's another way that we're actually pushing throw, flow through through the system. But I will say we probably do not well capture when folks are identifying and, and utilizing roommate sharing opportunities. Um, well, uh, there's a million things to do. You all have a monumental task. I, I recognize that. But again, as we think about ways to quickly move folks into permanent housing, I'll just say in one of the conversations Naveed from my team and I had with the youth at Golden Hall, we watched them organically have that conversation about shared housing. They didn't use the term shared housing, right? But the idea of being able to, to move out together, especially if that meant that they could move out of shelter, um, they were incredibly um, interested in that. And, and I would imagine that there's many, many people who are in shelter today who have provided the opportunity um, would would jump on that at a significantly less cost than it than uh, it would take to just move someone out on their own. Uh, recognizing that again, no single solution works for everyone. Uh, the last thing that I will say, Sarah, recognizing that you've um, mentioned at various points is a living document. Um, I, I do hope that we can be even more inclusive of the recommendations of the ad hoc committee to address homelessness amongst Black San Diegans recommendations in um, future iterations. Uh, that work that's been a multi-year effort. A ton of time has been spent into um, meeting and then uh, creating the recommendations. It's really important that the city honors that work by including uh, those recommendations in every step of our um, in our approach to addressing homelessness here in San Diego. Um, thank you again, Sarah, to you and your team for the work that you've done. Lisa, thank you for um, jumping up on the spot, and Tamara um, for the, um, from, for responding as well. Um, very much appreciate the conversation that we've had here. Um, with that, and as a reminder, this was an information item that does not require a motion. Um, we will now move to our next item. Uh, interim clerk, if you would introduce item 613, please. Yes, thank you. Item 613 is the amendments to the San Diego Municipal Code related to unauthorized camping or encampments on public property. If you are here in chambers, we do have about over 220 speakers here in chambers, so please be sure to submit your speaker slip early for better time management. If you are in the Zoom webinar, now is the time to start raising your hand in order to know that you would like to speak on this item, pressing star nine or the raise your hand icon. The staff report will be beginning. Please. Thank you, Council President. All right, folks, we're going to... We're going to start the next item. I'm going to ask if you are engaged in conversation, if you can move outside chambers. Um, we're a long way from being done and um, would like to make sure that staff um, can present and everyone has an opportunity to hear the presentation. Okay. With that, if I could have our presenters, please introduce yourselves for the record and let us know how much time you'd like for the presentation. Thank you, Council President. Let me begin by thanking the mayor for his partnership and thanking our city staff from many city departments who have done a tremendous amount of work in preparing the information and the data and the plans that we are presenting today. Thank you to all of the departments who have collaborated on this initiative. I'd like to thank all of the city departments who have collaborated on uh, this initiative. I also want to thank my colleagues on the Land Use and Housing Committee for their important feedback during the initial review of this draft ordinance. Chair Moreno, Vice Chair LaCava, and Council Member Lee provided important comments that have resulted in the improved ordinance and implementation plan that we are presenting today. The problem in front of us is that encampments pose public health and safety hazards to those living in them and to our neighborhoods. Given the city's interest in protecting public health and safety, I believe it is reasonable to have some regulation of encampments. Our encroachment ordinance is not well suited to this purpose. We need an ordinance that is specific to this issue. I think it is important to point out that our city is doing more than ever before to pr help prevent homelessness and to assist people who are experiencing homelessness. Just yesterday, we approved the budgets for the coming year for the city's general fund and the San Diego Housing Commission. Uh, 
They reflect a robust plan to address homelessness in our city. Total citywide spending on homelessness approaches $200 million. The total spending figure includes millions for emergency shelter, non-congregate shelter for families, non-congregate shelter for seniors, women's shelter, youth shelter, LGBTQ shelter, winter weather shelter, and harm reduction shelter. It includes millions for our safe parking program and millions for our new safe sleeping program, which will provide outdoor spaces for unsheltered individuals who don't want to go into an indoor shelter. It includes millions for permanent supportive housing and income restricted affordable housing. It includes millions for outreach by nonprofit social services workers, for our homelessness response center, for the Neil Good Day Center, and for our storage centers to protect the property of people experiencing homelessness. It also includes millions in homelessness prevention programs, including the Housing Instability Prevention Program, Eviction Prevention Program, Rapid Rehousing Programs, Family Reunification Program, and federal voucher support. All told, we are spending nearly $200 million to support people experiencing or at risk of homelessness and help them get the housing and services that they need. Here's the bottom line. Our city can do both. We can work to help people get on their feet, and we can have reasonable regulations on the use and location of encampments. To begin our presentation, I would like to introduce policy advisor Bridget Naso, who has worked tirelessly to incorporate all the input we have received during the process of bringing this item forward. Bridget, thank you, and please proceed. Thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the City Council. I'm Bridget Naso, policy advisor to Council Member Stephen Whitburn, along with community representative Emily Bonner, and I'm joined by Deputy City Attorney Heather Ferbert, Director of Policy for the Mayor's Office, Jessica Lawrence, Environmental Services Department Director, Renee Robertson, who will be presenting information about how the ordinance will improve the abatement process, the Director of Homeless Strategies and Solutions, Sarah Jarman, who will present the Outreach and Education Plan as part of the citywide implementation of the ordinance, Commanding Officer, Neighborhood Policing, Captain Sean Takeuchi with the San Diego Police Department, who will be presenting the citywide enforcement plan of the ordinance, we also have additional city staff, including from the San Diego Fire Rescue Department, Chief Nislight, Chief of the San Diego Police Department, staff with the Parks and Recreation Department, and also the Planning Department, who will be available to answer questions. We will need approximately 30 minutes for this presentation. This item was heard at the April 13th Land Use and Housing Committee meeting and forwarded to the full council, and at that time, members of the committee made a motion that when the proposed unauthorized camping ordinance came to the full council, it would include a companion informational item that briefs the council on elements, including the city's comprehensive shelter plan, the identification of safe sleeping sites, program funding, an outreach and enforcement plan, the status of the community action plan on homelessness, and also a written legal analysis from the city attorney on the proposed ordinance, in addition that this plan also include all city parks. This is what we are providing here today with this item and the previous companion item. The city of San Diego has helped tens of thousands of people get back on their feet in the last year alone and will spend, as you heard, more than $200 million on homeless shelters, programs, services, and prevention in 2024 including the newly added safe sleeping sites. This in addition to millions spent on housing programs. Today's action goes hand in hand with the city's growing investment in innovative solutions for people facing homelessness. Today we're introducing an ordinance to make amendments to the San Diego Municipal Code related to unauthorized camping or encampments on public property. This ordinance will amend the Municipal Code to prohibit unauthorized camping on public property and establish a process for the city to abate encampment, encampments. The municipal code related to camping and parks was first established 100 years ago in 1913. The code has been updated three times since then, but those updates did not foresee and therefore did not address the public health risks from encampments, which have expanded into areas of the city that are not set up for camping. These amendments to the municipal code will address those serious public health and safety concerns. 
This ordinance at its core is about the protection of public health and safety for all San Diegans on public land citywide. The health and safety risks resulting from unregulated human activity when people set up tents and encampments to stay overnight in public areas include, but are not limited to, disease, risk of bodily harm, bacterial infection, burn injury, fire danger, potential drowning, pedestrian crossing danger or injury or death because of a car crash, and drug exposure and overdose risk. Therefore, this ordinance recommends amendments and additions to the San Diego Municipal Code to protect the life, public health, and safety of all who live in the city, recognizing that certain public lands within the geographical boundaries of the city pose significant health and safety hazards to people who make shelter or stay overnight in these areas. In addition, some of these public lands are environmentally sensitive and may be significantly damaged by unregulated human activity. These amendments to the Municipal Code are also consistent with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision in Martin versus the City of Boise and the settlement agreements related to the City of San Diego's response to homelessness. The language and abatement process in the ordinance is compliant with the 2007 Spencer Settlement and the 2011 Isaiah Settlement. This action today would codify these settlements. The City of San Diego is committed to treating the rights of individuals who cannot obtain shelter in their personal property with respect and consideration. The proposed ordinance establishes that it's unlawful for any person to camp in or upon any public property if shelter beds are available, unless specifically authorized by the city manager. It would make it unlawful at any time, regardless of the availability of shelter beds for any person to camp or have unauthorized encampments in the following locations. One, within two blocks of an elementary, middle, or high school citywide. The intention is to reduce the risk of exposure to incidents which can impact students' emotional and mental well-being, such as exposure to illicit drugs, unintentional indecent exposure, or violent behavior. Many students in highly impacted areas are forced to walk around encampments into the street to get to school. Performance and analytics reports show that from August of 2022 to January of 2023, there were nearly 1,400 reports of encampments within a tenth of a mile of a school. And according to the San Diego Unified School District Police Department, more than 100 tents or encampments have been reported on school property. Two, within two blocks of any shelter citywide, provided signs are posted prohibiting camping that are clearly visible to pedestrians. This is to reduce the adverse impacts of camping around homeless shelters, where residents who are most vulnerable are receiving services to re resolve their homelessness. Some of those impacts include exposure to predatory behavior of drug dealing, which can undermine the community effort to provide long-term solutions to the homelessness issues. There were more than 1,600 reports of encampments near shelters during the same six-month period as previously stated, according to the Department of Performance and Analytics. Three, in any open space or waterway citywide as defined in the ordinance as the portions of Choice Creek, Los Penasquitos Creek, San Diego River, the San Diego River, and the Tijuana River found within the boundaries of the city or the banks of the waterway. The ordinance will restrict unregulated human activity in these areas, which will reduce wildfire risk, pollution, and unsanitary conditions. Four, within any, within any transit hub, on any trolley platform or along any trolley track citywide. Provided signs are posted prohibiting camping that are clearly visible to pedestrians. This is to protect the unsheltered individuals in these areas using public transportation, also people on public transportation and transit hubs from risks associated with the high volume of traffic and the speeds of the trolley. And five, in any city park, Citywide provided signs are posted prohibiting camping that are clearly visible to pedestrians. The ordinance will reduce the risk of exposure to incidents which can impact park staff, visitors, and families' emotional and mental well being from being exposed to illicit drugs, unintentional and decent exposure, violent behavior, and or possible assault. It will also reduce fire danger, pollution, and protect environmentally sensitive areas. This is required by federal law. 
In addition, it will protect historical landmarks and areas of cultural significance. Some parks have millions of visitors each year, which can impact the flow of pedestrian traffic and walkways. There were more than 4,300 reports of encampments in or near parks during the six month period from August of 2022 to January of 2023, according to the Department of Performance and Analytics. The ordinance will also always make it unlawful at all times if there's an immediate threat or risk of harm to a person, public health and safety, or a disruption of government services. It is the city's obligation to protect public health and safety and natural resources by maintaining clean, safe, and accessible city properties for all residents. But despite the city's effort through the Clean SD program, there are thousands of reports about the impacts of unauthorized camping on public property made by residents every month through the Get It Done app, council offices, ESD, and law enforcement. From August of 2022 through February of 2023, there were more than 16,000 reports of encampments. The Environmental Services Department has provided a list of some of the items that are commonly found in encampments, and they include, but are not limited to, fuel and propane tanks, weapons, food infested with bugs, drugs or drug paraphernalia, needles, bottles or jars of urine, and bags of human waste or feces. Taking a closer look at public health, over the last 12 years, San Diego County has experienced three deadly public health crises, including the February 2017 hepatitis A outbreak, which began in the unsheltered population. It became the largest hepatitis A outbreak and epidemic in the U.S. in more than 20 years, claiming 20 lives alone in San Diego. There is also a new hepatitis A outbreak with dozens of cases currently in the homeless population here in San Diego. Recently, a new public health threat has health threat has emerged in San Diego and across the U.S. It is the arrival of the illicit fentanyl. Fentanyl overdose deaths in San Diego in 2021 were nearly double that of 2020, claiming the lives of 817 people. The latest numbers from the San Diego County Medical Examiner show in 2021, more than 300 unsheltered individuals died from accidental drug exposure. In addition to public health risks, there are also risks to the environment. San Diego is ranked in the range of a very high hazard for fire danger, according to the organization Ready San Diego. Two of the largest wildfires in the last 20 years were here in San Diego. The two largest wildfires in the state in recent years have been massive. The 2020 August Complex fire burned more than a million acres, and the 2021 Dixie fire burned nearly a million acres. Data from San Diego Fire Rescue Computer Aided Dispatch System show there were 431 likely homeless related vegetation fires in 2022, a more than 200% increase over 2018, when data shows that fire crews responded to 128 such fires. Fire crews also responded to 379 suspected rubbish fires in the city's more urban environments in 2022. Also in 2022, 5% of suspected encampment vegetation fires were elevated to a first alarm fire, which requires a much larger fire department response, including multiple fire vehicles, personnel, and helicopters. Another concern is that encampments negatively impact sensitive habitat in environments. During the San Diego River Park Foundation's October 2022 count, approximately 230 encampments were found along the San Diego River. The San Diego River Park Foundation mapped and collected more than 100,000 pounds of trash during a 10-day collection period in October of 2022. Nearly 70% of the trash collected was related to unauthorized encampments. Now we'll hear from Environmental Services Department Director Renee Robertson, who will be presenting information about the changes to the Municipal Code in the proposed ordinance related to the abatement process. Renee. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Renee Robertson, the Director of the Environmental Services Department. ESD is a mission-driven department that assists with many different aspects of solid waste management across the city. Due to the environmental impact associated with encampments, ESD deploys cleanup and abatement, sidewalk sanitizing and hazardous waste removal, as well as a new hotspots program that removes waste from around active encampments. 
The goal of each of these programs is to protect the environment and the health and safety of all in our community, including unsheltered individuals living in potentially unsanitary conditions. The proposed amendments accomplish many important goals for ESD. First, by incorporating abatement procedures into the municipal code, it provides opportunity for public input, codifies our commitment to a consistent approach to environmental and public health protection, and provides transparency that did not exist without this ordinance. Additionally, after years of field experience performing cleanups, ESD identified the benefit of a citywide noticing requirement that allows for the efficient use of existing city resources to ensure street sweeping, sanitizing, repair and maintenance of street lights and other important infrastructure can occur directly following abatement. As the draft municipal code details, the ordinance will update the noticing requirement to 24 hours and allow any appropriate classification of city employee, such as a park ranger, to post a notice. The code adopts specific definitions and terms and allows for the donation and recycling of any impounded items. Most importantly, the code includes clear rules that do not require an employee to handle abandoned items when used hypodermic needles or other significant safety issues are present. The intent of the proposed language is to comply, comply with the existing Isaiah settlement, as well as other important strategies the city has adopted to ensure unsheltered individuals are treated with dignity. This includes consistent outreach in heavily impacted areas, as, as well as coordinated outreach events. The new 24-hour noticing before cleanups will be heavily educated by ESD, HSSD, and NPD prior to implementation. ESD will continue to document the abatement process and impound personal belongings. When we are contacted about belongings, which is infrequently, we will drive the items back to the individual. Storage facilities remain available to store important or sentimental belongings. ESD will also be participating in important training courses with HSSD and the Office of Race and Equity around trauma-informed practices and racial justice. The proposed ordinance will ensure that abatement does not negatively impact the effectiveness of outreach, but does achieve protection of the environment and public health. And now I'll pass the presentation over to Sarah Jarman. Thank you, Renee. I know you all have heard a lot from me today, but I wanted to touch just briefly again on our coordinated street outreach program. The city has several types of street-based outreach teams operating on a daily basis all throughout the city. In total, there are 52 and a half full-time outreach workers made up of staff from several local service providers. The teams meet individuals experiencing homelessness where they are at and provide access to resources that best meet the individual needs of each client that they interact with. Through persistent engagement, outreach teams work to build trust and rapport with individuals experiencing homelessness, providing them with supportive services one step at a time, with the ultimate goal of helping them find placement into shelter and long-term housing. In this fiscal year, outreach teams have provided over 30,000 instances of service, including 9,200 instances of basic needs assistance and over 1,000 instances of housing assistance. I'd like to now pass it to Captain Takeuchi. Hello, Council President Elo Rivera, Council President Pro Temp Montgomery Step, and esteemed council members. My name is Sean Takeuchi, and I'm the captain over the Neighborhood Policing Division of the Police Department. I'm here to present to all of you an overview of how the department will be enforcing the proposed ordinance. The Neighborhood Policing Division was created in 2018, and our mission is to enhance the quality of life and safety in San Diego neighborhoods in a manner that is compassionate, professional, and fair to all by effectively responding to community concerns while all also ensuring equal rights and treatment for all San Diegans. The officers assigned to the Neighborhood Policing Division understand that they play a role in getting person out of homelessness into a shelter or alternate housing solution. The division is comprised of police officers who utilize a progressive enforcement model to provide a consistent approach that is compassionate yet firm. We also have 10 personnel assigned to the homeless outreach team. Their mission is to establish trust and connect people to shelter. Trust is established by creating relationships and offering services such as benefits available through the county's Health and Human Services Agency and offering medical services through county nurses or other community organizations. The police officers assigned to the division were responsible for over 700 placements in calendar year 2022, which occurred through the San Diego Housing Commission's coordinated intake system. 
Also, SDPD officers utilized the McAllister Institute's Recovery in Bridge Center, formerly known as the Inebriate Sobering Services and the PLEADS program. The Recovery in Bridge Center allows for an alternative to the criminal justice system for people who are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. The police department works closely with the Homelessness Strategies and Solutions Department to address concerns regarding homelessness. We will continue working collaboratively to implement this ordinance if it is passed by this council. We will be looking at the entire city of San Diego and will first identify schools and parks which are impacted by encampments. In order to assist us in identifying these locations, we will be reaching out to all the council district offices for input. We will be soliciting input directly from the community and we will also be examining get it done requests that have been submitted concerning schools and parks. The planning and analytics department has been a great partner in helping us identify locations which need outreach and possible enforcement. As previously stated, the police department and HSSD will be working closely to successfully implement the plan. We will maintain our strong relationship to ensure proper coordination. We are committed to leading with outreach first at the schools and parks that have been identified. HSSD will first ask their non-law enforcement outreach groups to go to the identified locations in order to connect with unhoused people. Once those outreach groups feel they have maximized their efforts and can no longer connect people to shelter or services, the groups will let HSSD know and the outreach groups will move to the next locations. The police department will then send an enforcement team to the first location and begin utilizing the progressive enforcement model. Once we are able to connect people to shelter or remove the encampments in the area, we will coordinate with our partners such as the San Diego Unified School District Police Department, park rangers, and patrol officers at the divisions to ensure encampments do not return to the area. We will utilize education and enforcement to stop an encampment from being reestablished. MPD will also continue to coordinate daily with the Environmental Services Department to ensure the health and safety of the community. The department will train all personnel on this ordinance through a department training bulletin. The training bulletin will address the purpose of the ordinance. It will provide definitions and state the ordinance so that police officers understand it. In order to give unhoused individuals every opportunity to connect with a shelter and to minimize confusion, we will use a progressive enforcement model for this ordinance. All of the, all of the steps will be articulated in the training bulletin. There will be three steps for enforcement. The first step will be an offer of a shelter bed and education of the ordinance. Step two will be an offer of a shelter bed and issuance of a misdemeanor citation. Step three will be an offer of a shelter bed and physical arrest of the person. A shelter bed will be offered at each step. All goal, our goal is for every person to say yes to an offer of shelter. MPD will utilize the existing coordinated intake process as well as having a direct line to 20th Street and B Street for individuals who accept shelter. The process of contacting a shelter location to verify vacancy and transporting people to the shelter will also be outlined in the training bulletin. Lastly, we will be working closely with the criminal division of the city attorney's office to ensure all of the citations and arrest information is forwarded appropriately. The police department wants to ensure all of the needed information is captured and any deficiencies are identified and so they are corrected without delay. We are committed to providing the city attorney's office all the information they need to thoroughly evaluate cases. We recognize African American, Latino, and indigenous communities are affected by homelessness at a disproportionate rate. San Diego police officers utilize non-bias based policing practices and are expected to adhere to <laughs> department policy. All right, folks, um, that's the first warning for disruptions. Thank you. Additionally, the department is committed to ongoing training related to biases, in, including implicit, overt, and bias by proxy, and all members are expected to understand their negative impacts on policing. As part of this commitment, the department will be working with the Department of Race and Equity to en enhance our non-bias-based training for department employees. Chief Neslight has committed to participating in the Department of Race and Equity's Social Justice Academy. The goal of the program is to reduce implicit, explicit racial bias and to enhance an officer's ability to de-escalate a situation. Last slide. 
We will be using this ordinance as a tool to encourage individuals to accept the offer of a shelter bed or alternate solution to maintaining an encampment in public. MPD officers recognize the reemergence of communicable diseases such as hepatitis A and Shigella, along with the use of illicit substances and unstable mental health conditions are causing harm to not only unhoused people, but to the community surrounding encampments. Our goal is to reduce harm and to make the community safer. N NPD is also committed to commu continue, continuing our support of ESD in their abatement efforts. I'll turn it back over to Bridget. Thank you, Captain Takeuchi. District, District 3 office staff and the mayor's office staff have attended more than 100 community meetings citywide to provide information and engage with the public about the unauthorized encampment ordinance and safe sleeping sites. At these meetings, community representatives received wide support from constituents, and these are just some of the meetings here on the screen, as you can see. The high risk to public health and safety posed by encampments has been made clear to our office by the communities we serve, from fires that pose serious threat to homes and lives, to parents who are worried about their children's safety who are forced to walk into the streets to avoid encampments on the way to school. We have also heard from seniors and disabled individuals who are unable to navigate the sidewalks with their wheelchairs due to encampments blocking their path. On the screen is the action that we're asking you to take today. And the final version would, of course, be subject to legal review by the city attorney's office. These amendments outline a clear set of rules for the use of tents and encampments on public land. It will be a critical step to reduce the risk of public health and safety citywide, as the unsafe status quo is inhumane for people who are unsheltered and for other residents. I would now like to introduce Mayor Todd Gloria, who has some closing comments. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Naso, and my appreciation to Councilmember Whitburn for bringing this item before the City Council. To my colleagues in closing, the item before you today is the opportunity to take action on what we all know is our city's top uh, issue. Each of you see it. Each of you have contacted me with concerns about encampments on the sidewalks and streets in the canyons and the parks in your districts. Each of you hear about this from your constituents on a daily basis, and I do too. We're here today because I want to emphasize that the unsafe camping ordinance is not a standalone solution. In fact, it comes after we have collectively worked together to expand shelter capacity by 70 percent, after we have uh, adopted or introduced the comprehensive strategy that you just heard in the previous item, after we've diversified our shelter offerings to be more inclusive with lower barriers, created more safe parking lots across our city and expanded their hours of operation, we proposed and you voted yesterday to fund a safe sleeping program that can be uh, in place by J July the 1st. After we've doubled street outreach across the city, passed numerous pro-housing policies to build what we know ends homelessness, more housing. When the taxpayers of this community are spending over $200 million to provide shelter beds, outreach, and other homeless services, I believe that it is reasonable, appropriate, to ask that sidewalks are passable, that children are not forced to walk in the middle of the street to go to school, that public parks are safe and accessible and free from drug paraphernalia and needles, and that canyons do not pose a constant threat of wildfire. I think this is a reasonable and appropriate expectation from the taxpayers of this city, and it's why I'm asking you to pass the unsafe camping ordinance today. I also want to be clear that we will have a place for people experiencing homeless to go, homelessness to go. That was outlined in the previous item that you just heard. And it includes, again, the safe uh, camping sites that we will have stood up by July 1st. This is part and parcel of why this ordinance is, again, worthy of your support. Third, this does not mean that we are turning a blind eye to the challenges faced by people experiencing homelessness. Quite the opposite. On the contrary, I believe this should be seen as an opportunity to provide comprehensive assistance and support to people who experience homelessness. Again, it is far safer, far better, and far closer to getting people connected to housing and services when they're in our shelter system. Again, a reason for you to vote yes today. Fourth, and perhaps most important, the, most, the recent point in time count data demonstrate that the city of San Diego is doing the vast majority of the heavy lifting in this county when it comes to providing homeless shelter services. If you are homeless in San Diego County and you want help, you are likely coming to the city of San Diego. That is not right. And as I have said, the other 17 cities in our region must step it up. 
The city of San Diego cannot and will not shoulder the burden of the entirety of our homelessness crisis in this region. When other mayors proudly go on national news proclaiming that they have ended homelessness by shipping their homeless to our city, while those other cities are passing ordinances dissimilar to this one, these again are reasons why this unsafe camping ordinance is worthy of your support. And lastly, it was all with this in mind that I submit to you that the unsafe camping ordinance represents an important step towards ensuring the safety and well-being and prosperity of our communities. It is a necessary step that strikes an appropriate balance between the needs of our homeless population and the well-being of all of our city's residents. It allows us to prioritize public health and safety, preserve the intention and integrity of public spaces, and allows us to work towards getting more people experiencing homelessness off of our streets and into permanent housing. Ultimately, members, this ordinance is a call to action, a call to protect our public spaces, and a call to uphold the principles of compassion, fairness, and individual responsibility. Today, I'm respectfully asking all of you, as a city council, to answer that call for action. Council President, this concludes our presentation, and I respectfully ask for your yes vote on the unsafe camping ordinance. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Gloria. Uh, we will now turn to the Independent Budget Analyst's Office for comments. Thank you, Council President and members of the City Council. Amy Lee with the IBE's office again. Our office released our report on June 8th, analyzing the potential fiscal, operational, and policy impacts of the proposed unauthorized camping ordinance, as well as providing some additional context from how other cities have approached similar ordinances and key policy considerations for the Council. Before I begin, I would like to note that the impacts of this ordinance are difficult to determine. We are asked to toggle between two different scenarios, one in which impacts are limited because shelter availability is scarce and only sensitive areas are enforced, and another where impacts are significant because shelter is widely available and encampments would be essentially prohibited across the city. Which scenario we are in not only, is not only depends on new shelter space, such as safe sleeping coming online, but also the degree of proactive enforcement planned. But at the same time, under current law and practice, violations for unauthorized encroachment under the city municipal code can be broadly enforced. Does an individual have personal belongings on public property or the public right of way? If yes, then progressive enforcement applies, regardless of shelter availability in most cases. In 2022, MPD issued 1,240 citations and made 66 arrests for encroachment alone. There are other existing city and state laws that also might be relevant, for instance, illegal lodging under the state penal code. The proposed ordinance would tack on an additional charge on top of encroachment and other violations for an authorized camping when there is an encampment or camp paraphernalia on all public property when there is shelter available, and then at sensitive areas at all times regardless of shelter availability. Um, the presentation did a good job summarizing the main changes with the proposed ordinance. I think I would just highlight three main things that we expect this ordinance to do. First, it provides clarity and definitions for an authorized camping and the abatement process. Regarding clarity, based off of our conversations, MPD hopes that the proposed ordinance will result in more prosecution of cases because violations of the ordinance will be clear cut than, say, compared to encroachment. Second is it codifies legal settlements and case laws, especially related to the abatement process. And then third, it identifies sensitive areas where an authorized camping would be prohibited at all times. The fiscal and operational costs remain largely unclear, and we suggest the council closely monitor the implementation of the ordinance. The police department recently indicated using a reactive and proactive approach to enforce within existing resources. But any unanticipated costs associated with proactive enforcement, which would be new, are, un un are unknown at this time. ESD stated that they can absorb costs and anticipate operational efficiencies moving to a 24-hour noticing period. The city attorney's office would likely see some increased workload due to reviewing cases for an additional charge of unauthorized camping, especially if cases, more cases are prosecuted under the new ordinance. We estimate the cost of signage would be less than $400,000 one time for printing with likely absorbable labor costs for posting signs. And then lastly, new safe sleeping sites would cost upwards of $1 million to $13.5 million annually with additional costs for new shelter facilities. 
I want to highlight a few policy considerations for the council. These are just questions to have in mind during this discussion. For instance, how will the ordinance affect the city's existing shelter system and support services given increases in unsheltered homelessness based off of the recent point in time count and HSSD's plan to replace a significant share of shelter beds? Will the proposed ordinance increase pressure to add more shelter space and how will the city prepare for this? Are there other alternative approaches to address encampments, for instance, using diversion programs and pathways, homelessness outreach, and more targeted encampment resolution services? Which locations should be considered under sensitive areas since the city needs to be able to clearly articulate public safety and health concerns where the ordinance is enforced at all times? How might the ordinance affect regional or statewide dynamics? Will more nearby cities pass similar ordinances such as Poway is currently considering? What does it mean if San Diego is the only big city in California without such a policy in place? Lastly, and we believe this question is critical to the conversation, will the ordinance have the intended behavior change to get shelter resistant individuals into shelter? To the extent that the tools currently available to NPD to enforce and threaten arrest for encroachment are not effective enough to compel individuals to enter into shelter, it remains unclear how an additional charge of an authorized camping would change this outcome. Ultimately, we again recommend the council closely monitor the outcomes throughout implementation, as well as the fiscal and policy impacts of this ordinance, including regularly requesting information to assess the effectiveness of the ordinance. That concludes my comments, but happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. We will now turn to the city attorney's office for comments. Thank you, council president. Our attorneys work closely with staff on this ordinance to address compliance with state and federal laws. We have also provided legal guidance in a public memorandum that's included in the backup materials for this item. Under local and state law, the council can make minor non-substantive changes to the draft ordinance at today's meeting if those changes are within the scope of the public notice for this item and no further legal or staff work is needed. More complicated changes to the draft ordinance may mean that the item needs to be returned to staff for further review and editing. In that case, the council would not vote on this ordinance today. It would instead be introduced at a future council meeting after appropriate public notice. That concludes my opening remarks. Thank you so much. All right, with that, uh, Ms. Fuentes, let's proceed with public comment, please. Thank you, Council President. We will be starting with one virtual speaker, Ilka, as a requested accommodation. If you can please unmute yourself, you'll have one minute. If you can please unmute. Ilka? There should be a pop-up coming up saying to unmute. This is your opportunity for the accommodation requested previously. We will have to come back to you as you are not unmuting. We will begin with all of those that are here participating in person. As noted previously, we have about 230 speakers who have submitted speaker slips here in person. Starting with the following, we also have five seats available in the front row for people to come up and sit so that we can have an even flow. So I'd ask the following individuals to please come up to the front row. Lori Johnson, Kat Tessero, Hostina Kaufman, Isaac Navarro, and Melinda Forstai. We'll start with Lori, Lori Johnson up at the microphone. You'll have one minute. Hello. My name is Lori Johnson. I'm a volunteer with Planned Parenthood and a resident of downtown San Diego. I'm here to oppose the suggested encampment ban being brought forward today. I would like to remind council members and Mayor Gloria of the Community Action Plan on Homelessness that the council had already approved in 2019. In 2021, it was revised by Matthew Doherty, a homeless consultant. The plan humanizes, not criminalizes, unhoused people and would dramatically reduce homelessness. On July 1st, 2021, Mayor Gloria released the comprehensive report by Matthew Doherty and stated, his analysis is already guiding our administration's new approach on homelessness and helps ensure we are set up for success to achieve our ultimate goal, 
ending chronic homelessness in San Diego. Where is the report of actions taken or progress made since 2021, I ask you? Where's the accountability Thank for that? Thank you for your comments and your concluding statement. Kat Tessaro? Tessaro, my apologies. Sorry, it's Tessaro. Hi, my name is Kat, I'm with Planned Parenthood, and today I'm here to oppose the ordinance. Uh, this ordinance makes it illegal for some to exist in certain areas of high visibility, but have you ever stopped to ask yourself why they're in those areas of high visibility? It's for their safety, it's so they can get to needed services. They're not trying <laughs> to be in your way. Um, and I've heard a lot of numbers today, but I wanna remind you that these are people, they're not numbers. And this could be one of your loved ones. My partner's 60 something year old aunt spent years on the street and criminalizing her didn't help and it doesn't help anyone. I implore you to invest in effective housing for solutions, not criminalizing folks who just want to exist. This ban is for certain areas, but what happens in the future? What other areas will you force them out of? when there isn't more permanent housing available. Let's not pretend this is anything other than what it is. You don't wanna see unhoused people because you feel bad and you should feel bad because we are failing our community. We must invest in our communities. These people you ignore, walk over and criminalize, they are part of our communities and it's time we start acting like it. Thank you, Hostina Kaufman. Hostina Kaufman after her, it's gonna be Isaac Navarro, Melinda Forstai, Paul Downey and Aaron Grassi. Hostina, are you in chambers? We'll come back to you, Isaac Navarro. Please begin. May I start? Yes, please uh, begin. Greetings, my name is Isaac Navarro. I am Vice President of Montgomery High School, ASB. I am here to discuss something that's extremely important to me. Homelessness can affect anybody, regardless of background. Removing homeless San Diego residents access to nearly every area within the city could have significant implications. Adequate shelter is a fundamental human right, and this action does not provide a particular solution to that issue at hand. The approach of taking away people's freedom through incarceration is not a practical way of upholding the values of liberty in our nation. This is not an American way of handling things. We have certain rights here in America, it's evident that addressing homelessness, the homelessness crisis in San Diego has proven to be challenging due to inefficiency, inefficient resources, ineffective coordination, and a lack of accountability. Thank you for making me, thank you for allowing me to address you. Thank you. Melinda Forsey? Forsey? Good afternoon. My name is Melinda Forsey, and I'm the COO of Serving Seniors. As many of you know, we serve the most vulnerable seniors, and we cannot support this amendment as it does not sufficiently address the needs of older adults. A quarter of the seniors we serve at the Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center, right on 4th and Beach, are currently experiencing homelessness. Many choose to avoid shelters due to safety concerns, mobility issues, and a lack of age-friendly resources. Currently, 20 of our seniors sleep outside our center every night. This has become a safe haven for them, a community place in where they take care of each other and watch each other's backs. However, this site would be subject to encampment enforcement regardless of shelter availability and suitability. This ordinance will also restrict access to this site and also hinder their ability to access the resources we currently provide, including Thank meals and comments, housing connection resources. If you have additional Thank comments, you. you can send, give them to my deputy director. Next is Paul Downey and behind him in the front row should be Aaron, Ted Womack, Sulema Guardado, and Patrick Rowland. You have one minute, sir, please proceed. Thank you, Paul Downey, President and CEO of Serving Seniors, as uh, our COO noted. We cannot support the ordinance at this time. Simply put, we're putting the cart before the horse. We're enforcing without adequate shelter. We heard a two and a half hour discussion that we're not meeting needs today. And we have a strategy, a good one. I was very impressed with what I heard, but it is a strategy. There's also a significant lack of services for older adults. The report itself notes that we need 548 additional beds. Of, of shelter for seniors that we don't have. Serving seniors in collaboration with the city is running seniors landing, and we have space for about 35 to 40 folks. We also need to implement the uh, 
what was done by the Regional Task Force on Homelessness through our continuum of care, a comprehensive set of recommendations on existing shelters to make them age friendly. It's only indirectly referenced in the report. It Thank needs to be integral Thank to everything that we do. Thank you for your closing comments. Aaron, you have time ceded to you by Michelle Soleri. If you can please raise your hand. And Kelly Ports, please raise your hand. Thank you, you'll have three minutes. Um, sorry, City Clerk, do you have the... Yes, George is setting up the PowerPoint right now. Thank you so much. And it's been distributed to the council. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. Aaron Sermoto Grassi, policy director at Alliance San Diego. I'm here in opposition to the encampment ban ordinance. The encampment ban is a superficial solution to a much deeper problem. It will do nothing to create the real change that is needed to ensure that every San Diegan has a home. We urge city council to instead update and fully implement the community action plan on homelessness. Mayor Gloria and Councilmember Whitburn's ban fails to take into account the impact the policy will have on vulnerable San Diegans, including the seniors that were just mentioned. This also includes, as you look to the screen, 11,000 homeless students in the city and their families. These students are spread across all council districts. Nor does this ban take into account other vulnerable San Diegans, including immigrants and asylum seekers, seniors, individuals, individuals with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, people of color, and others. Any policy on homelessness must include an impact study on how the proposal will impact vulnerable groups, and this clearly fails to do so. Further, the ban is reactive, not proactive, and uses the same enforcement first strategy that has failed for the last decade. Enforcement first goes against the city's community action plan on homelessness, which was passed unanimously in 2019 after being developed by one of the lead agencies on homelessness and housing. The community action plan, which the ban goes against, includes short-term and long-term strategies to reduce homelessness. It is currently being updated. And so the question we should be asking is why is the mayor and council member Whitburn attempting to move an ordinance forward before the revised plan comes back? Especially when tax dollars are being used to update it. It's time for the council to be proactive instead of reactive and to protect the human right to housing rather than violate it. We urge this council to oppose the ban and to instead go back to the action plan that you have and commit fully to implementing it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ted Womack. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Ted Womack. I'm with Alliance San Diego. Uh, a lot of great things were said today. I just wanted to point out and see if you recognize how many times you all contradict yourselves. Uh, originally, you said this ban is supposed to help students so they don't have to see people while they're on the sidewalks, but yet you want to open up libraries and areas near schools and bringing them right back to the thing that you want to say you avoid. Uh, also, you all said that you want to have police uh, do the contact for this and do the enforcement of this, but we have many officers who are saying they are understaffed. I've even been asked to apply for the police department. They're understaffed. So if they're understaffed, how can you write in for them to have to enforce this? That literally makes no sense. Um, and then at the end of the day, when you look at the grand scheme of things, nobody has had a conversation about affordable housing for all income levels. Uh, at the it, like That doesn't make sense. Yes, shelters are uh, temporary solutions for emergencies and things like that, but at the end of the day, people want to be in homes. A lot of folks are upset with folks experiencing homelessness because they say they make bad decisions and don't make the right judgment. But we're Thank not. You for your comments. We're not your looking at the mayor concluded. to try to possibly arrest the mayor Sir, for not please, making good respectful decisions. Respectful of having everyone's bad time, if you can please. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Zulema Guardado. Behind her in the front row should be Patrick Roland, Harold Dimois, Mandy Lean, Lynn, and Stella Lynn. Zulema, are you here? Zulema had to leave. Okay, Patrick Roland. Hello, council members. My name is Patrick Roland, and I represent the San Diego Homeless Union and California Poor People Campaign for the chapter of San Diego. My, my concern is, you know, the situation is, you know, moving these people from one place to another. When we got crime, we got drugs, we got everything else in our position. Just two days ago, I witnessed, or on the first, second of this month, I witnessed 
an actual murder. I saw the whole thing. They locked us in our apartments, in our housings. They moved the people that were out there, that were homeless, across the street, put ropes up, told them that they can't come in or out until after this investigation over. I missed a day's work because of that. But when I got back from work the next day, we were still locked out of our compound. I worked a 12-hour shift. When are they going to do something? When are they going to find the right places to put these people, to house these people? I was out on these streets for 21 years, and it was people like Pat. Thank you for your comments the and that concluding statement. Get it done. Statement. Do it right. Thank you for that concluding statement. Harold Imas? Uh, my name is Harold DeMoss. I am 55 years of age. I'm a high school dropout. Um, I've been back and forth across this country. I've lived in multiple states, and I've been homeless. Um, the last time I spoke at a city council was down in Chula Vista. And around that same time, my brother back east was talking at a city council about his right to bear arms. I don't carry a gun. I went to jail because I was asking for help. I got arrested at NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, because the security guard thinks he's a cop. I made a mistake, and I brandished a knife in front of a room full of witnesses. I also put that knife away. Once I put that knife away, the, I was de-escalated. I was attacked by two individuals, and I went to jail. I got raped by police in a system that's broken. Our taxpaying dollars pays your salaries, yet you people do not listen to the people who pay your okay. salaries. Thank you for your comments. Next is Mandy Lynn and Stella Lynn, and behind them in the front row should be Ellis Rose, Hannah Moreau, and Marilyn Wantanabe. Mandy, you have time ceded to you by Samantha Baker. Please raise your hand. Thank you, and Megan Carroll. Thank you. You'll have three minutes. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Mandy Lean, and some of you know me from maybe a press conference. Um, I have a petition of over a thousand people that are against this ordinance. Um, this ordinance is performative at best. Um, this is to make the mayor look like he's doing something because he has failed miserably at his job and his promise to solve homelessness. So now he's jumping on the train like every other Democrat to criminalize people and displace them into places because wealthy people don't want to see them. So what Todd has done instead of helping people is he has created a narrative to dehumanize, to villainize, and to make these people hated by the rest of their community. And it's disgusting. Whitburn, last year you said you were going to do um, safe camping sites. Where are they? They're still not here because you're not going to do them. It's all performative. It's election season. You guys need the votes. You need your wealthy constituents to bring this up for you so that you can look like you've done something while people are dying on the street. These are human beings. These aren't homeless vagrants. They're not all drug addicts, and even drug addicts deserve treatment, but we only have 77 detox beds in which they're detoxed, and then they're sent back out to the street where they're more vulnerable, where they can overdose, and then that takes more money from paramedics, EMTs, police, and so on and so forth. Now you want to have police do most of the interaction with unhoused people. Well, we know that that's a social justice issue, that black people are um, disproportionately affected by homelessness, and they're also disproportionately affected by police brutality, and so on and so forth. So you're gonna have cops go out and do jobs that social workers should do. It just doesn't make any sense. And every single one of you sitting up here, you're caving to the strong mayor because you need money for your districts, and it's gross, and it's disgusting. You need to house these people. You need to help these people. And let's talk about safety in schools. I don't see homeless people going in and shooting up schools. I mean, let's just be honest. My daughter was here. She goes to encampments with me all the time. And you know what people in encampments do? They ask, how's your daughter? How's she doing? Because a lot of them are parents. A lot of them have their own kids. Some of them are foster children. And they went from the foster system straight to the street. 
The system is broken, and you are allowing the mayor to blame the victims of a broken system for his failures. And it's disgusting, and it is going to cause them harm. And none of you seem to either care or realize that. This is going to make this city a pressure cooker. Thank you for your comments. As the council president noted previously, if we can do anything so that we can get through all of the speakers and be respectful of each speaker, it is a four hours of testimony. I appreciate it so much. Stella Lynn? Okay. Ellis Rose? You have time ceded to you by uh, Janika Faulkner. Please raise your hand. Thank you. And Mallory Adamaski. Thank you so much. You have three minutes. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ellis Rose. Almost all of you up there know who I am. I am a formerly homeless man, um, also a former board member of the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, former board member on the Continuum of Care, um, also a current resident of permanent supportive housing in an apartment which is rife with black mold. It's a new building, by the way. You folks help su supply that. And I am here to tell you that you folks are failing on this issue repeatedly because you and your predecessors have failed time and again. On what? Let's start with the issue of inclusion. You never practice inclusion, okay? Um, you never incorporate homeless people in the decision-making process. Um, the bridge housing sprung structure shelter tents, big failure. Um, the vehicle habitation ordinance, that was a big failure. Um, safe parking, big failure. Um, the 2019 city action plan, where actually it was not approved in October of 2019. It was accepted, but you never adopted it. It was never taken to an action stage. No one heard my issues with it. And if you listen to my issues, that plan is going to fail unless you make the correct, corrections to it. Um, you, um, oh, uh, you allowed the convention center super shelter scheme to happen. Um, a super shelter scheme which violated federal recommended guidelines from the CDC um, Anthony Fauci's NIAIH and usage, um, but allowed FEMA to direct that. Even though FEMA has no experience with homelessness in general prior to that, nor with epidemics or pandemics. And that resulted in the single largest COVID infection outbreak in a homeless shelter in the entire country. Um, these things just keep piling up. And, you know, Councilmember LaCava, I really feel that, that that statement about this is not a plan, this is a strategy was pretty glib. Um, and the reason why I say that is that plan, strategy, what it doesn't deal with, had never dealt with, I never heard one of you talk about, except for you, Ms. Montgomery Steph. And that is building trust with the people who use it. That's why people don't come in off the street. They don't trust you. They don't trust the task force. They don't trust the continuum of care. They don't trust the housing commission, okay? You repeatedly, repeatedly fail us. And so to that, I need to tell you that shelters are not housing. Shelters are not the answer. Um, that your plan is not person-centered. I'm sorry, don't use that term if you're not person-centered. It is not. You don't address the churn of the system. The system itself keeps putting people out on the street and causing homelessness. You don't address that. And you don't address the neglect, the abuse, and the incompetence throughout the system. I can't tell you how disgusting it is to witness this. I'm angry right now because eight of you know how to reach me one way or another, and none of you, none of you have consulted me. I can tell you every time that it's gonna go wrong. Your time has concluded. Thank you. Next is Hannah, Hannah Moreau. Please begin. Hello, my name is Hannah Moreau. I'm a volunteer of Planned Parenthood and ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties, and I am here in opposition of the proposed ban. You all have acknowledged we have a problem. There's a crisis on our hands. You say you're invested in ending homelessness, but to your point, Council Member LaCaba, this is a strategy, not a plan. So then, why would we move to ban encampments when we don't have the strategy fully fleshed out? Council Member Von Wilpert, uh, considering your expressed concern earlier for the safety and well-being of our in-house community, I anticipate you won't ban, vote to ban, vote to institute this ban, right? Because criminalizing homelessness does not lend itself to safety and well-being. 
Council Member Whitburn, those unhoused individuals you spoke of, uh, did you happen to ask them how the ban on the encampments would impact them or were you just using them to support your agenda? Every single person in this chamber knows this will do nothing, nothing other than solve your issue of aesthetics. If you are genuinely here to work thank for your you constituents, for institute a plan. Thank you for that closing remark. And next, we're actually going to go on the, uh, the webinar for an accommodation that was requested previously. Ilka, you'll have one minute. Please unmute yourself. Yes, um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I would be there, but I was released from the hospital yesterday. Uh, a same thing that a year ago, I was released from the hospital, which is an uncurable digestive disorder, which led me to homelessness. Uh, and no one believes I could be homeless because I know every single one of you on the board. I know you, Todd, for a decade and a half to two decades, and it's disgusting what you guys are doing to try to paint this beautiful oasis, which is not going to happen it's going to be canceled out. I'm not here to move you to say nay, because I know you all have developer money in your pocket with the exception of Monica Montgomery Steep. Um, what I am gonna encourage you to do is table this until we can move forward with a plan and actually execute this plan fairly. This is going to have such a grave impact on our medical system and none of you have taken that into account. This is gonna have such a grave impact. Ilka, on your time has community. concluded, one concluding statement. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak and accommodating me. Thank you, Ilka. We'll return to those in chamber. The people in the front row at the speaker podium should be Marilyn Wadanabe, and then behind her, Strong Stallion West, Judy Vaz, Raymond Hill, and Mitchell Woodson. Marilyn, you'll have one minute. Please proceed. My name is Marilyn Watanabe. As a resident of District 3 and the Programs and Operations Manager for Think Dignity, I have witnessed every day the blatant disregard for people experiencing homelessness through the way our city uses its limited amount of shelter beds and housing as justification to criminalize people, or how our city's decisions for solutions are often driven by the stereotypes and stigmas of homelessness rather than the countless research, data, and lived experiences from our unhoused communities or how our city strong arms people into the criminal justice system that only perpetuates homelessness and calls it compassionate and progressive enforcement. San Diego has always had and continues to invest in the infrastructure to criminalize homelessness while failing to invest in the solutions that our homeless communities has asked for and needed for years. Criminalization can never be justified as a humane response to our homelessness crisis, and there will never be alternate language to make this cruel and inhumane ban on human life and dignity acceptable. Think Dignity stands against this ordinance, and we need the community action plan, not a ban. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Strong Stallion West, you have time ceded to you by Lilian Serrano. If you can please raise your hand. Thank you. You'll have two minutes. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. My name is Strong Starling West, and I'm currently homeless and resident of San Diego. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these to homeless. Tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This is an excerpt of the new Colossus, which is on the pedestal of our Statue of Liberty. So what are you going to do? Shackle us all and put us in handcuffs? Under the recent Ninth Circuit decision, cities will not be able to arrest or punish people for sleeping on public property unless they provide adequate and relatively accessible indoor accommodations. I've heard a lot about accessibility, but I, the word relative was left out. And I, I doubt that 55 beds at 8.15 in the morning for 2,000 people meets the burden of being relative. With the homeless population more than double the number of shelter beds uh, would having to be, uh, would having to be camped outside the HRC for four to five hours before they open to be the first in line in hopes of getting a shelter bed, only to be told there are no beds, come back tomorrow, Indoor accommodations are not relatively accessible. Never having the opportunity to assess these indoor accommodations, I cannot tell you if they're adequate. 
In 2019, San Diego's uh, the Tribune reported HUD discovered ethnic disparities within San Diego's homeless population. Black people make 5.5% uh, of the San Diego County's population, but about 28% of the local homeless population. Our Democratic Mayor, Tyre Gloria, proposes out of step with Democratic Mayor London Breed of San Francisco and Democratic California Mayor Governor Gavin Newsom intentions of reparations for African Americans. Thank Mayor you for those concluding comments. Your time has expired. It's been two minutes. It has been. Next is Judy Vaz, and you have time seated by Nancy Guzman. Nancy, please raise your hand. Thank you so much. You'll have two minutes. My name is Judy Vaz. I'm the Public Affairs Manager at Planned Parenthood Action Fund of the Pacific Southwest. I'm here today because we stand firmly against the proposed amendment to the municipal codes. I learned five years ago how broken our system was when I witnessed a woman from a hospital with schizophrenia get released just to be idling in the street because there was no shelter beds available. As a resident of North Park and former resident of Hillcrest, I have seen the impacts of criminalizing unsheltered people. Every other week, I watch unhoused people leave sidewalks that are being cleared just to go to the other side of the street or in many cases to the highway overpasses. I see the faces of people who are constantly being forced to relocate, and it's always the same facial expressions, full of fear and anguish and hunger. We are criminalizing people who are already facing fierce opposition for something they cannot control. We quite literally push people off the sidewalks. The city sites dangerous such as fires and fecal matter and trash that take up space and make San Diego look less appealing to residents and tourists. The Project for Sanitation Justice, which are here today, proposed a real solution to address our lack of bathrooms, a problem often cited by people concerns with encampments, and not a single council member has included our changes to the budget memos and the budget passed yesterday. We asked for $160,000, which is cents compared to the billions in the budget. The trash reflects the lack of regard and planning and humanity we have shown our most vulnerable residents. Many of your strongest allies, including Planned Parenthood, your supporters, we are here today in opposition to what Councilmember Whitburn and the mayor brought forward. The reality is we don't have enough housing. We don't have enough housing, and we should not focus any more of our efforts or time having this conversation when we know what the reality is. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Raymond Hill. Raymond Hill, you have time ceded to you by Heath Wadanabe. Thank you so much. And that is, uh, the other is Heather, but she already spoke, so you'll have two minutes. Please begin. Yes, my name is Raymond Hill, and most of you think tents are nothing to us. That keeps our stuff safe from getting stolen. You leave it out in the open, somebody comes by, they look at it, come back later on, you're sleeping, it's gone. And there's, there's no sense to that. This is what we have to deal with, and I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Mitchell Woodson. Michelle Woodson. Mitchell Woodson. Gone. M I T C H E L L E. Michelli. Okay. Thank you so much. Next is Patricia Mandragon. Patricia Mandragon. After that, we'll call up some people, Greg Robinson, Hannah Scraper, Michael McConnell, and Bruce. Bruce, it's uh, hard to read the last name. Er Etron, miss? Are you Patricia Madragon? Yeah, you can. have time ceded to you by, if you can please raise your hand, Itzel Magna Chavez, thank you so much. Kimberly Ports, thank you so much. And Maeve Howlett. Great, you'll have four minutes, please proceed. Thank you, and thank you for everybody that seated time and sticking around to, to provide it. Um, my name is Patricia Mondragon. I'm the Regional Policy Manager for Alliance San Diego. As a lifelong San Diegan and North Park resident in District 3, I cannot express how disappointed it is, I am, to see yet another proposal to criminalize and penalize San, Diego, San Diegans for being poor. I am a single mom who faced extreme financial hardship when my partner and I separated. I had majority custody of my then eight-year-old child. Having been a stay-at-home mom, my resume and work experience were stale and my rent was going up. I had no means to pay rent 
when my ex refused to pay a dime for child support. I was scared in facing the reality that my daughter and I could no longer stay in our home. I called the city of San Diego and the county to figure out what housing solutions I could access. I was told there was a 10 year wait for low income housing. With nowhere to turn, my daughter and I moved in with my senior parents and I lived on their couch for the next three years while trying to stabilize my income. My daughter and I were lucky. We had someone to turn to. How many people in the same situation have no one and have no other option but to erect a tented home on public land? Years later, my daughter attended San Diego High. She passed people living in tents all the time. They never bothered her and in fact, she grew to have a lot of compassion for them. One day she watched San Diego Police Department and the city throwing out tents and removing un unhoused folks from in front of the old library. She yelled, homelessness is not a crime. The police officers just turned and laughed at her. Where is the compassion? We, we've seen the SDPD impound cars and leave folks without any shelter at all, including two single moms with two young boys in Pacific Beach just a few months ago. Just like its predecessor, the vehicle um, habitation ban, this proposal does nothing to fix the complex issues of homelessness and the high cost of housing. In fact, it will make finding permanent housing harder. Penalizing the homeless doesn't solve homelessness. Housing and services does. In addition, how will this plan help the over 11,000 homeless students in San Diego? San Diego doesn't need more enforcement and penalties. What we need is to update and fully implement the 2019 Community Action Plan on Homelessness, which expressly calls to reduce criminalization of persons experiencing homelessness, and calls on service providers with expertise to carry out core outreach functions rather than SDPD. I will be 55 this year, and with the rising cost of rent, I am still housing insecure. I urge the city council members to vote no on the Gloria Whitburn encampment ban and instead update and fully implement the city's community action plan on homelessness. It's all right here, 60 some pages. It's a good report. Update it, read it, implement it. One of the guiding principles says, remove politics from decision making about homelessness. Yes. Yes. You must do that. Update this community plan, it's a good one. Fully implement it, vote no on the ban. That is not a solution. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, our next speaker is Greg Robinson. Greg Robinson, you have time seated to you by Susan Orlowski, please raise your hand. Thank you, and Colleen Ditzel, thank you so much. You have three minutes, please proceed. Yeah, um, I'm Dr. Greg Robinson. I'm a sociologist at a Grossmont College. Uh, I also serve on the uh, County Board of Education. Uh, I'm here speaking as, my, uh, as an individual, though not representing my board. I recently signed on to an editorial um, in which we expressed concern about the way this current issue is being framed, many of us on boards of education. As was previously pointed out, in this county, there are over 20,000 homeless children, and in this city, over 10,000. This kind of debate is not serving to recognize that kind of need. We need policies that do. And here, what I'd wanna do is ask you to keep doing what you have been doing. As you've been said so many times, you have done everything you can to increase housing. We know the data says that the homeless problem is a housing problem. That is the issue. You know, I saw a letter signed on by many of my friends, sociologists, political scientists, and medical researchers at the med school that raised serious questions about this one. So I'm sorry, I know many of you, I have a lot of respect for many and work with you extensively. When they say that you are threatening lives with this particular ordinance, you need to listen, not really to them, but to yourselves what you have previously done around housing, and you have done exactly what is necessary. Listen to yourselves on that. Rise to 
I don't know, it's linking to your highest angels uh, in this particular situation. And do what is really most important. Serve the homeless by focusing on housing. Don't make those people sitting on the streets a victim to that. Some of this research is coming to you from medical research. So let me end with the Hippocratic Oath. It's simple. Do no harm. This will cause harm. Please don't do that. Go back to what you have done so much and so many risks have you taken to push back against NIMBYs to really fund housing. That's where we need your help. Please keep doing that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hannah and Scraper. You have time seated to you if they can please raise their hand by Zach Schlage. Thank you, Tyler Renner and Kaylee Levy. Thank you so much. You'll have four minutes. Please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Hanan Scrapper, and I'm the regional director for Path San Diego. I'm here on behalf of over 250 staff who serve over 6,000 people experiencing homelessness. Last year, we housed 855 individuals. First off, I want to commend the city for the important progress in adding both permanent supportive housing and interim housing units of various types in recent years. This isn't easy, but the city's efforts are making a difference. We know that progress has been stunted by record high inflation, rising rents and home prices, and the impacts of the pandemic. People are frustrated by the lack of visible progress. We are too, and we are concerned. However, turning to misguided, ineffective, and drastic measures is not the solution. We agree with Mayor Gloria and the council that encampments are not an acceptable way for any human being to live but an anti-camping ordinance will not lead to the outcomes we all want to see. Such an ordinance will only further disperse the problem around the city and region and make the jobs of homeless service providers like PATH much more difficult. Our team engages with people experiencing homelessness in every single day, and this work centers on building trust and relationships. It is not easy or quick to do, and enforcement, especially when it lacks coordination and communication, can upend the hard work of our team. As the co-chair of the ad hoc committee on addressing homelessness among black San Diegans, we found that black people are not able to access shelters equitably, which leads more black people remaining on the streets longer and are going to be disproportionately impacted by this ordinance. We can't end homelessness by criminalizing it. Homes, personal belongings, and important documents can be lost or misplaced. Connections can be severed, sometimes even lost for good. These disruptions can also bring fresh trauma to people who are already in a fragile and vulnerable state. All of this can, be set, can, can set back the work of our team and delay people's progress in working towards their housing goals. We really need to stick to the community action plan. As a statewide provider, we have seen the poor results of these anti-encampment laws in other communities. LA's policy, very similar to the proposal before you today, proved costly and unenforceable, especially given police staffing shortages and a lack of true housing and shelter options. Their new mayor and city council have wisely invested in a strategy where the city and service providers closely coordinate on addressing large encampments. They place participants in short-term housing, hotels and motels, while providers deliver supportive services and seek more permanent housing options. We all need to, to step up and do more. Simply telling someone where they can't sleep or camp solves nothing. When we offer true housing and services, people do accept them. We urge you to strive for something more compassionate and more meaningful than this anti-encampment ordinance. Housing and supportive services are the only proven strategy to reduce the suffering we all see every day. We aim to be constructive and thoughtful partners in this work and pledge to help you find better, more humane solutions to this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, and if I can have uh, Michael McConnell come up to the podium and the following people in the front row, uh, Bruce Itramis, uh, Keith Wolf, Josh Coyne, Esb, and Catherine Douglas. You'll have one minute, sir, please proceed. I wanna start out by reminding you what Lisa Jones from the Housing Commission said. I believe it was about 3,000 referrals to shelter could not be filled. 3,000 people asking for help currently could not find a shelter bed. They couldn't get in. It wasn't available. 
these 500 new beds aren't, isn't going to change that. We're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of folks. Secondly, there are going to be some places where folks can be. Not, not a lot, but there's going to be some. In one case, just the other day I was out, on one side of the road, um, it was a road, there was people camped on both sides. On one side, it was going to be illegal to be any time. On the other side, it wasn't. What do you think people are going to do? We're going to send police out to literally move people from one side of the road to the other. And then there'll just be more people over there. What will also happen is, because there's few, there will be fewer places for people to be, there'll be higher concentrations. As somebody who helps Thank people on the street, I'll be helping them move in. Thank you for that concluding statement, oh, sir. Your time Vivian. has expired. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Next is Bruce. Bruce Cameron. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm also a senior advocate. This that you're doing, and I here to represent AFC and Hill and Run and townspeople. It's real simple. The ban is not going to accomplish anything. You need to offer a hand instead of a damn ban, right? Because none of this is going to help anybody. And you all know better than this. Table it. There's nothing wrong with table it. You can give him a hand and figure this out. Thank you. Next is Keith Wolf. Hi, my name is Keith Wolf, and uh, I've been in San Diego off and on since I was 18 years old. Um, I've seen a lot of things here on the streets. Um, I'm a performer out here on the streets. I've been arrested several times for doing shows um, that were constitutionally protected, um, only to see come back years later to see, you know, all kinds of vendors selling things and still having my foot broken by other vendors because we're vilified all the time by the news. And that was his exact statement. He's like, "You're homeless. No one cares about you." I'm rich, look at my Versace. And I think a lot of people are looking at people's Versace in this town instead of their hearts and in their eyes and knowing that um, not everybody out here is on drugs. You know, not everybody out here is crazy, but a lot of times we're labeled that way because of the pharmaceutical industry and the money and Your the time. lobbyists, and that's what needs Your to stop. Your time has expired. Thank you for that concluding statement. Next is Josh Coyne, and in the seats behind him should be SEB, Catherine Douglas, Larry Webb, David Roger, and Deborah Morrison. You'll have one minute. Please begin. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. I'm Josh Coyne, Vice President of Policy with the Downtown San Diego Partnership, here on behalf of our over 400 members and Board of Directors in full support of the amendments before you today. Downtown neighborhoods continue to be the epicenter of the homelessness crisis. At the Land Use and Housing Committee uh, and the advocacy letter that we sent you before that committee, we asked for clarity around specific implementation of this ordinance. With staff's commitment today in the presentation to expanded non-congregate shelter options, dedicated outreach, and consistent and clear enforcement, we have the opportunity today with these amendments to clear and address our unsafe and unhealthy encampments in downtown hopefully allowing more folks into temporary shelter and ultimately housing. I will also end by referencing our letter that we sent to you this morning with over 700 residents and community business owners in full support. There is a path to yes on this today, and we look forward to your unanimous support. Thank you. Next is SEB. Sure. As you make your way up, just a reminder, Catherine Douglas, Larry Webb, David, Roger, and Deborah Morrison should be behind. Please begin, ma'am. You'll have one minute. Please begin. Oh, hi. My name is S.E.B., and I'm 85-year-old retired. I was working many years here, single woman. My husband passed away, two girls. That's my story, but I don't want to come here to tell my story. I want to tell this ban, which is very drastic and very hurtful, to people because I know it's people don't like a guy out, out, out on the street next to the house. And there are some 
uh, mental cases. I think if we separate mental um, people with mental problems and people who are really out on the street and have been working trying to survive and they cannot make it because of the rents and and I was all one of those people who on $900 I raised my two kids I had a house in UTC two bedroom but I came back after so many years thank you for your comments ma'am your time has expired so if the rent housing is very important thank you for that concluding statement next is Catherine Douglas Good afternoon, Catherine Douglas, Coastal Coalition. The time is now. We have people living on our streets under inhumane circumstances. We have parents walking their children to school through drug-infested encampments on our sidewalks. We had multiple community members and vehicles attacked in my neighborhood on Saturday. The unhoused need help, and they need it now. They need a safe place to sleep with services that can help them to a better, healthier life. The community needs to be able to walk safely in their neighborhoods. Failing to support this ordinance is perpetuating the tragic plight of the unhoused and failing to protect the community at large. It's necessary for the safety and hope of the unsheltered and for everyone else who has had their safety threatened by what has been allowed to continue for far too long. This ordinance is the key, is the key to success for both sides. Pass it, staff it, fund it, enforce it, and insist the city attorney follow through on their end. Thank you Thank for you. that concluding statement. Next is Larry Webb. Thank you, I'm Larry Webb. I'm the Mission Beach Town Council President, founding member of the Coastal Coalition. I'm speaking on my own behalf here today. I support the proposed unsafe camping ordinance as a needed tool to help address the homelessness crisis. If robustly enforced, I believe it will help lead more homeless to connect with the services that are there to assist them. Any ordinance will help protect our families' safe access to our coastal parks and beaches. I do so, however, with grave concern over enforcement. Our city leaders' track record on enforcing the sidewalk vending ordinance and beach fire regulations has been lackluster because like Lincoln Litigation against the ordinance was threatened. Our city leaders have yet to fully enforce the sidewalk vending ordinance, and full enforcement looks to be at least months away. If this ordinance isn't robustly enforced in the face of litigation, it will just be window dressing. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have David Roger, and behind him in the seat should be Deborah Morrison, Jorge Villa, Wayne Woodyard, and Greg Norman. You'll have one minute, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. Dave Roger again for Felipe's Pizza Grotto, 73 years. Um, we actually support this effort. Um, we have people, homeless people, going into our restaurants, taking food off of customers' plates. We have people, I mean, it's out of control. It, it's time that the 1.3 million people that live in San Diego are not affected by the 3,500, okay? W there's there's got to be some happy medium and we hope that the mayor of San Diego and the city of San Diego can actually enforce this and do this in, an, in a humane way and, and, and look out for people. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Deborah Morrison. Deborah Morrison, you have people seating you time. Wilda Edmund, please raise your hand. Thank you. Jason Coleman. Uh, Deb uh, Anita Axelrod, Mary Lange, Andrew Lange, and Don Sassy. Thank you. You have seven minutes. Please proceed. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Deborah Morrison, and I'm speaking on behalf of my neighbors in University Heights, Mission Hills, Hillcrest, and Marston Hills. On April 13th, before the committee, I commented on this ordinance by saying that we were in favor only in theory. On May 10th, Malik Thornton from Council Member Whitburn's office <clears throat> attended a meeting in my home with several community residents. At that time, we talked about the proposed ordinance and asked the question, what is the plan? 
We finally received a response via a copy of the 43-page June 8th memorandum. Today, all of you are here to vote on this ordinance, and we ask that you seriously consider these additional questions before you cast your vote. How will our understaffed and overworked police department possibly enforce this ordinance? What happened to the mayor's policy to take down daytime tents he implemented last year? While historic Barrio Logan may regrettably for them become a natural migration point for those run out of downtown, will Hillcrest, University Heights, Marston Hills, and Mission Hills become the next stop for those cleared out of Balboa Park and other no camping areas? Will our neighborhood canyons become even more overrun with hidden encampments resulting in increased fires, trash, and crime? How will these displaced people people be moved with all of their belongings to these proposed sites and when. One of the concerns outreach workers have expressed is that they will need to know where their clients are taken so that the services can continue. Currently, you've listed a total of 52 and a half full-time employee outreach workers. This hardly seems sufficient. How many of the 15 listed city-funded shelters with current occupancy of 1,784, which is far below the needed capacity, will remain fully funded and open for the next 12 months. Between July of this year and December of next year, 930 occupancy spaces from sites are slated to be closed. How many sites will be opening and what is the anticipated capacity? And I understand some of that question was answered earlier. What other types of permanent housing will be provided? Not everyone is safe or qualifies in a low barrier environment. The Voice of San Diego article of June 6 stated that in the first five months of 23, the Housing Commission data shows an average of more than two thirds of the shelter referrals did not result in an unsheltered resident acquiring a bed. So who will manage these sites? What will the wraparound services include? Where will the staffing come from? And how can they afford to live in San Diego if, you, if we do attract them? And can any of this be done by volunteer groups? Is there sufficient space to address the approximately 35% of homeless who are either mentally ill and or chronic substance abusers who pose the greatest threat to themselves and to our communities and safety? Page 13 of the memo states that the 10-year plan, which many have already referred to, adopted in 2019, identifies the number one goal is to decrease unsheltered by 50%. It seems if we are farther from that goal, almost halfway through that 10-year plan, so how do you plan to achieve that goal today? On on, um, I'm sorry, on June 8th, a San Diego Union article reported that the 2023 count indicates that the unsheltered rate is up 22% overall in the county, with San Diego up by 31.7%. What matrix will the city use to determine the success or the failure and accountability of this ordinance, and what is the expected return on our, the taxpayer's investment? I would ask the city council to strongly consider and publicly answer these questions before a final vote is cast. Let us provide our unsheltered neighbors with long-term solutions to the support they so need and deserve, and let us not move them like some trash to unseen remote places and call it problem solved. Please vote responsibly. Next year's an election year and we're all watching you. Thank you very much. My apologies. Next is Jorge Villa. Jorge, you have time ceded to you by Christian Pichardo. Please raise your hand. Thank you, Joseph Warner. Heather Lawler. <coughs> Fernando Melendez. Fernando? I think I have to leave. Oh, then you'll have four minutes. Okay, Please. thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jorge Villa. I'm the director of housekeeping at the Bajira Shark Hotel. Uh, I've been working for uh, Forever Source Hotel for 20 uh, years, and I represent the housekeeping um, community, many of which come from Mexico, Latin America, and um, Haiti um, daily. 
uh, not only has the uh, homeless crisis greatly impacted our industry, but it's, it has also dramatically impacted uh, my employees' feelings of safety when they come to work. Many employees have had close encounters with homeless people, specifically at work on Mission Bay or Pacific Highway. Uh, many come to work very early in the morning and are harassed, just walking from their cars to report to their uh, shifts on each day, and this is not a good way to start uh, their every day. Uh, I have personal experience um, uh, this person when a homeless person was on property and accosted one of uh, our staff members and we had to call the police to just uh, remove them. They did so with great difficulty. Uh, we frequently must call our own security or the police to have homeless people removed from the hotel for the safety of our guests or employees. Uh, imagine a housekeeper renting a room to clean it only to find a homeless person inside. It is very difficult to comfort them following a situation like this even uh, if there are no injuries. Uh, it is terrifying. Uh, put yourself uh, on their shoes and how will you feel? Uh, I'm concerned that my uh, for my safety, my colleagues and the safety of our guests will be impacted and not return to work or to take another vacation with us. Uh, my job depends on visitors. We can get visitors to return or employees wanting to work if this homeless, if this homeless issue continues. I'm asking you to vote yes on the two ordinances that are presented to you today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Wayne Woodyard and behind him we should have Greg Norman, Colleen Cusack, Rachel Hayes and Nancy Relaford. You do have a PowerPoint and you'll have one minute. Great. Thank you. I am Wayne Woodyard. I represent Berkshire Hathaway Home Services California Properties and I'm a vice president there where we have operated a brokerage in the gas lamp for 23 years now. Um, we are part of this city. We. We will always be part of this city, but we are, just like Mr. Villa, we are increasingly worried about our clients, our employees, residents of the downtown area with the increasing crime that is that has been happening in our area. You know, we deeply emphasize empathize with the unhoused population and believe there's an urgent need for compassionate and effective solutions. However, the crisis is escalating to a critical point. As you can see from some of these photos on a daily basis, our agents and employees, um, we, we have to call clean and safe three and four times a day. We have, as you can see from this photo, someone, our employee found someone um, injecting so it's just your time has concluded sir thank you thank you very much next is greg norman hi my name is greg newman uh, i've been an owner downtown in a business in the gas lamp district for 23 years i live in a condominium directly across from pentoha park and i urge you to support this amendment we know it's not a solution it's not offered as a full solution it's offered as an opportunity but one of the things I think it's very important is for the people who actually live down here, who work down here, who employ people here, who have families here, that we too have some safe places to go. And I think some of those safe places should be sidewalks. We should be able to go to parks. We should be able to enjoy the city as much as the homeless people. We have empathy for them, but we can't change it. And this isn't gonna change it, but it's gonna at least give us some safe spaces. And I thank you for the opportunity. Colleen Cusack. Your library shelter has no running water, never has. The people that stay in that shelter get locked in and they stay until the morning when they can leave and finally try to find a restroom. Fix that. Your ordinance, in order to be enforceable, requires that the police trick homeless people into giving up their right to remain silent because they are under the city attorney memo. The um, police officer must determine that there's a shelter available for that individual. That re means requiring to find out information from that individual to determine what shelter they'd be available for. They have a right to remain silent. If you just remain silent, they can't arrest you. Thank you. The next one is Rachel Hayes. Rachel Hayes, you have time ceded to you by Sim Arnold. Please raise your hand. Sim Arnold. Okay, well then you'll have one minute. Please proceed. That's fine, thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Hayes, a living experience. It's disheartening to think that society can just disregard people like they are trash. 
It's a crying shame when the United States government can aid other countries and finance wars when they have their own people suffering in the streets nationwide. It's a crying shame when our own city representatives strip away the homeless humans of not only their rights, housing, but also of their dignity. This ban that you're trying to implement will only compound problems. It will only hinder your own neighbors, your own people, into further despair. It will cause a great many homeless humans to die in the finest city in America. God bless us for your shortcomings. The next speaker is Nancy Relaford. If we can have the following people in the front row after her, Kevin Stevenson, Marcella Bothwell, Logan Government, Tim Schneider, and Jarvis Leverson. You'll have one minute. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nancy Relaford. I'm a resident of District 3. Um, and since time is short, I will cut to the ask. And I am asking my council member, Stephen Whitburn, to withdraw, uh, press pause, rebuke, or vote no on your ordinance. It is, um, it's unenforceable, it's cruel, and the time is not until there are enough beds that there are beds left over when everyone has shelter. Um, I've sat here and heard people treating unsheltered individuals, and, and not the speakers, the city, treating unsheltered individuals as the threat to public safety and health rather than the most, the most threatened. Talking about protecting children from seeing homelessness, but not about protecting children from experiencing homelessness. Uh, the strategies we heard for shelter are future, aspirational, we'll have this and that. Um, I'm happy that police will be learning to avoid bias policing because in the past Thank they've you. rejected data that Thank you for that exists. concluding statement. Your time has expired. Thank you. Next is Kevin Stevenson. And then just an announcement for those that are in the overflow rooms. There are seats available here in chambers now if you'd like to come in. From any of the overflow rooms, you're more than welcome. Please proceed. Uh, hello, Council. Um, I would like to speak against this ordinance. Criminalizing homelessness doesn't work. We already have a case study that proves this isn't the case. It's called 4118 in Los Angeles. Um, a lot of people have alluded to the, the community plan back in 2019, and I don't know why we're not going with that plan. I don't know why instead Todd Gloria is trying to pander to KUSI and right-wing politicians like Bill Wells and Richard Bailey. But uh, this is a really misconceived agenda item, and I would hope that we don't support this, but uh, I have a feeling that some of you do because of uh, developer money and police union money, and uh, yeah, not good. Um, but yeah, um, for those of you who do have empathy, please vote against this and um, boycott any businesses that support this. Philippi's comes to mind. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marcella Bothwell. Thank you. Logan Government. And just to call more people up to the front row, Tim Schneider, William Keith, Jarvis Leverson, Brian Trottier, and Barbara Pinto can start coming up. You'll have one minute. Please proceed. Yes. So I was sitting there looking at your new strategy, and I was just thinking, why was this strategy not made before this ordinance was brought to our attention? Why did you not talk to any service providers? before creating this ordinance? Why are we making an ordinance that keeps people away from the services they, that, that they need? Why are there only talks, not action? And the only, in fact, action is criminalization. Why is that we would rather put them in prison than house them in the city of San Diego, which costs the state more? We have nothing to lose and everything to gain from uplifting our fellow San Diegans. I, I just beg you guys to do something. And one other thing to mention as well is, the, the very services you guys bragged about that the city of the San Diego has done are here today to tell you that this action is not okay. So think that through and ask yourself all these questions before you vote. Next is Tim Schneider. Thank you, William Keith. Okay, you know, here we go. I would like to remind the city council and every human in this, um, this chamber right now that homelessness is a created culture. It's a planned created culture. It's a planned created environment. You can think about that when I get out of here. 
And um, I am an honorably discharged veteran, U.S. Army veteran. I am a senior. I am a man. Believe it or not, once we compromise through mandates, homeless encampment bans, et cetera, the human rights and civil rights of those who whom are homeless veterans, homeless students, homeless moms, homeless dads, homeless children. We are headed down the road to compromise the human rights and civil rights of all present here right now. You take that to the bank. And you too, Mr. Um, Whitburn, you know what time it is. Our next speaker is Jarvis Leverson. Um, two months ago, me and my kids were almost killed. We're walking to a park downtown, and we get to a place on the sidewalk that's completely blocked off by tents. And the only way to get around them was to walk in the street. So there I am pushing a stroller with two children in the middle of the street, and a car comes whizzing by us at 40 miles an hour, coming inches from hitting us. Only thing I can think of was, God, what if that car was six inches to the left? We wouldn't be here right now. Now, this is not a referendum against homeless people. I actually have compassion and respect for their situation. This is a vote against blocking the sidewalks. You cannot let tents block people from having safe passages. God forbid someone gets killed because they didn't have a way to cross the street. Vote yes on this measure. We have a right to walk without putting our lives in danger. Our next speaker is Brian Trottier. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Trottier. I've spent about the last 17 years on and off working directly with the homeless on the sidewalk. I'm not part of any organization. I agree that the conditions of sleeping on the sidewalk are inhumane. But it was inhumane how you let it happen. And I don't mean you personally, I mean the city. You tore down 10,000 SROs without a plan for how you were going to relocate those people. That happens to coincide with roughly the number of homeless people. Isn't that amazing that when you tear down somebody's housing so you can build multi-million dollar condos, they can't find any place to afford to live in this city? Okay, the, I, I work with these people all day. These are my friends. I've gotten to know so many of these people and it's enriched my life. I have not seen one of you in the last 17 years on the street talking to a homeless person. Not one of you. I would suggest you might try finding out who your neighbors are because they are your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And Barbara Pinto. And then behind her, we should have Sarah Guzman, Dominga Estrada, Yolanda Meneses, Jose Lopez, and Christopher Edmonds. Jose You'll have Lopez one minute. Not here. Jose Lopez had to leave. Thank you very much. My name is Barbara Pinto, and I'm a resident of the 8th District and a member of ACE. It stands for the Alliance of California for Community Empowerment. Um, I once was threatened with eviction, and I know what it is to feel like you're almost going to be homeless. I'm afraid of homelessness. I have talked to many people about this proposed proposal that we have before us today, and they all agreed that this is not the solution to the homeless problem. It's like pouring water on a drowning man. I am a senior, 77 years old, and I am paying over 80% of my income for rent. It seems to me, if you would provide more affordable housing, you would give many of these homeless people an incentive to acquire permanent housing for themselves. Go back to the drawing board, scrap the band, and make a new plan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Guzman. Sarah Guzman, are you in chambers? Dominga Estrada. Buenas tardes a todos. Un segundo, señora. Yo le voy a traducir. Le voy a poner dos minutos y si puede hablar en frases cortas. Sí. Gracias. Puede empezar. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to everybody. 
My name is Dominga Estrada. Soy miembro de ACE. I'm a member of ACE. Yo quiero hablarles de mi experiencia en el 2020. I want to talk about my experience in 2020. Yo y mi hijo y yo nos enfermamos de COVID. Me y, and my son were sick with COVID. Y lo despidieron del trabajo por esa razón. And he was let go of work because of that. Avisamos al dueño de los apartamentos y su respuesta fue desalojarnos inmediatamente. We let the landlord of our apartment know and his response was to ask us to leave immediately. Habiendo pagado la renta, nosotros aplicamos a la ayuda del gobierno también. Having paid rent, we also asked the government for help. Para el pago de la renta y les mandamos la información, pero el dueño no la aceptó. We, uh, we sent the information for the help, but the landlord did not accept it. Y seguía acosándonos. Estábamos enfermos y muy estresados por el acoso, pero nos, nos salvó la ayuda del gobierno que dos meses después fue pagada la renta. And he kept accosting us and making us very stressed while we were still sick, but the government funding did come through and gave us two months worth of rent. Si no, que hubiéramos hecho nosotros sin esa ayuda, nos hubieran echado a los niños menores de edad y mi hijo y yo. A la If we didn't have that assistance, what would have happened to us, to my son, to my minor children, and we would have been left on the streets. Mi, mis nietos hubieran perdido su escuela, sus clases, y nosotros lo, que, lo poco que tenemos para vivir. My grandkids would have lost their home, their school, and the little that we have to live. Necesitamos que se respeten nuestros derechos humanos de todos y las leyes más efectivas para proteger de we, justicia a los... We need that our basic human rights and our basic laws and necessities be respected. Ya se le terminó su tiempo, señora. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Our next speaker is Yolanda Meneses. Yolanda, are you here in chambers? Going with Christopher Edmonds. You have time ceded to you by Lisa Bryant. Lisa Bryant, thank you so much. You'll have two minutes. Please proceed. Hello, folks. Um, I recently moved here about four years ago from Knoxville, Tennessee. And I have to say, it was a culture shock. And they have homeless people there, too. But you have to realize something. I moved here, and I've become a member of Voices of Our City Choir. It got me off drugs. I'm sober. But I don't like the fact that people are homeless, that they have to live on the street. I, too, have had to walk out in the middle of the street going to Ross over near uh, City College. I get that. But what I don't get, and I'm going to go with my morals and values that I was taught with. I was taught with compassion. Let me ask you a question. Every one of you council members, have any of y'all, all of y'all been camping, correct? Have you taken your kids camping? Well, there's one thing you realize. When you went camping, you needed that tent as a tool to go and have a leisure time with your children. It wouldn't be so leisure for you if that tent was your home. So all I can ask for you is to not pass this bill and have some compassion for people that don't have a cozy bed to sleep in like you do. The next speaker is Casey Stevenson, or Cassie Stevenson. Cassie Stevenson, and the, the next is Melanie Tropp, William Evans, Robert Gleason, and Vanessa Graciano. Any of those speakers here? Cassie Stevenson, you're Melanie Tropp. Come on up. Good afternoon, my name is Melanie, a resident of District 3, urging you to vote no on this ordinance. We know that encampment sweeps do not reduce homelessness because encampment sweeps have been the status quo in our city for years. This has led to the displacement of our unsheltered community who need safe access to housing and resources, not increased policing. Police are not service providers. Further, the San Diego Police Department has a long history of racial and anti-LGBTQ bias, and expert researchers have found that contact between San Diego police and unsheltered people rarely provides services. Shelter referrals do not guarantee shelter beds, and many in our community and existing shelters are not safe, especially our queer and black people. Keep our community safe by getting our community housed. Thank you, and please, I beg you to vote no. William Evans, 
You have time ceded to you by Jim Chester. Thank you, and Rich Wallace. Thank you, you'll have three minutes. Please proceed. <clears throat> Honorable members of City Council, my name is Bill Evans, and I'm the president of the Mission Bay Lessees organization. I come to you today to express all of our support for banning homeless encampments within Mission Bay Park. Mission Bay is a treasured oasis for residents and visitors alike. It holds a special place in the hearts of all San Diegans. Mission Bay is a place where families gather for picnics, where children play sports, fly kites, and where individuals see, seek a respite from the urban chaos that surrounds us all. By ensuring that Mission Bay Park remains safe and welcoming environment, we honor the rights of all San Diegans to enjoy this precious public space. While we acknowledge the complexities surrounding homelessness and need for compassionate solutions, allowing encampments within the park hinders its intended purpose as a recreational haven. It jeopardizes the safety, cleanliness, and accessibility that should be afforded to all those who seek joy within its boundaries. By restricting homelessness encampments in Mission Bay Park, we send a clear message that we are committed to creating an inclusive and equitable city for all residents. This is not an act of indifference, but rather a step towards finding sustainable solutions. We must not forget our responsibility to offer alternatives and assistance to those exper experiencing homelessness. Banning encampments should be accompanied by robust outreach programs, supportive housing initiatives, and comprehensive social services. Honorable members of the City Council, I implore you to consider the greater good of our city and its residents and visitors. Let us work together to preserve the integrity of San Diego's parks while simultaneously providing compassionate solutions for those that are unhoused. By taking this crucial step, we demonstrate our commitment to the well-being of all San Diegans, old, young, and the unsheltered. On a personal note, I live on a canyon off Presidio Park. In the last 18 months, there have been three fires, two of which have gone into my backyard and burnt a substantial part of my property. Um, the reality is urban fires are is a result of camping in our parks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Gleason. You have more than 15 people seating you time, but the maximum is 15 minutes. I will uh, ask for these people to raise their hand. Claudia Adriano. Claudia Adriano. Vanya Rojas Earp. Thank you. Alicia Turcate. I apologize for any mis um, saying anyone's name wrong. Omaira Goodwin. Thank you. Kiona John. Thank you. Rika Fricks. Vera Kapich. Thank you. Vebi Rexhappy. Robert Bautista. Robert Bautista. Thank you. Aiden Poston. Thank you. Ben Haddad. Thank you. Marshall Anderson. Thank you. Joy Forte. My apologies, I missed your hand. Thank you so much. Fred Tycho, Doug Korn, Farad Ahmed, Danielle Levin, Scott Hartman, Maria Camposano, Elsa Mijangos, John Zarzar, Rebecca Baumwert, and Justin Chemilowski. Thank you so much. Please proceed, you'll have 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council President, members of the City Council, my name is Robert Gleason and I serve as chair of the San Diego County Lodging Association. You've heard us speak with increasing alarm about the negative impact of the homelessness crisis on San Diego's hospitality and tourism sector and our inability to remain competitive in a post-pandemic world. But that's really only one side of this story. The other side is the real human impact that this has on our hotel associates, particularly frontline employees who are not only charged with ensuring a positive guest experience for visitors to San Diego, but now are also concerned with their own safety. We've collected some stories for you to consider as you deliberate this ordinance today. We urge you to vote in favor. Listen to these real stories of real people. These are the people that live and work here who are impacted in very real ways every single day by this situation. 
I currently work in downtown San Diego and have for many years in various industries, including hospitality. Homelessness impacts hotel visitors and employees alike. The unsafe conditions produced by homelessness deters visitors from frequenting nearby establishments and even the hotels they are staying in. Employees may not only fear for their safety, but also their health, since they are frequently exposed to human waste, pollution, and interactions with individuals who are unstable. For both groups, the experience leaves them feeling stressed and discourages their presence in such spaces. The end result, fractured community health and well-being all around. As a downtown employee and San Diego County resident, I support the unsafe camping ordinance. We should not normalize people living in streets. Rather, structured spaces and services should be offered for community members in need. The health and safety of all residents should be a priority. I ask City Council to please vote yes on the ordinance. Hi, coming from a resident um, of eight years in downtown San Diego without a car. I have been walking around and seeing the progression of all the unsafe encampments and just unsanitary um, activities. It is very different in the perspective of rush hour because there's just a lot more people around. But when it gets dark during the business hours where the, there's not enough business or conference guests in town, you really notice it and it is very very scary um, being a single female walking to and from work is really scary the safety of our residents even our guests that are traveling to San Diego and especially our associates who are coming to make a living um, and if it, they don't feel safe we're gonna be losing associates and business to North County just everywhere that's away from downtown um, and with the safe sleeping measure that's great to have an alternate location to have the unhoused to be living my name is Damien. I live in the 92102 zip code. Me being a frontline worker at the hotel, I am often asked from guests when they drive in and see the encampment in the back, am I in a safe area? And will my vehicle be safe if I park with or without the hotel? Is this a safe area to park my vehicle? Will um, other guests have brought up to me that um, they are unable to utilize the side sidewalk due to the encampment being on the, the back street there? I've also experienced firsthand when a homeless guy came into the hotel hotel made his way into the restroom and he just put his feces all over the bathroom. Unfortunately, one of the hotel, uh, the housekeeper workers had to clean it up. A hotel guest is the one that noticed it. Um, I've also noticed when some of the workers are trying to work and check people in, they sometimes have to um, escort some of the homeless guests out and it makes it difficult to do their job. And I'm just asking city council to vote yes on the um, ordinance. Thank you. Hola, mi nombre es Norma Magdaleno. Trabajo de supervisora de housekeeping en el Wyndham San Diego Bayside. Yo tuve una experiencia con una persona de la calle que me, me dio mucho miedo porque no sabía cómo iba a reaccionar. Él andaba preguntándome que dónde estaba la playa de las mujeres desnudas y yo le dije que no, que yo no sabía. Y él se, se enojó y me dijo, shut up, bitch, Only, solamente dime dónde está la playa de las mujeres desnudas porque yo quiero ir. Y yo traté de, de alejarlo de mí, lo, lo fui orillando a que se saliera por la puerta que va para las escaleras porque había más muchachas trabajando en el edificio y no quería que ellas se fueran a asustar. Y le pido al Consejo de la Ciudad que vote sí a las ordenanzas. Hi, my name is Jonathan Olander, and I work um, in the East Village for a hotel um, near Petco Stadium. I live at 92103. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the homelessness issue in the East Village. Um, I personally have experienced it firsthand, and I know that many of our guests and hotel staff have. Um, I've often called two or three times a week um, for Safe and Clean to come out and help us with an issue. We've had homeless people defecate on property, defecate against the building. Um, I had one homeless person threaten to murder me. Um, we've had people break into the water source on the side of the building um, to take a bath in front of uh, guests and patrons of the East Village. Um, it is really concerning. I know that 
our staff, you know, who works in and out of a, a parking garage that is sometimes accessible, um, feels vulnerable to people hiding um, between cars, maybe uh, to use the garage as a, as a restroom or a place to, um, to you know, get high or to uh, do whatever, we don't know. Um, and I know that when guests come to San Diego, a lot of them aren't used to the homelessness that we have here, and they are very concerned. A lot of them have children. Um, they're asking for the safest route to enjoy a meal or to just uh, have a nice walk with their family or get a gelato. I hope that um, we, we can get a yes on this ordinance. I think it would be a benefit to the city. Thank you so much. My name is Aurea Berry, and I live in 92114. I work in downtown San Diego, uh, serving a hotel in the parking industry. And the mayor complaint that we have from hotel guests is that they feel very unsafe. Um, people break into their vehicles, still in their property, uh, leaving feces and urine around the garage and uh, smearing into um, walls sleeping under the stairs. So I support the ordinance about homeless and I ask you to please vote yes. Hello, my name is Ronnie. I work with Ace Parking. I manage the parking garage at 801 East Harbor Drive, right near the Hilton Bayfront Hotel. Um, I feel for the homeless, I really do. But the safety of my employees and of the hotel guests are my paramount concern. We've had multiple incidents of indecent exposure, and lewd acts, open drug use, on two occasions, my security personnel have been attacked, and we've recently had a rash of broken windows and theft in guest cars. Hi, my name is Fabian Ramirez, and I am a bellman at the Manchester Grand Hyatt in San Diego. One of the incidents I could recall was uh, on a busy winter evening uh, with the big group in-house. Uh, a gentleman came in, in the lobby, he went down to the ground hall and uh, he was, I believe he was a little bit uh, maybe intoxicated or maybe mentally unstable. Uh, he was in the lo lobby acting a little bit erratic. Uh, he started screaming and what I seen um, from far from the bell desk, not too far about maybe uh, 30, 40 feet was the gentleman. Uh, he came out, he took out a bottle from his sweater and broke it in the lobby. Uh, it impacted the guests of course, because it was a loud noise. So everyone turned around, you know, to look at, you know, what had happened. Um, when that occurred, uh, we immediately called security, our security team, and was very prompt to get there. Uh, the gentleman, uh, when the security approached him, the gentleman did threaten on security and said he had a gun in his wrist, in his wrist, in his wrist, uh, in his waist. So uh, security right away called the uh, Harbor PD. Incidents like this are common in San Diego and are you know, regularly more common here in our health hotel industry. I've seen it more than once or twice, and I feel that there's, there should be a way we could fix this, you know. The safety of our guests and our employees are our first priority. I'm asking you to please, you know, consider and vote yes on these two ordinance that we're asking for. Thank you very much, have a great evening. I fully support the encampment ordinance, the Anlopers encampment ordinance, and the safe sleeping ordinances because um, I think it's a good idea for everyone involved, homeless guests and employees alike. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sherwin Reyes, a security manager for the Onda San Diego. On behalf of our team here at the hotel, I would like to address the ongoing challenges we experience here daily with the ever-increasing homeless encampments located near and around the hotel. A few examples that we've experienced are hotel staff, Hotel guests are forced to walk on the streets due to tents and encampments taking up the entire sidewalk. Witnessing families with small children, locals and visitors during Badger games having to navigate around encampments just to avoid harassment and aggressive panhandling. The open drug use, frequent verbal altercations and physical violence amongst the unhoused community. I have witnessed individuals overdose on drugs on numerous occasions, passed out in the middle of the sidewalk or convulsing uncontrollably due to their drug usage. Some of the more extreme instances that I recall is an unsheltered male exposing himself, masturbating in the middle of the street, and most recently a mentally ill female, fully unclothed, walking up and down the streets for all to see. As a hotel, our team submits hundreds of reports monthly through the Get It Done app. However, there has been little to no progress. The times when we have called upon local authorities for assistance, the San Diego Police Department do their best to address the problems with the encampments. However, it seems like they're limited to what action can be taken. 
For the last 15 years, I have been a safety and security representative for the on San Diego, and I can attest that the situation with the homeless encampments, violence, and drug usage has increased substantially. On behalf of the hotel, hotel guests, and associates, we ask for the city's help to find a resolution to this ever-growing issue. Thank you for your time. Mi nombre es Elizabeth Arteaga y trabajo para Windham Bayside eh, con el código postal 92101. Eh, hace meses tuvimos, bueno, tuve un encuentro con un homeless en, en el pasillo donde yo estaba trabajando. Eh, él estaba abriendo las máquinas de sodas con un cuchillo y al yo, darme, al yo salir a agarrar material al carrito, él se escondió, este, se escondió para que yo no lo viera, a lo cual a mí me dio miedo y llamé a seguridad. Después él corrió a, hacia las escaleras y tiró el cuchillo. Este, ya llamé a seguridad y, y lo detuvieron. Pero sí, sí me dio mucho miedo. Y le pido al consejo de la ciudad que vote sí a las ordenanzas. As a resident of San Diego who likes to enjoy the nightlife and gasland, walking around certain streets like 7th Avenue or closer to the East Village area, Walking past those encampments has become dangerous. I've been assaulted by some homeless while walking over there. To be approached by a homeless man cut and attempting to physically assault me just seems dangerous, and I'm sure it happens to other people while roaming downtown San Diego. From a business aspect, dude, from my place of business, to have employees with tears in their eyes passionately asking us to escort them blocks away from work, which is outside of our jurisdiction, because they feel unsafe. They don't feel safe getting on the trolley. They don't feel safe walking past homeless is a problem. Nobody should have to feel that way when they're just trying to go home after a long day at work. Homelessness is among my chief concerns as GM, and it's something that I, I deal with daily. I hear at least several times per week that guests won't return due to the unsafe conditions that homelessness presents in and around the hotel. Unfortunately, some of our guests have had run-ins with the homeless, which has tainted them, not just their experience with the hotel, but the notion that San Diego is America's finest city. And this isn't hyperbole. And while our guest well-being is of utmost concern, even more so is that of our associates. We've had associates threatened and abused by some of the unhoused that roam our streets, and we've had several quit their jobs due to the, at times, unsafe nature of the job. I urge you to vote yes on these ordinances. So thank you very much for your attention to those stories. Um, I hope you will consider them as you consider this ordinance today on behalf of the San Diego County Lodging Association, our members, and most especially our frontline associates. I urge your support today. Thank you. Before proceeding with the next speaker, Action. before proceeding with the next speaker, I will recap the Spanish comments made within the video. The first Spanish speaker said, I am a housekeeper. I had an interaction with a homeless man who was being erratic, asking where the nudist beach was. I had to escort him back to the scares, and I was very concerned for my safety. The second speaker, my name is Elizabeth Graciano. I had an encounter with a homeless man who was opening all of the contents within a car. I called for security, and he ran for the stairs, almost rushing me. Security had to come, and I felt unsafe. I asked the council to vote yes on the ordinance today. Those were the Spanish speaker's comments within the video. Next, we will go with Vanessa Graciano, and if behind her we can have Bernadette Muniz, Josefina Kaufman, Erica Koner, Elizabeth Babak, and Peter Kamiski. You'll have one minute. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Vanessa Graziano. I'm the founder of the Oceanside Homeless Resource, which is a grassroots nonprofit that helps families and individuals get off the streets and transform their lives. We have created programs and shelters by working with resources all over the county. I'm also a member of HEAL and LEA. I was homeless on the streets with my daughter in 2014. On the streets, I really needed resources and different pathways of healing to heal and not to be criminalized. Today, I'm a certified expert in trauma and recovery. As leaders, it is important that we show up and implement plans that have solutions already in place that are going to be humane and not criminalize those that are most vulnerable. I understand that this is a very serious issue. However, we can't pass something like this without proper solutions in place. The majority members of the COC, along with different organizations and leaders all over San Diego, oppose this ordinance. This has to mean something to you. Please do not piggyback on a mayor that is only out for his own political agenda and not for all the people. 
as leaders, we can do better. So let's bridge our resources together and create a safe and successful organization for, for everyone. Thank you for that concluding comment. Next is Bernadette Muniz. Bernadette, you have time ceded to you by Angelina Fernandez. Thank you, you'll have two minutes, please proceed. Hello, council members. My name is Bernadette Muniz. I am a 38-year-old single mother of two children in elementary school. My little boy graduates elementary tomorrow. And I am just a few months away from completing my bachelor's of science in clinical psychology with a minor in human rights and migration. So in other words, I'm getting an education from one of the finest universities in the world on human rights. This is after I was able to escape a violent, decade-long abusive relationship. One of the things that kept me there longest in that Gabby Petito situation was the terror of what it would be like to go into a shelter, was listening to my children's father tell me, look at our house, would you really take our babies and take them to a big-ass gym and have them sleep on a cot? Why would you do that to our children? I was terrified. I didn't want to be homeless. But when I finally made that leap, it took me days, days and hours of calling to find beds for myself and my children. My daughter was only two years old when we first left, in two, five years ago, right? So almost six years ago, my daughter was just two years old, and it took us days to find a place to be. I had nothing on my resume. I had no high school diploma. I was resigned to being this person's victim. When I finally got into shelter, guess what? You only get 30 days in a domestic violence shelter. If you're lucky enough, it might take weeks to find a space in a longer-term transitional shelter. When I finally was contacted by somebody from a community college that convinced me to go to college, and that's why I'm, why I'm wrapping up my degree now, that's what eventually saved me. Criminalizing me and my children would not have helped me. I heard people complain about, oh, but the children in their schools, my kids were homeless. My son missed kindergarten because we were homeless. And Thank Stephen Whitburn, your time has concluded, ma'am. Your smile is the disgusting. Next. And if my child were to smile while disgusting, a ma'am, your time has concluded. We need to be. A minute can go by quickly. Um, please be sure to manage your time for comments. Josefina Kaufman, Josefina Kaufman, are you in chambers? Erica Cohn. Folks, just uh, before we, we hear this comment, there are two reminders. One, uh, please respect the time allotted, uh, allotted to you so that others um, have this, the same amount of time. We want to make sure that this is fair. Uh, the second uh, is we've gotten some reports about um, some, some th threatening remarks out in the lobby. Um, as a reminder, um, while I understand this is an impassioned conversation and, and why it is an impassioned conversation, uh, we do ask that you keep this um, in a, a non-threatening matter manner um, and respect folks' um, right to feel safe while engaging in this public debate. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Erica Kohler, and on behalf of the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, I want to thank the mayor, the council members, and city staff for taking steps to address unsafe camping in the encampments in Balboa Park and elsewhere. As stewards of Balboa Park, we and our neighbors, neighbor institutions are well aware of the complex operational issues in our area, and we appreciate the opportunity to share our working knowledge to contribute to a productive solution. The homeless crisis is a complex situation, and it is not only a city of San Diego issue. Everyone in our region has a responsibility for the variety of solutions that may be needed to make a difference in the long and short term. No matter where you happen to live or work in the San Diego area, it is in everyone's interest to help address the difficulties of homelessness and the resulting issues for our neighborhoods and communities. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next is Elizabeth uh, Babcock. Babcock, my apologies. Hi, that's okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Babcock. I'm the CEO of Forever Balboa Park. First, I would just like to thank you for taking many hours to hear everybody's opinions. So thank you for that. Um, I'm here standing alongside my other colleagues from the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, of which I'm a member, um, to basically say in Balboa Park, which is the focus of my organization, uh, we're concerned about public safety. 
Um, we're also concerned, and I was very glad to hear today about the plan that you have to immediately address in a significant way the suffering that we see every day of the people experiencing homelessness in Balboa Park. I think that this ordinance is very important as long as it's coupled with a sincere effort to move forward with the plans that you outlined today with regard to the um, homelessness shelter uh, plan. Um, but I wanted to basically say Balboa Park is a gem, as you know, uh, and it is a park for everyone, including the many, many millions of visitors that come to the park every day who also um, deserve to have a safe space to play and learn. Thank, Thank you. you for that concluding remark. Next, we have Peter Kaminsky. After him, if we can have in the front row, Victoria Abrenica, James Bucci, William, um, Renda, Colleen Anderson, and Tina Kafka. Mr. Kaminsky, please begin. Jay Hilo Rivera and member of the council, Peter Kaminsky, representing the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, a collaboration of 25 arts and cultural orgs within the cultural district. Balboa Park is a very challenging environment for those experiencing homelessness. The park ex includes extremely crowded hardscape surfaces in the central mesa, together with challenging park topography, making access to the canyons for emergency services challenging. Organizations within the park have for a long time sought focused efforts to amplify the assistance for those experiencing homelessness within the park. We support the development very much of the safe camping sites together with this focus on increased services that are identified within the item today. We look forward to continuing to work with the mayor, council members and city staff to deliver effective solutions and we ask for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Victoria Abrenica. Hello, my name is Victoria. I'm a representative from East County BIPOC and I'm speaking today in opposition of the proposed ban. Um, I don't appreciate um, all of you pretending that this ordinance will help our children or wildlife or will prevent wildfires. There are over 11,000 unhoused students in our city, and if you want to minimize the frequency and severity of wildfires, you would invest more funds towards planting native plants in our canyons, stop the use of fossil fuels, and if you cared about keeping our watersheds clean and free of feces, you would be supporting the residents of Imperial Beach and the entire South Bay region who have been asking for funding and action to address the pollution in the Tijuana River Valley. Please dedicate the same amount of energy and resources to helping our unhoused population as you invested in winning your political campaigns, especially because a good number of you spoke out against criminalizing homelessness during your campaign trails. Many of you are running for re-election or office, and if you want to win your races and continue Thank you working for that. Thank in you for public that service, statement. you need to serve the community if you're elected. Time has expired. Represent. Thank you. James Bucci. James, you have time ceded to you by Lucia Perez. Lucia, please raise your hand. Thank you. You'll have two minutes. Please proceed. Hi there. I am in favor of the motion ahead of you. I want to thank you, Mr. Whiteburn and Mayor Todd Gloria. I live in a senior citizen community where the Second Street Bridge overpass the five, and there are so many encampments there. They go from the wall where the fence is for the freeway overpass out to the street. We have 213 residents that live in our community between the ages of 65 and 90. They cannot go out back and enjoy the backyard. They cannot, company can't come and park in parking spaces without there being these um, crap and the, the homeless go to the bathroom in our parking lot. And we are very good to them. <laughs> we bring them food. We are good neighbors, but they are not good neighbors. You know, you can laugh, but it's not, you're not living it. We are. I come from Massachusetts. I was in the Vietnam War. I'm in my 70s. And I go back to what President Kennedy said. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I live by that. 
I am a member of First Presbyterian Church San Diego. We feed the homeless on Sundays at 2 o'clock, a beautiful meal. We have medical care for them, and we clothe them. Thank you. We have William Brenda. And then behind him, we should have Colleen Anderson, Tina Kafka, Maria Hungate, Kathy Sosabi, Sosabi, and Joyce Senyata. You'll have one minute. Sir, please proceed with your comments. You'll have um, one minute. My name is William Renda. I'm a resident of Westminster Manor. You know, I was going to say a lot of things, but that hotel video pretty much covers what we live with every day. Um, uh, we um, with James, we have the overpass to our left. We, we put up with that. But when I heard the people from serving seniors say, oh, well, we got 20 people out there. And they, well, you know, we have 67 people in our building that are too afraid to transverse the two blocks from Westminster to the Gary and Mary Wellness Center. Uh, we're not, you know, I'm looking for all these wonderful people I hear about. All we do is we are under siege, we are harassed, and we are intimidated. We are seniors. We're old people. We are the thank most you for, vulnerable. Thank people. you for that concluding remark. Colleen Anderson? Good afternoon. My name is Colleen Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the San Diego Tourism Marketing District. I am also a resident of 29 years and the hospitality executive of 25 years. Prior to my role with the TMD, I held the role of general manager for hotels in San Francisco and San Diego. I have employees accosted and assaulted by members of the homeless community. The ability to keep staff safe is the number one responsibility of any employer. However, with the number of homeless now on our streets, this is becoming impossible. Tourism employs more than 200,000 San Diegans from all districts. It is our second largest industry and the well-being of our workers must be factored into this decision. The landscape in San Diego is now eerily like what San Francisco was when I left there 10 years ago. I have witnessed firsthand that unmanaged homelessness can destroy a vibrant tourism economy and the quality of life for people who live and work there. The TMD is committed to protecting our vibrant tourism economy. We don't want to become San Francisco and we must act now. The unsafe camping ordinance combined with the comprehensive shelter strategy is a critical step to protect public health Thank and safety. Thank you. Thank you for that concluding comment. Next is Tina Kafka. No Tina Kafka. Maria Hungate. Maria Hungate. Kathy Sosabi, you have time ceded to you by Cindy Ingram. Thank you. You'll have two minutes. Dear Mayor Todd Gloria and all that are in here, my name is Kathy Sosby, and I'm with the voices of our city choir, and we only inspire. And this is not what needs to be done. Well, we stand up for everyone. And if you look around and see, a lot of the members of the board, John Brady and all the others would agree that some of the people that were homeless years ago have turned out to be the best pillars of our community today. And Todd Gloria, we stand behind you. We had a float in the Gay Pride Parade. We give you the Unity Award and you, in turn, gave us the Peacemaker Award. We want to give our child, our children, and our grandchildren something that we never had, as to know that someone really loved them and truly cares. We stand up for you. When are you going to stand up for us? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Joyce Sanyata. Joyce and Yetta, District 3. I left the chamber about 45 minutes ago, and I went outside and I had a big cry. I threw out my polished comments and decided to come back in with courage and just speak from my heart. Enough is enough. I have been working with the homeless for 16 years. I love the homeless. I, I, I do. 
and I want them to have the best, but enough is enough. We have kicked the can down the road long enough. We have done our best and it hasn't worked. We must take this action. I approve what is on the agenda today and I think there is going to be some great opportunities that are going to come out of it for all of us. Love to all. Next is Roger Casares. Roger Casares. I'm going to call a few people up. Kelsey Smith, Eli Solomon, Shelby Thomas, Simon Simone Ruff, and Kerr Zaragoza, Marcia Bookstein. Are any of you Roger Casares? Kelsey Smith, you'll have one minute, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kelsey Smith and I am a medical student at UCSD. Uh, as a medical professional in training who works in the East Village, I'm deeply concerned about the health impacts that would result from passing this ordinance. Forced disposal does not fix the public health concerns that have been raised by the people who created this ordinance, it hides it. It decreases access to Narcan and other harm reduction supplies, which will undoubtedly increase the fentanyl overdose deaths and transmission of HIV, hepatitis A, and hepatitis C. The loss of belongings associated with the street sweeps uh, also lead to a loss of medications, which can lead to drug resistance, which is a problem for the entire community. I implore you to trust the public health and medical experts who have dedicated their careers to these topics. Those who express concern for fentanyl-related harms are ignoring the data that demonstrates that forced dispersal uh, reduces initiation for treatment. Um, Make no mistake, if passed, the ordinance will kill people. And Thank you for that concluding part. remark. Eli Solomon. Good evening, Council. My name is Eli Solomon. I'm a medical student at UCSD as well, and I help run an outreach program for unsheltered people in the East Village. Councilman Whitburn's office has outlined a variety of safety concerns of encampments, such as public health risks of hep A and overdose. I want to point out that the people suffering the most, those who are at the most risk of harm, are those that are living in the encampments. The current ordinance will in fact worsen these concerns by preventing access to services like toilets, hand washing stations, and harm reduction programs. To truly address any of these concerns, we need to increase availability of services rather than forcing people deeper into neighborhoods. Sweeps have been shown to worsen the overdose epidemic by interrupting access to overdose reversal supplies um, and decreasing stability. If we're serious about reducing infectious disease risk, overdose deaths, and unhealthy substance use, research shows that we need to reduce criminalization and provide permanent support of housing, not shelter, uh, well, shelter until we can get there, uh, with a housing first model as Mayor Gloria proposed when running for mayor, which apparently times have changed. Uh, according to gov the Government Accountability Office statistics, homelessness increases by 9% for every $100 increase in median rent. We urge you to Your treat time. the root cause rather than Thank hide the symptom. Thank you for that statement. Shelby Thomas. And behind Shelby, we should have Simone Ruff, Kerr Ker Zaragoza, Marcia Bookstein, Denise Larkin, or Dennis Larkin. Good afternoon, my name is Shelby Thomas and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Leadership at the San Diego Housing Federation. Today I'm representing the Federation to express our strong opposition of the proposed ordinance. This proposed ordinance is not just ineffective, it is regressive. It falls woefully short of the informed and sustainable approach needed to combat homelessness. The standard for best practice in addressing homelessness calls for creating bridges, not barriers. And this ordinance seeks to criminalize the very existence of our neighbors who are most in need. History serves as our witness. Similar ordinances, like the encroachment ordinance, have been counterproductive. Instead of uplifting, this type of criminalization casts individuals into shadows. This measure is not merely inadequate, it is a dangerous misstep that neglects to address the staggering shortage of affordable housing. Approving this proposal will not address the root causes of homelessness, nor will it benefit our city in the long run. Thank you for your time. Next is Simone Ruff. Ruff. Good afternoon, Simon Ruff, D7, <clears throat> excuse me, D7 resident and director with CSH. Uh, we're a partner in solving the homelessness crisis and noting our opposition. We all want a safe place to call home and for our neighborhoods to be places of wellness and belonging, regardless of race, income, or where we sleep at night. 
People I work with who've experienced homelessness have shared with me that citing and fining people for living outside increases risk of death and makes it more difficult for them to take care of their health needs, maintain employment, and find pathways out of homelessness. This is especially true for black, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ plus folks, and people with disabilities. People who are pushed into homelessness at disproportionate rates and who will be disproportionately impacted by this proposed order. Local, state, national, international homeless experts are all urging the city to adopt an approach that is rooted in evidence-based practices that focus on housing. We all want the same thing, a solution to the crisis. Thank you for that concluding remark. Uh, Chair Saragosa, you have time ceded to you if you can please raise your hand. Jaylene Sanchez. Jaylene Sanchez. Thank you. Dante Goldham. Dante, are you here? Dante, if you can please raise your hand and maybe move it around. I can't. Oh, he's coming in from the back room. Thank you. Dante? Thank you. David Bell? David Bell? And D. Forrest Hancock? I have three here, so you'll get three minutes. Uh, oh, David Bell? Yeah, I got divorced. It was David Bell that didn't raise his hand. David Bell? So four minutes? Three minutes, because I don't have David Bell raising his hand. But weren't there five people? I have four here, Jaylene Sanchez, Dante Gordon, DeForest Hancock, and David Bell. And me. My sorry. Ken Saragossa, thank you very much. My apologies. That's all right. Four minutes? Thank you. My name is Ken Saragossa. I've been a resident of San Diego since 2007, and I was homeless from 2016 to 2020. I'm also a member of the HEAL Network. I live in Mission Hills, and Mr. Whitburn is my representative on the city council. I fear that unsheltered people have become political footballs, used by one side as evidence of a crime wave and proof that the city is failing, and so the other side responds by adding criminal penalties to demonstrate they're doing something penalizing the poorest, sickest, and most vulnerable San Diegans in the process. I used to teach American literature and creative writing in colleges, even for a time at UCSD. I also worked in social services here in San Diego for many years. But because of a lifelong struggle with addiction, I destroyed both those careers. In 2016, I wound up on the streets and stayed there for several years. My story is typical. I lived in the bottoms, I was a homeless drug addict, and I did what homeless people do to come up on money. I was lost in darkness and despair. I thought I was going to die there. I just hoped it would be soon. The majority of crimes that unhoused people are charged with are petty crimes, often laws that get enforced in ways that target homelessness. Loitering, trespassing, illegal lodging, encroachment, and a whole host of things which are only of interest to the police if the person doing it is unhoused. I have sat unmolested on a brick wall eating lunch downtown with a friend when I was a working professional, but eating a sandwich on the same wall when I was unsheltered, the police approached, I was questioned and searched, and told to move on. I could give many examples of times when something that is not a problem when done by working and housed people becomes citable infractions if the person doing it is unsheltered. The problem in San Diego is not that the laws are not specific enough or, or uh, to, keep people, to keep the sidewalks clear. The problem is you can't arrest homelessness out of existence. <laughs> unhoused people do not love being unhoused any more than you love having us around. Homeless people are far more likely to be victims of violent crimes than perpetrators of it. When you live entirely out in public, you are just at greater risk. Living on the streets is dangerous, and crimes committed against homeless people are vastly underreported because when we're assaulted or robbed, we don't call the police. We don't have much luck with that. It is difficult to decide where to sleep at night when you live on the streets. It is an awful feeling being woken up by a police officer's boot, knowing that because of where I chose to sleep, I'm going to wind up in handcuffs with yet another criminal charge. But I chose that spot because I didn't want to get robbed. I didn't want to get assaulted. I just wanted to feel safe while I slept. Getting arrested that morning did not 
help me get off the streets. Honestly, being arrested like that, it was just cruel. Creating more penalties for living outdoors won't increase public safety. Giving unhoused people safe places to stay is the right way to increase public safety. Piling on criminal charges and arresting people off the streets is not. I was sent to federal prison in 2020, and I was released in 2022, just a little over 10 months ago. Since then, I've been stably housed and employed. I worked as an intern at the La Jolla Playhouse. Some of my writing has been published. I've even won some writing awards. I'll soon be teaching playwriting workshops at Father Joe's Villages. I didn't think I was ever going to get off the streets. None of this happened because of enhanced criminal penalties for homelessness. Every time you create another law, adding another criminal penalty to being homeless, you treat us like human garbage that needs to be cleared away. I promise you, that message has not helped a single person get off the streets. Thank you for that concluding remark. Thank you. Dennis Larkin. Dennis Larkin, are you in chambers? Dennis Larkin? Giorgio Carilio? And then after Giorgio, if you can please come up to the front row, it really does help with meeting management. Khalid Alexander, Holly Hellerstedt, Margo Vele Velez, and Correa Christopher. And Giorgio, you have people seating you time as well, if they can please raise your hand, their hands. Jane Hill. Thank you, Sh uh, Shad Stanley. Thank you, Cookie Serrano. Thank you, and Alexandra Farah. Thank you so much. You'll have five minutes. Please proceed. Good evening, City Council. I really, uh, it's been a long day for everyone. We've heard a lot of emotional stories. Uh, I just wanted to quickly address some things. I'm a resident of East Village. I live, uh, I live kind of in the epicenter of this uh, crisis. I've seen what this looks like. Um, I'm a retired Marine. I deployed six times around the world. I'm not saying that because I'm special in any sort of way. What I'm saying is I've seen countries that have been destroyed and I've walked around their streets and I've actually done a lot of that destruction on behalf of my government. So a couple months ago when I wake up and I look around East Village, I see a scene. I see a scene that is reminiscent of a refugee camp in Iraq and Afghanistan and all these other places around the world. And to me, this doesn't look like what America is supposed to be, nor what we thought we were fighting for. I moved to East Village in 2019. It was an up and coming community. I fought very hard to make the money that I needed to do as an E6 in the Marine Corps, not making a lot, by the way, to buy my home. Nobody handed me a single thing to buy that house. I worked my butt off, and now I'm working my butt off to protect my community. I work with an organization called East Village Doers. I tell you what, we're a group of uh, homeowners and business owners that uh, are concerned that the government is failing us. The government is failing us as a community, and the government is also failing those who are living on our streets. We cannot ignore their suffering any longer, so we're asking you greatly to do something to help them. But I looked very carefully at what this ordinance is. Originally, I was kind of opposed to it. Because frankly, I'm kind of opposed to what Mayor Gloria is doing in the city. But then I started digging a little deeper into it. I actually took the time to read it. In fact, I don't know if anyone in the room has actually read the ordinance yet because no one here seems to be talking about what it is. We keep on talking about this being as some tool to solve homelessness. Well, I don't think there's anything in here that solves homelessness. I don't think there's anything in here that solves this crisis at all. But the one thing that I will center on that has not been said out loud is this. This ordinance would make it unlawful for any person to camp in or upon any public property if sheltered, but blah, 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 blah. But number one, very important, Councilman, and I am very glad to be here to speak on your behalf. Number one states, within two blocks of an elementary, middle, or high school, no encampments within two blocks of an elementary, middle, or high school. Now, what does that mean? That means for all of you here on this board, on this council, that if you vote against this measure, what you are voting for is to continue to allow encampments to be on our children's daily walk to school. 
Now, we've heard a lot of compelling stories up here, the, the downtown, the downtown, the hospitality, like all these people that are telling you the horror. Well, let me tell you something. I live down there. I see it every single day. And I'll tell you what. I see a lot of activists that care greatly for those people who are suffering, just like we do, the people that live there, right? They come down to East Village, and they deliver supplies, and they take their photos, and then they get in their Mercedes, and they drive home. And then that night, we'll watch the yellow, and, and you'll see them, you will see them on the street every morning, the dead. You see the yellow sheet that is laid over another body. We're failing. We're failing in many different ways. But that's not what this ordinance is about, okay? This ordinance is about protecting those areas. And listen, yesterday there was a press conference down in East Village in my community, and there were some people there that you guys are probably familiar with, one of them being the former police chief. She said she is not going to support this measure, and I was dumbfounded because the chief of police is here. He's been here all day. I was dumbfounded because apparently the former police chief is not talking to current police on the street. Listen, You're wrong. they know, they know that this is not going to solve homelessness, but they need a tool. Our police need a tool to defend those schools. So for that reason, for that reason alone, I implore you, right, to not let this be something that prevents you from being reelected when a child is exposed to utter filth. This will give us time to protect the streets that our children work on while we get the services that we're all fighting for, the services that they are all here fighting for. That will give us time to protect them. Listen, we know it's not gonna fix it. Let's get a step in the right direction. Thank you, appreciate you. Thank you, our next speaker is Khalid Alexander. Khalid Alexander, are you here in chambers? Holly, Holly Hellerstedt. Behind her, we should have Margot Velez, Karia Christopher, Maya Little Sonia, Melissa Peterman, and Askari Abdul Montakim. You'll have one minute. Good evening. Um, I'm a resident of 92102 in District 4. Um, to think that anyone could think about the issue that is happening here and not have shed tears would be a great disservice to the fact that everyone here is supposed to be serving the public and caring about what's happening. Um, I've sat by people who approve this and were judging people for their comments of coming up here about what they live through in homelessness. And I just want to say as a person who opposes this ban that we're not in opposition with anyone. And the reality here is that if there are not resources available, no one will feel safe. For people who do not feel safe at their jobs, at their homes, continuing to criminalize people and push them further and further to no resources does not create safety. It creates an illusion of safety. A large part of the proposed ordinance presentation was about public health risks. The council has been asked for decades to increase public bathrooms and has failed. Your time has concluded. Thank you. Margot Velez. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Margot Velez. I was formerly homeless um, due to no fault of my own. Um, a, a corrupt management system unhoused 80 residents. Um, I w went to a shelter where I was mistreated, um, given bad food, contracted H. pylori, and witnessed criminal activity, sexual activity, inside the confines of the shelter. My daughters were terrified and have PTSD now from the experience, bed bugs, lice, and other things. They told me if I did not like it, I could leave. So I chose to leave. We left and we went in a stairwell because it was safer than the shelters. So I'm here, I oppose the ban. Please rethink this ban. Thank you. Correa Christopher, Correa Christopher, are you in chambers? Maya Little Sonia. Oh, I will. Frankly, I have no confidence that you will vote in favor of human dignity or compassion this evening. 
There's too much money and corporate interest invested in pushing people further away from tourist destinations, hotels, and expensive condo buildings, as evidenced by the folks who have given testimony today. You are too cowardly to stand up to them or to Mayor Gloria. Nor do I have confidence you will vote in favor of logic, as countless studies indicate that criminalization exacerbates poverty and heaps undue financial, physical, and psychological burden on our most vulnerable citizens. You are pushing people into deadly jails. Most, uh, more people died in our jails last year than Rikers Island. People will die. Every street and in custody death is a homicide and blood is on your hands. Whereas I can only hope the suffering you caused today will stain your consciences, I know it'll stain your political careers. We will not forget, you will not be reelected. Uh, re we will not forget your cowardice or your malice. May God have mercy on your souls. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa Peterman. After that, we should have Askari Abdul Muntakim, Marcia Bookstein, Jessica Gold Goldman, Jordan Yoshihara. Please proceed. Hi, I'm Melissa Peterman, Executive Director with Townspeople. Homelessness is a crisis that affects real people, individuals and families with emotions and struggles and aspirations. And the ordinance before you today dismisses their humanity and the systemic oppression that limits access to housing, and it is unjust to blame the victims of inequality. People experiencing homelessness have the right to occupy public spaces where they can seek housing and access essential services without fear of punishment. While the existence of homelessness reflects our current values, the vote you take today can serve as a marker of our values as they should be the values that moved many of you to support housing as a human right earlier this year. As the wise Ted Lasso said, I hope that either all of us or none of us are judged by the actions of our weakest moments, but by the strength we show when and if we're ever given a second chance. San Diego has a second chance today, and I urge you to please vote no. Thank you for those concluding remarks. Askari Abdul, Askari, are you in chambers? Marcia Bookstein, Marcia Bookstein, are you in chambers? Jessica Goldman or Goldern? Jordan Yoshihara? Hi, uh, my name is Jordan and I lead homeless outreaches with my church. I want to thank you firstly for, for prioritizing public safety. I have felt unsafe with the rise of homelessness. It comes with an increase of of crime where I live. Just last month, my car was broken into. But the thing is, I have doors, I have a window. My unhoused friends have nothing. The only safety they have is distance from people who would harm them and steal what little they have. They're terrified this ban would take that protection away by forcing them into safe camps or else become criminals. They are just trying to survive, but they've been hurt many times, suffering trauma from shelters, medical disabilities without aid, and waiting on the housing list for decades, and so many other things. I'm here on behalf of those I love, and I just humbly ask you to please take time to implement a strategy that's proven to work and regain their trust before enforcing a ban across our city. Thank you, and God bless. John Brady. John Brady, are you still in chambers? Or overflow? Levi Gaffalioni. Levi. Uh, Bruce Carbon. Oh, there's Levi. Well, behind him, we should have Bruce Carbon, Willie Lands, Lizzie Broughton, and Asma Abdi. Um, you have time seated to you, Levi. Is uh, Sandra Miskowski still? Thank you. You have two minutes. Please proceed. I looked forward to 18 for so long to be able to get away from the people who thought that I was sick. They said I would make others sick. I tried to tell them that I didn't have it all figured out and I wasn't sure who I was yet. But the church thought that they could fix me. My parents thought the right therapy could cure me. And then we could all be happy if I was straight. Because if I wasn't straight, then the only place for me was California. My teachers thought I should try harder to hide it. The pastors, my parents thought that they knew what I needed. They thought I needed more Jesus when I needed more understanding. They attempted to make me normal, and I attempted to end my life. It wasn't until years later, while I was homeless, when outreach workers convinced me I had worth again. 
And the case manager who understood me best was named Becky. Though, ther though that therapy, through that therapy, I learned I wasn't as sick as the town thought that I was. They were just afraid of something they didn't understand. Whitburn, were you ever called disgusting? Have you ever been told your lifestyle is dangerous? And Mayor, you are not on the front lines of homelessness. You do not sweat like me, and you have never been faced with someone who was suicidal because they could not get a shelter bed. Trying to create an outcome for something you are too afraid to understand can have damaging effects. Creating policy against an entire group of people is discrimination, and it's hard to build your self-worth when you think people don't believe in you. But people believing in me made me the fierce frontline worker I am today. And when you say you want my clients to rejoin society, look at the society being offered. Without the housing, we are offering endless services. What am I supposed to inspire them to be? Me, working full time, can't afford a down payment on a house, working just to live. You want me to convince them it's normal to have two jobs, or we can get you a part-time job and SSI and you still won't be able to afford rent. Many of you have shook my hand and told me thank you for my work. If you pass this ordinance, you will be slapping me in the face with that same hand. Thank you for that concluding remark. Bruce Carvin. Bruce Carvin, Willie Lanz, Lance, Willie Lanz, Lizzie Broughton, Asma Abdi. It's Asma, not Asma. My apologies. Please proceed. Hello, my name is Asma Abdi. I'm a policy associate with PANA, Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans. I'm here to oppose the proposed encampment ban because although a strategy, it is not a, an effective plan nor a solution to preventing homelessness. We took one step forward with passing tenant protections and now we're taking 10 steps back if we ban encampments. There are thousands of homeless youth, as Aaron mentioned, over 11,000 unhoused students across the San Diego school districts, to be exact, who are already without a place to live and are now being forced away from the city, their schools and support services. Where are, the, where are these 11,000 homeless students supposed to go? There are not enough shelter bed and, uh, beds, and as impacted folks have mentioned today, many shelters are not safe, nor a pipeline to permanent housing. This has adverse effects on the homeless population in our city. You all unanimously devoted to declare that housing is a human right. However, this ban clearly violates human rights to housing and education here in San Diego. It is your responsibility to protect the human rights of unhoused people and include an impact study on unhoused vulnerable populations, including refugees and asylum seekers. I vote, urge you to vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. Stephen Galasso. Next we have Stephen Galasso, Micah Parzen, Michael Robertson, Dominic Lamandri, Marco Lamandri, and Laura Chechel. Are any of these individuals here? Steven Galasso? No, uh, Dominic Lamandri, but I do believe I have some time seated to me as well. Yes, you do. I was just trying to get people up here. So, um, Dominic Lamandri, correct? Yep. You have uh, 15 minutes seated to you, if they can yep. please raise their hand. Ethan Olson, Kelly Marcella, Kelly Marcella, Jason Mitchell, Jason Mitchell. If you are in chambers, my apologies, it is late. Maybe wave your hand if I'm not seeing it. Uh, Kathleen Wilson. Hank uh, Caminillo, thank you. Trisha Moore. Thank you, Jackson Spencer. Jackson Spencer. Pam Young. Jay Dennison. Jay Dennison. Jason Wallace. Michelle Mercado, Michelle Mercado, Jarvis Leverson, he actually had already spoken, Mike Marcella, uh, David, sorry, Kenneth, Kenneth is you? Oh, thank you. David Bergersman, Bergersma? No, David, Jason uh, Mitchell, Chan Bui, Kathleen Wilson, and uh, McGill, McGill. You will have eight minutes. Thank you. 
I won't take all the time, so I'll be brief. And thank you again for the opportunity tonight to speak before you. And thank you to all the East Village residents and businesses that showed up today to represent, give testimony to your lived experience, and then also some of you that ceded your time to me as well. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, my name is Dominic Lamandry. I represent the East Village Association, a local 501c3 that represents over 700 businesses in downtown San Diego's East Village neighborhood. The East Village Association is uniquely aware of the detrimental impacts the unregulated encampments are having on the public right of way and public's perception of safety in downtown San Diego. These impacts are experienced most acutely in the East Village neighborhood of downtown, where residents, students, workers, and visitors are subjected to daily observances of distress and despair around these encampment sites, a reality that continues to erode the public's confidence in the city's ability to adequately, excuse me, adequately address this unfolding crisis as downtown emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to the sense of disorder increasingly encountered on the public sidewalks of East Village, the EVA wholeheartedly endorses the proposed first step to address this escalating humanitarian crisis in our downtown neighborhood. We fully support Councilmember Whitburn's and Mayor Gloria's efforts to adopt an enabling ordinance consistent with the Martin v. Boise ruling to provide immediate relief to the public right away in the East Village area. We urge the city of San Diego to take immediate action at the next city council meeting, which is today, to alleviate the daily misery experienced by unhoused individuals living on, lo on our local sidewalks, which we feel would, in turn, also provide relief to the residents, employees, tourists, visitors, and businesses of East Village that are also coping with the conditions of this crisis on a daily basis. Money is not the key issue here, rather prioritization and management of resources is. In addition, we would request that the City Council also consider these two points in consideration of the proposed ordinance when it comes to the full Council today. Number one, adopt the City Council resolution whereby, whereby at least 300 participants living in sprung tents and safe camping zones and operated by nonprofits are created in each Council Districts 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Each Council District must take their fair share of the unhoused population to stabilize District 3 in downtown San Diego. These sprung tents and safe encampment zones in each council district must be up and running by the middle of 2024 at the latest. The sites could be funded by a combination of CDBG funds, where applicable, city general funds, county funds, district businesses, philanthropists, and foundations. East Village has historically and disproportionately borne the brunt of hosting service centers for the county's unhoused populations, and that centralization has created untenable conditions on our local sidewalks. Second point. Ensure that all schools, whether public or private, K through higher education, have at least a 500-foot perimeter of no encampments at any time under the new ordinance, as well as ensure that all parks, whether publicly or privately managed, also maintain at least a 300-foot perimeter of no encampments at all times under this new ordinance. On behalf of East Village Association of San Diego, we strongly urge the council to adopt the encampment ordinance before you today and insist that full impl implementation of this ordinance be conducted as of July 17, 2023. We can do better, and for the sake of East Village and its businesses and residents, we have to do better. Thank you for your time today. Next, uh, John Brady, I did see him out. John Brady, if you can please come up. Marco Lamandri, is Marco Lamandri here? Mr. Lamandri, do you know if Marco Lamandri is here? Uh, thank you for confirming. <laughs> Laura Chechel, if I can have in the front row the following individuals, if you're here, Laura Chechel, Mr. Brady, are you Laura Chechel? Mm -hmm. Okay. Laura Chechel, Norma Todd, Dr. Denisha Jenkins, Paige Burtson, Fernando Hernandez, Michael Trimble, and Eric Nemesek. You'll have one minute. Please proceed. Thank you. My name is Laura Chachel. I'm an advanced practice nurse and an adult gerontology clinical nurse specialist. Um, I am here to echo the sentiments of the letter submitted by the American Nurses Association of California and the San Diego Association of California Nurse Leaders. I had many things that I wanted to say today, but they've all gone out the window after I've heard what so many people spoke about. I just want to say that the idea that we would conflate valuables and possessions with the livelihood of individuals that have no homes, that have no no ability to care for themselves, that have no access to clean water, to clean bathrooms, to anything that is in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's unbelievable to me. It almost brings me to tears. So I just want to urge this council, please stand up and do the right thing for people. 
telling people that they can't be where they are right now will lead to the loss of human life. 500 people have already died on the streets of this city. Let's not add to that. Thank you. John Brady. Uh, good evening, John Brady, Lived Experience Advisors. The lack of truce used to justify this ordinance have been shameful. Claiming that the reason we don't have people in shelters that don't exist because they're refusing services is outrageous. We cannot allow people to live on our streets. They have nowhere else to go. Something must be done. Here are the truths today. 6,500 people are homeless in our city. 1,885 are seniors. 3,500 people are on our streets with nowhere to go and 1,000 shelter requests go unanswered every month. 588 people died in 2022 on our streets. We have 160 PhDs, nurses, doctors, and multiple others that have signed on and said this is not the right thing to do, and no credible expert is here today in support of it. Why is this important? Because it's the facts. I leave this, June is Pride Month, and to use the language of hate and discrimination to other homeless people is shameful. Your time, thank you. Norma Todd. We should also have Dr. Denisha Jenkins, Paige Burtson, Fernando Hernandez, and Michael Trimble. Please begin. Thank you for having me. My name is Norma Todd. I'm an advanced practice registered nurse, clinical nurse specialist. I'm here to strongly oppose the unsafe camping ordinance. Echoing the American Nurses Association of California and San Diego Association of California of Nurse Leaders, housing and shelter for differently abled people and seniors in San Diego is a human rights travesty. This ordinance violent, steadily, and fails to uphold the city's obligation for safety for all of us. As someone who has time, who has submitted time to providing triage care services to the individuals that are unhoused, my peers and I have witnessed firsthand the circumstances that they face. We can't criminalize people for staying in the encampments. It's their safe space. They are humans. They deserve to be treated and with dignity and respect. This plan is just not ready. You guys have the wrong people at the table. You need the healthcare providers to come in and help you figure out the best way to implement a practice and a plan for these individuals. Thank you. Vote no for now. Next is Dr. Darnisha Jenkins. Darnisha Jenkins, are you in chambers? Paige Burtson. Paige Burtson, Fernando Hernandez, Fernando Hernandez, Michael Trimble, Michael Trimble, Eric uh, Nemechek. My apologies, I'm saying your name incorrectly. Quite close enough, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Nemesek, and I'm the founder of SD Can Do. We're a network of over 36 homeowners associations downtown that represent 4,500 different property owners. But I'm here today to represent myself and to tell you some of our experiences in our building just two blocks from here. We have found human feces covering the hood and windshield of a car. One of the residents on our fourth floor woke up to two homeless individuals sitting on his bed with him. We have found homeless individuals in our gym cooking meth. I'd ask you, would you live like this? Is this okay? Is this what we're expected to do? I recently met a college student who was downtown and he asked me, hey, I'm glad I met somebody that lived here. I've always wondered why anybody would live downtown. And I wasn't really sure what to tell him. So I encourage you, please pass this ban. Please do something. Thank you. Next up, we have Robin Spencer. And I'm just gonna list a lot of people. You can please start coming up. Robin Spencer, Joyce Summer. Jonathan Margolatash, uh, Dan, Danrea Meganson, Barbara Pinto, Melissa Peterman, Danny Avitia, and Marlon Mansour. You do have time seated to you, Robin. They can please raise your hand. Uh, Gianna Wallace, thank you. Lori Madigan, Madigan, thank you. And Trisha Moore, Trisha Moore. She, uh, so she ceded to EBA, so we felt it wasn't oh. fair to double dip. That is correct. Thank you very much for your honesty. Oh. It is three minutes. Please proceed. 
All right, great. My name is Robin Spencer. I am a widowed mother of a 15-year-old son. I am a proud business owner and resident in East Village, which is that largest community, Mr. Whitburn, as you know, in downtown. Um, today, I'm here representing the East Village Residents Group. Um, I am pitch hitting for our president, so I apologize if I'm a little all over the board and emotional. He did give me some points to follow, but I have a few updates today. The first thing we wanted to do is thank you, uh, Councilman Whitburn, and also the mayor for really stepping forward and putting this ordinance ahead of all kinds of things, right? It's really doing something significant, we feel, in an advancement with unhoused solutions. I remember when we were at land use, they asked us to come together with both the plans. The ordinance cannot be an enforcement mechanism unless you have some place to move people and that structure in place. Today, I was very impressed by the presentation, and I feel many people miss that. Yes, it's about numbers. I don't feel it's about being political. We don't feel that we should be right um, dehumanized or villainized as actual residents that live there. We just want to work together to make a change, and somehow we need that structure. We feel here at the residents group that that ordinance is going to provide some of that structure and format once we get the right side together with all of our safe camping sites and places to sleep that you can put two and two together. The two must go together, and we are sure that they will work. Most importantly, what's happening in our streets must change. You've heard it all today. I won't repeat it. But the education corridor, it stretches from that transportation hub that's on commercial all the way up to Roosevelt Middle School here in East Village. When we ask for the two blocks, it's not because we don't want to see the homeless or we don't want the kids to see it. We all know it exists. It is an amazing problem here in the United States overall, not just San Diego. But what we're asking for is not to have to step over or around tents that aren't just tents popped up nice and neat succinctly, but they go across the entire sidewalk. These people have gathered couches and sofas and barbecue grills. They're connecting tents together and making their own apartment buildings right on the very sidewalk that we need to walk on. What we're asking for is this ordinance to help curtail that. The ordinance is a one, two, three step. We're not criminalizing anyone. We're asking you to please move on and to be in another space, to accept the help that our police department is gonna offer you in this one, two, three step. I think that these safe sleeping sites are providing a safe respite for those that we all want to succeed. And your yes vote today will help that change. We must change. Everybody hates change, but we must do it. It strikes a balance between addressing the concerns arising from unsafe camping practices and really does provide some compassionate support to individuals when we look at what's been created today. And what I trust in all of you council members as you have voted to build the housing and continue to help the plight. We hope that you vote yes today Thank and you. believe in the solutions you've provided. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Joyce Summer, after Joyce, it's Jonathan and Daria, Donria, and Barbara Pinto. You'll have one minute. Joyce, please. Thank proceed. you. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. I'm Joyce Summer, an active downtown resident for the past 30 years and currently a board member of the Downtown Partnership. I support the ordinance that Council Member Whitburn has introduced and thank both him and the mayor for their support of it. It's a great start at making our streets and sidewalks safe for everyone. Along with it is a plan to have two safe sleeping sites for downtown's unhoused with the services that they very much need. Sleeping on sidewalks and tents is no way to live. There's a danger of spreading hep A, an infestation of rats, as the city of Nashville recently experienced. To avoid this, sidewalks need to be clear and cleaned regularly. It's also important that downtown residents, those with ADA issues, businesses and visitors all have a safe place to live and enjoy. Please join me in support of this ordinance. Thank you very much. Next is Jonathan Morgaliash. Jonathan, are you in chambers? Donny Rea? Barbara Pinto? Barbara Pinto? Oh, thank you. Melissa Peterman? Danny Avithia, you have time ceded to you by Robert Hernandez. Francis Motiwala would also like to cede my minute to Danny. Uh, what was your name? Francis Yasmin Motiwala. Thank you. Is Robert Hernandez here too? All right, you'll have three minutes. 
Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Danny Avitia, um, a educator and leadership consultant with San Diego State University. Um, I have to say, I'm sorry that we're here today. And I, I think this is a complete disgrace of a, uh, of a ordinance. I strongly oppose this ordinance. Uh, it fails to address the underlying causes causes of homelessness, the lack of su sufficient supportive and re supportive resources. This is an ill-conceived, misguided approach to addressing homelessness. And the people affected most by this ordinance will be the homeless individuals. So I'm sorry if I don't feel too bad about the homeowners and businesses. Um, people that are in the streets day in, day out. The other day, or a couple of months ago, I ran into someone who had passed away in the street. That's ridiculous. We have to do better. And I think imposing a ban doesn't help anybody. The lack of adequate resources and shelters is the major flaw in this, I believe. Um, additionally, I think the ordinance will not be, have the chance to even be enforced because of the legal challenges. We say that we're in compliance, but I don't believe so. I believe that's a translation of the law. Um, additionally, criminalizing homelessness, again, only exacerbates this issue. Uh, their cha these challenges prevent um, access to housing, employment, um, services. In addition, I fear for the lives of the individuals that do get locked up because of this ordinance, that do get misdemeanors because of this ordinance, because our jails are not safe. Our jails, as you guys know, people are dying in these jails, and how are you going to ensure their safety? In addition, I think fear and politicization of this issue is just ridiculous. I think using these fear tactics, the mayor has been using uh, these fear tactics and ha those are the politics of Trump and Republicans. So I have to say, I'm, I'm completely against this. In addition, as a studying sociologist, I study the way people make social change and the way people go about uh, affecting change at a larger level. Um, bans don't work. They never have. Psychologically speaking, people are against bans, obviously, because it goes against something and because it has a negative connotation to something that could have a positive outcome, positive solutions. Um, so I will say that this ban does nothing to help this solution. We need to reconsider this ordinance and prioritize comprehensive solutions such as affordable housing, mental health support, job training. And finally, I will say that I commend uh, Council Member Kent Lee and Councilmember Monica Montgomery for raising the issues, for making sure that the people are listened to and have someone to hear them. So thank you very much for, for being here, for um, you know, challenging the status quo. Let's just not rubber stamp this. And finally, I know you're gonna say it's a hard decision, but this is not a hard decision. Thank you very much. Next is Marlon Mansour. Mansour. Good evening, Council President, Council Members. I am Marlon Mansour, President of the Neighborhood Market Association, a nonprofit trade association representing over 650 small businesses, many of which are here in San Diego. We strongly support the unsafe camping ordinance as it promotes public safety while also balancing individual rights. San Diego County has seen an increase of 22% in our homeless population in just the past year. Many local retail stores in the community have been struggling to keep their businesses alive as unhoused individuals continue to loiter, place their encampments around retailer businesses, and commit theft as means of survival. This activity has brought fear of safety for customers and employees and negatively impacts our local community. While this does not single-handedly solve the crisis, do not let perfect be the enemy of progress. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next we have Flower Alvarez Lopez, Casey Kennedy, Catherine Rhodes, Nena Okuagu, my apologies for any mispronunciations, Mare Mesa, Connie Zuniga. If any of these people are here, please come up to the podium. Greg Bickle, please come up to the front row. Jeffrey Allen. Steve Binder, Abner Figueroa. Flower, are you here? Okay, Casey Kennedy. Casey Kennedy, are you here? I mean, obviously, if you're not. 
Oh, we will get to the online. Catherine Rhodes, please come up. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and I wanted to mention again, if you have this ordinance, you're going to move um, all the people from Hillcrest and downtown to the coastal zone. Here is the coastal zone, Joe LaCava. It's going into Cardinal Valley, La Jolla, Pacific Beach, Mission Beach, Ocean Beach, Point Loma, and then Fort Vivian Moreno. It's going to go to Barrio Logan and Nestor, all in the coastal zone. The Coastal Commission is not going to allow, allow you to do that. You guys destroyed 10,000 single-family uh, SROs in the downtown project area without replacement units and without relocation expenses. This is, I, I want to cuss at you guys. You guys are so cruel. You're so mean. I can't believe you're doing this. I am so upset about this. Who do you think you are? Really, it's creepy. You guys are all, all creeps. Stop doing this. Next is Nena Okuagu, Mari Mesa, Mari Mesa, Connie Zuniga, please come up, Connie. Is Mari here? Are you Mari? We'll come right back to you. Thank you. The need for the ordinance before you today is desperately needed in the District 8 community, the Sherman Heights, Slogan Heights, and the surrounding areas. The community has nine schools and numerous child care centers with a population of thousands of children. Three schools have borne the brunt of the homeless, Perkins Elementary and Our Lady School, both north and south campuses. Incidents with the homeless at these schools is commonplace and puts children in harm's way. The low-income housing on Commercial Street has a total of 525 households, 70 of which are seniors. There is also a high school for unmarried mothers, child care, and a medical clinic. The homeless have found a way to get into the facility. Cars in the parking garage have been vandalized dozens of times. 57 bikes in a locked area were stolen. The residents leave for work in the morning with homeless men sleeping inside the compound. The children are prisoners in their homes. They cannot go outside because it is too dangerous. It is also dangerous for the adults. Thank you for that concluding comment. My apologies, the time has expired. If you have additional comments, you can give them to Mr. Biagi. Mario Mesa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mari Mesa. Basically, um, in regards to homeless encampments, they're very unsafe. Uh, there's been uh, park rangers have found guns, um, knives. Uh, there was a completely naked man walking around a park next to an elementary school, which he was arrested for indecent exposure. Um, they're very, very much unsafe. There's a lot of criminal activity going on and so forth. So um, what else? In terms of nonprofits, please wake up, okay? Uh, some of those nonprofits, there's uh, one nonprofit that hands out pipes in Skid Row in Los Angeles with an $11 million contract a year. And that's all, just uh, please uh, help these people that need help. And, and, with a dig, and a, with dignity and respect, but we just have a different way of running things. Thank you so for that. So it's not political, this is a public safety issue. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Greg Bickle? Greg Bickle? Jeffrey Allen? Jeffrey? Are you Greg Bickle? No, Jeffrey Allen? Steve Binder? Abner Figueroa, if we can also have Lori Saldana, Arkin Somo, Sunita Shailam, Doug Lister, and Consuelo start coming up to the front. Please begin. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Abner Figueroa. I'm a small business owner here in the downtown San Diego district. I'm also a board member at the downtown San Diego partnership and uh, I am uh, on a daily basis impacted by this homeless crisis. 
Um, my brother is a recovered addict and, uh, and a recovered homeless person, so also personally affected in that, in that, uh, in that aspect. Um, but my brother said something to me that stuck with me. Um, he said, my rights end when I start affecting my fellow peers. I think uh, in this situation, um, as a father, I, I bring my daughter to work, and we see on this next picture, uh, I can say more than five times last month. Thank you. Please support this measure. Thank you. Next is Lori Saldana. You have time ceded to you by Sim Arnold. Sim Arnold, are you here? Thank you. You'll have two minutes. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, on the previous item, some of the most comprehensive discussion of homelessness services that we've maybe ever had before this council. And it's a shame that it's taken this uh, crisis situation to get us to this point of discussing what's available, who is it that's eligible for these services. Um, when we have a public health threat, we don't send in police. We send in caseworkers and social workers and public health nurses. When we have wildfires, if you're that concerned about the fire situation, I hope that means you're going to vote against any more transmission lines for SDG&E, because they've caused fires that killed countless people and destroyed thousands of, of homes. So I hope you're consistent when we get to that point. If you're concerned about sexual assault and, and other crimes on the street, test every sexual assault kit, put in more public lighting, put in street lights, just be consistent. If you're going to be calling this, or the mayor's calling it, public safety, public health, fire safety issues. If you're going to make signs at public expense, identify who's paying for those signs. If you're going to show up at events to promote this and you have your own political propaganda, I think that you need to disclose who is paying for those signs. Mr. Whitburn, you had one of those at your news conference with the mayor. And finally, if you're going to come and take 15 minutes to have hotel workers speak to a public issue, then you have to disclose how much money you have given to every single council member and the mayor and the city attorney. I think it's the least that the hoteliers can do and the other folks. And Ms. Campbell, you've received a lot of money because these hotels are on public tidelands. These are contracts that they will come before you to get. So the dynamics, the social economic dynamics are clearly at play here. Be consistent if this is about safety, take the steps for safety, sanitation, provide bathrooms and other things. Thank Our you. Our next speaker is Arkan Somo. Uh, good evening, Council President, uh, Council Members. You know me as a part of the Neighborhood Market Association family, but today I would like to speak to you as a family-owned businesses. My extended family-owned businesses all over the city. I personally have been operating for over 20 years. My extended family over 40 years. I do not envy you. This is really a difficult issue. It's very complicated. But most reasonable people would say this is not a perfect ordinance. And most reasonable people would say, but it's a good step in the right direction. And that's why I urge you to vote for it and that. And I'm gonna tell you one story about safety, the hardcore of this ordinance. Sorry. District 9, City Height, down the, re, down the street by the creek, there are two gas stations. Last year, there were two major fires. Thank God for our San Diego PD who came, evacuated everyone, and thank God for our fire department. If we're talking about community safety, let's talk about every community, every member of the community. Thank you for that just single one of them. Your time has Thank expired. you for your time. Sunita Shailam. And then next we should have Doug Lister, Consuelo, Mary Soriano, Joy Banks, Randy Williams, Andrea Guerrero, Mark Schmidt, Sammy Messi, and Monica Ball up at the front row, please. You'll have one minute, please proceed. Thanks. We the people have entrusted our leadership to create a win-win collaborative solution to all parties. It's important to prioritize safety. Um, there's been theft, assaults, even upon myself, harassment, um, and even murder of one of my friend's uh, relatives. Uh, it's important to enforce the existing law uh, encampments are 
already illegal in California, and it is the responsibility of our leadership to enforce this for the protection of the greater good. It's important to do this methodically and strategically, to prioritize children, elderly, seriously ill, and those who are working. Find work programs to uh, integrate. This is one piece of a bigger puzzle. To find um, work for people and have shared responsibility and provide locations with basic necessities, toilet food, heat, and low-cost lo lockers. This Your does not have to be an all-or-nothing situation. Thank you so much. You Thank guys you. are awesome. Doug Lister. Good evening, Council President and members of the City Council. My name is Doug Lister and I am President of the Rolanda Community Council. However, I'm speaking on my own behalf this evening. Uh, I am in favor of Council Member Whitburn's proposal. I understand that in the short term, it may affect neighborhoods like mine detrimentally as the homeless will, the unsheltered will get pushed out into our neighborhood. However, doing nothing will affect the city detrimentally forever. This doesn't criminalize homelessness, as many people here state. It won't even be in effect when there is not shelter space available. Those people who choose to live on the streets will still be able to do so. They'll just have to do so in specially designated areas. However, without blocking the sidewalk. This is just one more tool, along with the CARES Court, to work towards a very difficult solution. We have certain rights and responsibilities. Their right to live on the street should not outweigh others to move freely. Thank, Thank you. you. Next we have Consuelo. Consuelo, you have time ceded to you by Sammy. Sammy, please raise your hand. Um, Sammy is no longer here. Sammy, you'll have one minute then. Many here keep saying how none of what is how none of what this government is doing makes any sense. It makes total sense to the ones paying close attention to what these bought off politicians are doing. This is all deliberate. The system is perfectly flawed and broken. They don't work for the people. I wish the people would get that by now. What's really happening is that all of these things they are doing is to be able to easily implement the United Nations Agenda 2030. They are doing all they can to keep us all divided, divide and conquer. Yet the people continue to have faith in these political puppets. Reminder, they will never ever do the right thing. Government, they create the chaos to appear as the heroes. Get involved, San Diego. There is a pattern here. When you start paying close attention, you will, you will in fact understand what is happening, why they are doing what they are doing. Everything they are doing is purposeful. The power of the people is greater than the people in power. Government has done enough destruction. Thank you. Next, Monica Ball. Monica Ball, Jamie Ralph, Blair Beekman, Bruce Gregory, Sammy Messi. Are any of these people here? Mark Schmidt, please come up. You have time ceded to you by Sean Schmidt. You'll have two minutes, please proceed. Well, thank you, Councilmember Whitburn and Mayor Gloria for this initiative, which I support. I grew up in San Diego, and as a kid, I've never seen anything, I mean, I never saw anything like this. But anyways, we do have a moral responsibility to help the homeless. And I, I truly recommend everybody see this documentary, Seattle is Dying. It's, it was done by a news organization, um, and, and it shows the tragedy of homelessness like San Diego has. And by the end of this documentary, so, 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 solutions on how to take care of this terrible problem. You know, the program was started by five women and it was, it's right now it's being used by the city of Providence in Rhode Island. And the program has 90% success rate and overdoses have decreased by 65%. And there's just a lot less people homeless there in that city of uh, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So um, their solution works through medical medication, counseling and enforcement and without those three things, you know, to cure the problem, I mean, that's what you gotta do is, 
you know, please, you know, we need to help cure the problem. I, I didn't know how much time I have, so it looks like um, I do want to, you know, with our 90%, when I heard 90% occupancy in the shelters, I mean, that's a no-brainer. If you're full, you need more shelters. You know, and safety is number one for everybody, including the homeless and, you know, every citizen. I mean, I have people that visit me from, you know, from over the, you know, different parts of the world, and they, they're just shocked what they see over here. So, and I do support a council member Campilla's idea of, you know, if somebody needs housing assistance, which is $300 or less, that's a no-brainer. Come on. I mean, yeah, a shelter costs 2000 a month from what I heard. And also I heard that the, the assistance there for um, family unification, sounds like we got a low budget on that. Why not spend more on that to help people get unified with their family? So um, please vote yes on this. We, we really need it. And thank you, uh, Councilmember Whitburn and Mayor Gloria. Mary Soriano. Mary Soriano, today we hear about lack of housing, and yet this ordinance does put that forward, lack of housing, so we add housing. But what I ask you is to also continue with the safety of the homelessness within these housings, like maybe background checks on the Chelsea Law. I saw Golden Hill has the first floor where there's men, second floor, families, with children. I think that needs to also be looked at as you deliberate and hopefully move forward with this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Joy Banks. Please proceed when ready. Hello, thank you, Council President and all you members of our public servants, all of you. Thank you for having us and hearing us um, with all due respect. Um, I'm in opposition to, I'm here on behalf of the souls that are out there. There's people that are dying. There's people that are sick. There's people I hear a lot of them. I've heard a lot of them all day. And that, that's real hard for me to digest, you know, because I don't see anyone in this room as any more important than any soul that's out there. And um, I know it's been really hard to try to find solutions, but there's solutions. You know, we keep throwing all this money. I, I, I wrote this thing. I, we keep throwing all this money. Uh, to, uh, com people are complaining about the, gar the trash and the garbage and the feces. Um, One concluding you remark, nowhere. your time has expired. Please help. This doesn't work. I have lived experience. Love you. Thanks. Thank you. Randy Williams. Uh, Randy Williams, I'd like to add my voice to others in complimenting the mayor and uh, Councilmember Whitburn for putting forth a, an initiative to tackle a very difficult and sensitive uh, uh, issue. I'd also like to encourage the council to continue to prioritize uh, this issue. Uh, it generates debates as we've seen, but it's important and it's nonpartisan. For those on the street and all those that are concerned about it, I'm confident this elected body can solve the problem by putting forth initiatives such as this and others uh, for public input public scrutiny and for moving forward. I commend you for what you're attempting to resolve tonight in such a in such a manner, and may San Diego be better because of it. Next is Andrea Guerrero. Andrea Guerrero, are you in chambers? Good evening, I know it's been a long night. I appreciate your attention on this matter. I'm uh, the executive director of Alliance San Diego. We are located at 16th and Newton. We are at the epicenter of the area that you, has been the focus of tonight. I encourage you to start with dignity in your policy conversations. Think about the dignity of the people who are most affected, the homeless individuals who we call our neighbors. You have to decide 
where people are going to go. That's the crux of the issue before you tonight. We all understand that encampments are not what we want. We all understand that shelter is in short supply. And so we have to consider what the impact of this ban is gonna be because we either need the shelter to work or we need another solution. The criminalization is a status crime, is not something that we wanna do that does not honor and respect the Thank dignity. Thank you for that concluding statement. Sammy Messi, Sammy Messi, Monica Ball. Monica Ball, are you in chambers? Jamie Ralph. Good evening. Uh, with respect to everybody's time, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I am a lifelong San Diego resident and also work in the downtown area. Uh, it, I'm also a father trying to raise a family in this city. Uh, it's disheartening to see the conditions throughout the downtown area, and it's becoming increasingly unsanitary and unsafe. Although I don't think there is any perfect solution to this complicated and layered matter, I honestly think this ordinance is a great start. So I urge you all to vote yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Blair Beekman. And then our final speaker in chambers is Bruce Gregory. Hi, Blair Beekman, nice to finally be here in person. Uh, to continue my previous public comment of addressing our current fears, I hope we are working on safe storage and how to better house the belongings of people when encampments are ended and that when uh, that we work to be sure city government will give at least 10 to 14 day warnings to encampments before you'll ask for their end. And that when dismantling the camp, uh, you respect the ideas of a special pert like unit and ideas are reimagined to officially navigate and better help navigate or better help navigate the process as police alone simply may over heighten the situation with, and with explosive wrong decisions during the dismantling process. This is simply a time of better communication and trust for all of us. To conclude, I hope you can work ideas of bringing together all parts of local neighborhoods and to map out together what can be good places for local government encampments. It can help avoid isolation and nimbyism. Thanks. Bruce Gregory. Hmm. I haven't been here for a while. My name is Bruce Gregory. Um, I got up this morning and I was uh, listening to the radio news and it was talking about this big uh, city council meeting. I said, okay, I see what it was about. So I got the info and it caught my interest. After all, I've been an advocate in San Diego since the 1990s. Wow, that's a long time. I can see one thing, we're getting Gray and gray. Hey, um, I have two or three points that I want to emphasize. I only got about uh, 20 seconds. The ban that you're about to vote on, um, I consider it an outrage. Please don't pass this ban. We need to go back to the table. My second point is public and property. If I'm not mistaken, Balboa Park if not for the mayor's office or the city council office, it's for Great. everybody. I just Your time has concluded, sure. sir. And my last statement is that um, public property is not only for groups of special Thank interests, it is for everybody. Thank you for that concluding statement. Thank you. And Bruce everybody Higgins. Have a good day. Bruce Higgins. My name is Bruce Higgins. I'm a founding partner of a group called Old Farts with Hearts. We feed the homeless in the East Village every week. This ordinance is punitive. It is, looks like the city council and mayor are trying to cover themselves by showing the voters that they are doing something because they have wasted the first two and a half years since the election and the homeless population has exploded. 
Please don't make the homeless pay for your mistakes. Vote no. Thank you. Before we go to those that are participating virtually, I just want to give one more opportunity for any of those who may have not heard their name or were in an overflow room. Quickly, if you do hear your name, please come up to the front so that we can hear your comments. I know that some of you have already told me that some of these individuals have left, but I just have them in one pile. So Monica Ball, Sam Messi, Steve Binder, Jeffrey Allen, Greg Bickle, Nena Okuagu, Casey Kennedy, Flower Alvarez Lopez, Barbara Pinto, Melissa Peterman, Danny Rea Mag Magnison, Jonathan Margo Lyash, Eric Nemechek, he did speak, Michael Trimble, Fernando Hernandez, Bruce Carbone, Paige Bertson, Dr. Denisha Jenkins, Marco Lamandri, Steve Galasso, Micah Parzen, Michael Robertson, Willie Lanz, Lizzie Broughton, Marcia Bookstein, Jessica Goldrum, Eskari Abdul Muntakin, Carrera Christopher, Khalid Alexander, Dennis Larkin, Roger Casares, Maria Hungate, Tina Kafka, Host Hostina Kaufman, Cassie Stevenson, Yolanda Meneses, Sarah Guzman, Jose Lopez, Tim Schneider, Marcela Bothwell, Michelle Woodson, Stella Lynn, Zulema Guardado, Hostina Kaufman, Jason Mitchell. None of these are present. That does conclude public comment in chambers. We will now go to those participating remotely. I have started the five minute timer. Please note that once the five minute timer expires, no other speakers with their hands up will be taken. We currently have 42 speakers in the virtual queue, starting with Angel SDTU. Angel just lowered his hand. If you can please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. You'll have one minute. Hi, I'm from District 8. I'm in a San Diego Tenants Union member. Um, I want to urge this council to reject this immoral encampment. Um, others have already done a pretty good job to explain about how um, it's an immoral thing to do, how um, there's no real, real humanitarian aspect to this, and even the legal repercussions of enacting such a ban. Um, but even for the most cynical actors pushing this ban, you know, this, we know that this will backfire. Um, and it is disappointing that so much energy is being used to push this ban forward and not towards actual substantive plan. Um, but of course, this is par for the course following other half measures regarding our housing and houselessness crisis, such as the Tenant Protection Ordinance. Um, so we're asking folks to do something real for the 11,000 houseless students in San Diego Unified School District um, and for everyone else who's going to be affected by this. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, we, sir. No, no, Sean, this is bullshit. Just like y'all, bullshit. This whole plan is bullshit. You can call in, Rafael, you can call in. Man, really? I'm yeah, here. Yeah, you can. I, I'm no, here those are the, those, in front of you. Yeah, those are the rules. Those are the rules. We've it's already gotten. It's relevant. Y'all already have you, this done. The first it's warning. It's probably going to be a 5-4 vote. Yeah. We, all know the, we all know the plan. Yeah, we all know the plan. Come on. This is a, this is a war on the working class. You kick us out of our homes, you let Rafael, people gouge us your, and exploit the, us, the warning. and then you kick us out into the street. And then when we're in the streets, you force the fucking pigs on us. And you all know this. It's a war on the working class. Let's recognize it for what it is. Going with our next speaker, Don Rosen. Don Rosen, please unmute yourself. This is Don Rosen, an ACE member leader in District 2. Who are you targeting? The thousands of unsheltered, the seniors, the disabled, children, veterans, who would now be considered public safety threats? You can't guarantee them shelter beds, but you can give them the ultimatum of jail. 
There are more than 11,000 homeless students across San Diego, exceeding the number of available shelter beds right now. The current economic climate in particular, inflation is eroding confidence, especially with our seniors, disabled and fixed and very low income who have ended up in crisis through no fault of their own. They see the homelessness and are in constant fear of similar fate. And now the added terror of being criminalized for being put into the street for things like sub unnecessary substantial renovations. A declining confidence of this magnitude shows a breakdown in faith in you, our public servants. You must humanize, not criminalize because homelessness in San Diego is a humanitarian crisis. Please act now before civil unrest in San Diego becomes uncontrollable. This is Your time has expired. Thank you for your comments. Next is Janie Emerson. If you can please unmute. Janie Emerson, there you go. Good evening. This is Janie Emerson. I'm president of the La Jolla Shores Association and a founding member of the Coastal Coalition. I support the proposed unsafe camping ordinance. It is a great step forward to deal with homelessness. Our concern is that it will only be successful with robust and consistent enforcement throughout San Diego. All areas need to have enforcement so that the issue does not simply migrate from one area to another. The coastal areas are particularly vulnerable. This great resource for our citizens and visitors needs to be protected. This ordinance is a vital first step. We thank Mayor Gloria and Council Member Whitburn for proposing this creative new ordinance. Please vote yes on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for the public, the five minute timer is about to expire. It has 15 seconds left. Please be sure to raise your hand if you want to speak on this item before that timer dings. We currently have 51 speakers in the comment if you can please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thanks. So I'd like to voice my opposition on this because as shown um, in the shelter strategy that was presented earlier, solutions for homelessness take time. And there's no benefit to criminalizing folks when there's a deficit in resources, which has been recognized by the city of San Diego and council members numerous times today. The criminalization leads to more barriers for folks to finding housing, which furthers the problem. Many people experiencing homelessness are also experiencing mental health and substance use disorders. And you can't force folks experiencing these challenges into your preferred sheltering strategies by banning encampments. Visible signage, 24-hour notice, that does nothing for any somebody who's in active psychosis. Criminalization simply further isolates folks from the community for the sake of appearances. As stated earlier, this ban demonstrates a lack of serious resolve to end homelessness. While the city's environment and individual safety should be protected, criminalization is not the answer, and people in support of this ordinance have stated today that they know that this is not a solution to homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Brenda, Brenda Keller. Hi. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, Brendan Keller, uh, District 3. Uh, I'm a first-time homeowner. I'm in my 30s, and I absolutely support this, um, both ordinances. I think they're great solutions, and I thank the mayor for this. Um, and the reason why I support this is I've just seen the homeless situation, you know, the, it's this is not just about aesthetics. This is about actual, like, issues in my neighborhood. I've been basically, like, threatened with violence twice already by homeless people. I've had homeless people just take up an entire sidewalk with a bunch of trash everywhere, all right? I've had, I have homeless tents right now that I'm looking at, they're taking up the whole pathway, okay? No one with like a stroller or wheelchair could go through there. Um, you know, and just basically, this is not just about it being a blight. This is about, you know, actually functionally it being an issue, right? We get vandalism, we get people walking around naked, people masturbating. We need to do something about this. So please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Patricia Fillet. You can please unmute yourself. Thank you, City Council members. Patricia Fillet, formerly District 3 and now District 2, support the Mayor Mr. Whitburn's proposal to ban unsafe camping from sensitive areas. The San Diego River, Presidio Park, the MTS, the new tribal state park called the Land of the First Peoples, are experiencing fires, homicides, physical and sexual assaults, canine stabbings twice, encampments, a burned body, overdoses, and more within the last year. This is a public health and safety crisis on the verge of another health break. 
and more deaths. There are no easy answers to finding an overnight solution. Debating any further to make progress continues to compound the public health and safety for everyone in this city. You, our city council, whom we voted, must now make tough choices to no longer ignore what's happening in our neighborhoods, communities, our city, our humanity. Adopt and modify this proposal. Create the transition bridges to shelter with a link to the next steps of supportive services and housing. And let the healing begin for the unhoused and the return of clean and safe principles forward for all neighborhoods and communities to thrive. If you need a model template, see the send Your time has this. expired, ma'am. You can send any further comments to city clerk at sandigo.gov. John Stump, please proceed. John Stump, if you can please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. The city charter and all of our governments are organized for the benefit, it says this specifically, of the inhabitants or people. There's no mention of uh, tourism or uh, businesses or uh, civic organizations or museums. It's organized for people. This is a class uh, fight. The what's wrong is we're categorizing all those people without money as homeless. And what we should be doing is taking care of them as individuals. How would you feel if we called everybody gay or queer, Mexican or colored? You need to amend this ordinance to address people as individuals and your human time beings. has expired sir thank you for your comments paul turkin my name is paul turkin i'm a resident of d9 and i'm an attorney as many speakers have pointed out tonight and as the memo from the city attorney said last month um, the ordinance as currently um, constituted definitely does not pass the test enumerated in Martin v. Boise. You're not going to be able to enforce it. If you try to enforce it, we're going to litigate it. It's going to cost you a lot of money and you're going to lose. Um, this is just a political stunt. Um, it's not a solution. Go back to the 2019 action plan get something done, and do not move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have is Lydia Morales. If you can please unmute yourself. Lydia Morales, you can please unmute. Thank you. You are unmuted. Maybe the device that you're speaking into is still muted because we do not hear you here in chambers. If you can please unmute maybe the device that you're speaking into. You've muted yourself again. We will come back to you. Anjali Hoyos. Thank you. Good evening, Council President Eva Rivera and council members. My name is Anjali Hoyos representing the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. The homelessness and housing affordability crises continue to negatively impact hardworking families, and the economic well-being of our region. The proposed ordinance addresses the public health and safety issues that all San Diegans are facing, and we appreciate the city for accompanying this with a strategy to expand shelter options and supportive services for our unsheltered neighbors as efficiently as possible. Solving the homelessness crisis needs implementation, not only between city departments, but from all cities and the county to consider shelter, permanent supportive, and housing solutions as well. Please support item 613 and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is phone number ending in 4353. 4353, please unmute, star six. Phone number ending in 4353. You can please unmute yourself. You've lowered your hand. Emily Olenoff, if you can please unmute. Thank you for the time. I'm calling in opposition to this cruel and unusual punishment. Poverty is not a crime and jail is not housing. We must keep the cops away from the unhoused. 
A report from April 23 said that blacks are only 5% of the city population, yet cops use 27% of force against them. San Diego PD Captain Jeff Jordan explained that statistic because force is used more often in the East Village related to homelessness than in any other part of the city. And the majority of homeless are black. So they're very clearly admitting that they're willing to use force against homeless people. Compassion and training is a lie. San Diego PD promised to improve this in 2020, and it's only gotten worse since then. We should not have the police interacting with the unhoused. If council approves this, you support violence against our most vulnerable members of society. I urge you to oppose this encampment ban and look up Finland housing first for true solution. Thank you, your time has expired. Next is Kathleen Hallahan. You can please unmute. As this is Kathleen Hallahan, I live in East Village. A silver bullet solution for homelessness will never come before you. The depression and anxiety of the unsheltered, the filth that many times surrounds their tents and the proliferation of dangerous drug use and the struggles of the mentally ill are in full display in my neighborhood in East Village and the surrounding neighborhoods. It is a constant, profound, and deeply troubling reminder of the many failings of our society and the misery of those on the streets. But it is not right to impose this burden of witness daily on the young students who are just trying to make their way to school. At the very least, please prohibit encampments near schools now. Thank you so much for all your work. Next is Viet Vote. Viet Vote, if you can please unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, my name is Zhang Wei. I am the managing director for um, an organization here called Big Low. Um, our organization uh, opposed the item. I'm struggling with the name of the ordinance because it's a PR move to mask what it really is, is to ban the homeless. And the question is why the city is wasting everyone time today and numerous hours talking about something that we talk about how or if we should criminalize the homeless or not. Now, the issue that if you worry about, you know, public health, then propose solution to do that. You can propose strategy on moving people off the street to temporarily to clean up the street or provide the public bathroom at the Planned Parenthood folks have been asking for, but you don't. In fact, you want to criminalize people. And I think we should come up with a solution instead of like creating law to criminalize the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, it will go back to Lydia Morales. See if you can unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself one more time. You are unmuted in Zoom, but we do not hear you in chambers. I'm not sure if the device you're speaking into is still muted. I have written down your name. If you'd like to try to re-enter re the system, you can raise your hand. I will be sure to call on you. Nick will, next, we'll go to Jacob Weatherby. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, um, good evening, Council. I am speaking in opposition to this ordinance. For generation, we as a nation have used our broken criminal justice system to throw those struggling financially in jail in an attempt to hide our poverty problem behind bars where it's out of sight. We are living with results of that political mindset. This ordinance will just add on to the many other policies that have been made on the local, county, state, and federal level that have been attempted to criminalize those who are struggling. We should be trying to provide opportunities to improve the quality of life for everyone. Instead of punishing those who are struggling to make it in a tilted economic game that favors the well-off and well-connected, it is not right to criminalize those who are struggling. If you continue to serve your wealthy campaign contributors instead of the people, then these problems will get worse. I also want to say to the San Diego County Democratic Party that if you endorse any of these members that vote yes, then you are sending a message to voters that you are okay with politicians that criminalize the homeless, are open to using police brutality as a tool in order to please the wealthy, luxurious housing Your time housing has expired. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Darwin Fishman, if you can please unmute.
Good evening, it's Darwin Fishman, he, him, his, with the Racial Justice Coalition in San Diego. And I just wanted to share that I understand folks' concern about safety and security. But when you talk about the on house community, short of having the police shoot them or beat them out of your way, they're not leaving. You have to find some other way to deal with this problem. It's not going to be through law enforcement. It's a cruel and vicious way to deal with it. Have special teams of counselors and social works. We already know what it means to use the police and law enforcement to solve this problem. When I was on the Community Review Board and Police Practices, our executive director, Charmaine Mosley, would stamp the complaints from homeless, stamp it homeless on it, toss it out. We had a spike of complaints from people that were on house that were getting abused by the police, physically moved, physically beaten. That's what you're going to have. Blood on your hands if you pass this because you're allowing law enforcement to beat people. It's your time horrible. has concluded, sir. Thank you for your comments. Andrea Hetheru, please unmute. I'm here. While I do not believe that our police department has the person power to enforce the ordinance banning encampment in public spaces in all nine districts, in principle, I do fully support the ordinance. As a foundational black American resident of District 4, I have long been aware of the far disproportionate rate of homelessness of black San Diegans. I hold, however, that there needs to be a balanced approach of offering resources along with enforcement. This ordinance, in principle, offers the enforcement half of that balance and does so compassionately. At times, negative consequences are needed as an incentive for persons to seek the help that is offered in order for them to be as self-sufficient as they are capable and to protect other residents, especially black residents such as myself, from the physical men and mental health hazards that urine, feces, and food waste of encampments pose on, on the streets around us. I am a witness to the excellent work that the Neighborhood Policing Division does on homelessness when adequately staffed. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kiara O'Laughlin. Please unmute. Kiara O'Laughlin. There you go. Hi, City Council members. I'm Carol Laughlin, a researcher and policy advocate with the Center on Policy Initiatives. I'm here to express our anger with the proposed ordinance that dehumanizes and criminalizes the homeless community in San Diego. The ban will push unhoused people who are already vulnerable and disproportionately foster youth, elderly, people of color, LGBTQ people, veterans, and people suffering from mental illnesses into the shadows and ultimately out of the city and away from services. There aren't enough shelter beds to accommodate the 4,801 unsheltered community members, leaving them with no safe space to rest or sleep without fear of criminalization. Where are they supposed to go? Not only is this ordinance inhumane, it's also just poor policy. Research consistently shows that criminalizing unhoused individuals just for existing is ineffective and costly and wastes taxpayer money. Instead, proven housing first solutions like permanent supportive housing and other recommendations in the city's community action plan on homeless can actually get people housed and address the root causes of homelessness. Please vote no today on today's ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder to those entering the queue, the five minute timer has expired. There were 50 callers at the time that the timer expired. No new callers will be taken. Dan Schmikowski, please unmute yourself. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Um, where the rubber will meet the road. Um, there are nine people up there and there is one Lori Sodania and then myself. And we are the only 11 people that know what is really going on here. Uh, even John Stump doesn't know what's going on. But you know, Tom, Tom will tell you about uh, Mr. Kevin Faulkner and his good buddy, uh, the former chief. Well, they can ride their bike back to Cleveland where they belong because you know, the politics and public policy has run amok. And there are 10 people in this city who call the shots. One of them is the Padres owner, I know that. But I'll tell you what, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a big, fat, I'm, well, I'm not fat, but I'm a hypocrite because I support this. I will support this, but I tell you what, it's very, very, very dirty. Dirty all around. And um, that's all. Thank you. Next is Lily Way. Lily Way, if you can please unmute. There you go. Hi, my name is Lily Way. I'm an East Village resident. 
I would like to speak in support and very strong support of this ordinance. This ordinance is not making it illegal to be homeless. They have made it very clear that it won't even take effect unless there is adequate shelter space. With that said, with the opposition being there, saying that this is against the homeless people, this is actually helping the homeless people. You do not live there. You come and go. You don't see the predatory behavior of these individuals who are taking advantage of the actual unhoused people. There are drug dealers on the streets specifically targeting these mentally ill and substance abuse problem individuals that are unhoused. This will help them. This will help me. This will help my family. Thank you for your time. Next is Toronto. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, my name is Tama Becker Verano. I'm an organizer with Change Begins With Me. We have to be careful when we use public safety, uh, you know, in the name of public safety to pass certain laws. Everyone's safety is uplifted when we protect our most marginalized neighbors. This ordinance will exacerbate the very tangible harms people experiencing homelessness face when we ban them from areas providing their most basic needs, including nearby existing shelters. Our parks are everyone's parks. Our streets are everyone's streets. Our public restrooms are everyone's public restrooms. Also, this ordinance claims that no costs are associated with this action. Clearly, that is a false narrative. Even the city staff found it dubious. Indeed, resources from law enforcement and other city services will be directed to this effort. Resources that should be spent on increasing our permanent supportive housing. It is well documented that encampment bans ultimately cost cities more and are ineffective in addressing homelessness. We cannot criminalize our way out of this problem. Please focus on timely implementation of the community action plan. On Thank you, your time Thank has. You. Thank you, your time has expired. Next is Yusuf Miller. Yusuf Miller, activist San Diego. Um, by this ban, you'll be criminalizing now for beds that you plan in the future, when what they need is affordable housing. This ban, which will only exacerbate incarceration rates into the highest incarceration in custody death rate in the state, San Diego County. And who will be the most impacted by this over by this uh, bill? People who are overrepresented, the black community. Well, happy Juneteenth to us. San Diego blacks have the highest um, suspension rate. We have the lowest income rate. We have the highest homelessness rate. And now this, you are using defecation and needles as an excuse. But your planned sites are also near schools. You are not serious about safety. Of course, all of us, whether for or against the ban, want safety for our children. But you are just moving them from one school to near another, from one block to near another. We've already experienced Hefe and people living in encampments. But now when they when this happens, your time again, has concluded, sir. My apologies, your time has concluded. You can send additional comments to city clerk at San Diego.gov. Viani is our next speaker. Good evening, uh, my name is Diana Rubalcaba. I'm a resident of District 9 and I work in San Diego and I wanna express my opposition to this ordinance. We need to focus on housing first and harm reduction rather than criminalization. We need to listen to people who are homeless and the advocates who work directly with our homeless neighbors. We need to provide enough housing services and resources that keep people off our streets rather than criminalizing people for mental illness, addiction and simply existing. San Diego's working people pay up to 80% of their income on rent, while landlords like Blackstone get rich. Cost of living keeps going up, and now our most vulnerable neighbors with nowhere to go will be criminalized for existing instead of getting the help they need. How is that fair? I urge you to oppose this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Al Del Mastro. Al Del Mastro, if you can please, there you go. Yeah, how you doing? I, my name is Al Del Mastro, and uh, we have treated the homeless like uh, like an endangered species, or we have spoiled them, and we've trained them to be that way. They can go anywhere they want 
do take anything they want at any store without an end go defecate in your front yard without any kind of rep any kind of uh, reparation to them they can do whatever they want and uh you know you've pretty much this city council in the in the mirror has pretty much destroyed my wife and mine retirement we have uh, small duplexes in the claremont area and if you want, if you think housing first is going to work by giving somebody a house, that's going to cure it. You're paying half a million dollars per property or whatever for housing. Come and take over our houses. Go to the small landlords that you just destroyed, mom and pops, and take over their housing. Lease it from them for 10 years. That'll give them all housing. Thank you. Your time has concluded. Kelly McCormick, you're next. Hello, this is Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator. Thanks for raising this issue. Homelessness is an urgent matter. There's a key component that's been missing from the conversation and it's upstream prevention. Preventing homelessness begins long before an individual ends up on the streets. This does not apply to everyone who is homeless, but for some, there is a nexus between mental health, drug use and homelessness that cannot be ignored if we are to change the trajectory. There's a need for effective holistic drug use prevention strategies, including school-based parent and student education beginning when children are young, and community-based prevention focused on normalizing non-use. When drug use begins before age 25, there's a much greater likelihood of developing substance use disorder and negative mental health outcomes. Compassionate action must address the social determinants of health, accessible mental health care, drug use prevention, and accessible evidence-based drug use treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Anna Laura. Hi, my name is Anna Laura Martinez. I use she, they pronouns. Hello? Yes, please proceed. Okay. I use GD pronouns. I currently work in District 3 and have lived in District 8. I am a former case manager for a local organization that provides transitional housing for women. I urge the council to vote no on this dehumanizing and shameful ordinance. This policy punishes our neighbors who cannot afford a place to live and sleep. It is an extremely inhumane and cruel proposal that falsely claims to address the growing number of people who are unsheltered. Instead of addressing the systemic issues of housing, of resources for unsheltered people, Gloria and Whitburn wish to scapegoat and criminalize people People who are unsheltered. The growing number of unsheltered people is a reflection of failed leadership in the city of San Diego for not continually investing in the needed resources to humanely and effectively address, to, and address and prevent homelessness. The answer is not in criminalizing unsheltered people. Please vote no on this cruel ordinance. Thank you. Next speaker is Judy Strang. Judy Strang, please unmute. Good evening, City Council. Thank you for this conversation regarding solutions, potential solutions for our homelessness issue. I am uh, grateful and support this item. I was also appreciative of the previous item regarding comprehensive shelter strategies. I thought the questions asked by City Council for that item were pointed and showed a thoughtfulness regarding the citizens of each of your districts, and I thought the answers from staff were clear and comprehensive. I was impressed. However, I think that as we examine the situation behind homelessness, we must more clearly understand its association with mental health and substance use and put into place those things that would help our young people to move away from any drug choosing behavior and look carefully at the items in our environments that would encourage them in drug using behavior that only contributes to substance abuse and to mental health problems. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is Jeffrey Alonzo. Jeffrey, Alonzo, Cara. Hello, can, yes. can you hear me? Yes, okay, please cool. proceed. Thank you. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Jeffrey Alonzo Carajamujeto. I'm the organizing and political director at the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. The ACLU has joined with more than 60 local nonprofits to speak on behalf of and with the most vulnerable and disenfranchised residents of our city. 
We're here today to urge City Council to reject this draconian ordinance, which fails to meet the needs of thousands of San Diegans experiencing homelessness, fails to address the real issues facing our city, and falls far short of our shared values for an inclusive community that res respects the intrinsic worth of every individual. We urge you to invest instead in the effective housing first policies that support the health, safety, well-being, and constitutional rights of every San Diegan. Because we the people means all of us. Thank you for your time and careful consideration. Make the right choice. Next we have Deanna Pitts. Pitts. Good evening, council members. I'm Diana Pitts, Vice President of Public Affairs for the San Diego Padres. I'm here to register our support for this item, and I also want to commend Mayor Gloria and Councilmember Whitburn for their leadership on this challenging issue. The safety of our fans and employees is our top priority at Petco Park. This commitment extends beyond the footprint of the ballpark and encompasses the surrounding area as well. We believe that this ordinance, in conjunction with the mayor and council's recent actions to increase shelter beds, establish safe camping sites, prioritize prevention and build affordable housing creates a comprehensive approach that strikes a balance between addressing the public safety concerns being discussed here today while providing support for individuals experiencing homelessness. Together, these measures offer a path forward that recognizes the complex nature of the issue while working towards long-term solutions and a more equitable city. We ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Anna Man Manash. Anna Manash, if you can, Anne Manash, if you can please unmute. If you can please unmute. I will come back to you. Next is Claire Snyder. Claire Snyder. Please proceed, Claire. Hi, my name is Claire Snyder and I live in District 3. I'm a community organizer and a former program manager for a trans transitional living program for youth experiencing homelessness down in Chula Vista. I absolutely oppose this ordinance and I can't believe that this is your solution to homelessness, Councilmember Whitburn. Shutting out and removing some of the most vulnerable members of our community is not the solution. It will just move them further from supportive services and the community they so desperately need. People are and have been dying on the streets and homelessness is an issue, but your response is not to support them, it's to remove them so they can die outside of the city or in jails. If the city is actually concerned about public safety, then more accessible restrooms, more accessible public showers, more actual support, um, affordable housing, and more supportive services would be provided and not just removing people out here. So I urge you to vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dante Cano. Dante yeah, hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, say that. Uh, Sir, if you can yeah. just uh, actually speak from outside chamber so that there's not the echo, yeah, yeah. we will yeah, pause yeah, your timer. Apologize about that. Okay, I'm, I'm outside the chamber. Please proceed. Please proceed. We cannot hear you, sir. Is the device you're speaking into is muted? We cannot hear you. We'll come back to you if you can fix your technical difficulties. Diego Lynch, Diego Lynch, if you can please unmute. Diego Lynch, if you can please unmute. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hello, I'm calling today to speak in, against this ordinance. Um, in whether or not it's criminalizing the homeless, it's providing a further bevy of coercive mechanisms to control them. Um, homeless people are in great pain and they're suffering, and you can't intimidate someone who has nothing to lose. I would also implore the Council to think historically and I, I'm referencing the sites proposed in Balboa Park, the two parking lots with fences around them. Historically speaking, if you can think of any instance of an undesirable population being rounded up and concentrated behind fences with armed guards that has a happy ending, then maybe you can vote for this ordinance. Uh, but otherwise, 
I would implore you to look into your conscience, think historically, and vote against this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sharon Gill. Sharon Gill. Hello. Yes, please, please proceed. Please support the unsafe camping ordinance. We can't leave things the way they are. Our current homeless situation is not safe for anyone, whether they live in tents or homes. Passing this ordinance is the first step in helping those who suffer the most from our housing shortage, but it only deals with the symptoms. We will never have enough housing in San Diego until we deal with the cause of our housing shortage, which is discrimination. The only way to have enough housing for everyone is to build more multifamily housing, and yet our government regulations and zoning laws intentionally restrict the amount of multifamily housing that can be built in San Diego, because we've allowed NIMBYs to control our housing policy. We need to stop discriminating against the middle class, the working class, and the poor. We need to allow builders to build the housing that the majority of people want and need. Thank you, Mary, Mayor Gloria. Thank you, Council Member Whitburn. Thank you for your comments. We'll go to Matt Wallstrom. Matt Wallstrom, if you can, there you go. Yes, my name is Matt Wallstrom and I live in uh, Council Member Whitburn's district in Hillcrest. Make no mistake, voting to approve this policy would be admitting to failure. Failure not just to do your job, but failure to even bother trying. Our problems with homelessness are the direct result of our elected representatives' refusal to do the hard work needed to tackle the lack of affordable housing for everyone. And now you want to wash your hands of it by supplanting our society of all created equal with civil rights dependent on one's financial status. You disappeared the precarious before the law by approving the care courts, and now you want to physically disappear them from existing in public by calling it a camping ban. I would be ashamed for those of you who approve of what is being proposed, but that would require me to care more than you are capable of. But I will remember, and I will vote. Thank you. Next is Sparky Mitra. Sparky Mitra. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, I'm Sparky Mitra, a bioengineering student at UC San Diego, and I am speaking against this ordinance. To those who think this is a great start, I urge you to empathize with the unhoused. If you were homeless, would you think that this ordinance is a great start to addressing your plight? Would you think this increased uncertainty as a result of this ordinance would make your life easier? To those who think that the homeless people are more dangerous, check your facts, check your privilege, and check your classes in. It is well known that vulnerable populations like the homeless are not more prone to engage in criminal behaviors. To those who are saying that the intent of this ordinance is not to criminalize homeless people, think impact over intent. They are getting criminalized. Homeless people are not here today, but if you really believe that they would support this ordinance, call on them to speak in support rather than your moneyed friends. Your impact with this ordinance is one that does criminalize people who can't afford to be here today despite your intent. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Maddie, Patty Medina. Patty Medina. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Patty Medina. I am an ACE member leader. I am against this band. This homeless problem has been broken since 40 years ago. Then the mayor and the city council just passed the weakest tenant ordinance, putting more families on the streets. The anti-encampment ban add up more fear to the families getting evicted, becoming homeless with nowhere to go, no parks, no cars, no tents, no streets. Now families with the school children, mentally ill seniors will be criminals separating them and get lost in the system that they never come back to their own families. This is humane. This is a life and death situation. The crime, the crime will rise. It will result in more suicidal teens, adults, and seniors. You voted on a resolution declaring that housing is a human right. Implement and update the community action plan for homeless. Stop, listen, and go back and fix a more humane resolution for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Kathleen Lippitt. Good afternoon, Council. 
The state has trafficked on the myth that housing first is the solution. Large developers are more likely to be the true beneficiaries. It's not a housing problem, it's a failure to promote resilience and emotional health for children beginning in their earliest years. Re intervening and redirecting individuals that have incurred high risk behaviors that came about before becoming homeless. Public electeds are unlikely to get large campaign contributions for preventing drug abuse and mental health problems that it causes. Treating the underlying problems of substance abuse and mental illness must be a prerequisite to housing. Individuals with drug or alcohol addiction, mental health challenges, or both need rules, support, and structure. Long-term treatment, counseling, wraparound services, requirements for conditions or milestones of sobriety and compliance. Your time has expired, ma'am. Any additional comments can be emailed. Next, we'll go with Drew Mosier. Please unmute. Hi, my name is Drew Moser. I'm the executive director of the Lucky Duck Foundation. Our mission is to alleviate the suffering of homelessness throughout San Diego County. We believe no one should live on the streets. It's not safe or humane for anyone, period. And unfortunately, unsheltered homelessness has reached an all-time high and homeless deaths have also reached an all-time high with deaths tragically increasing more quickly than homelessness itself. Uh, so for these reasons and more, we support the unsafe, and cam unsafe camping ordinance proposed by Council Member Whitburn and Mayor Gloria. We see this as a way to move the city towards adding more immediately available beds to reduce homelessness and help our neighbors in need. And to be clear, we do not in any way, shape or form endorse the quote, criminalization of homelessness. Rather, we fully support our city's ability to connect our homeless neighbors to life-saving resources off the streets to reduce unsheltered homelessness. And we're prepared to uh, invest our philanthropic resources to help accelerate the effort to bring on more Thank resources. You, Thank you, your time has concluded. Todd Walters. Todd Walters, thank you. Yes, uh, good evening city council and thank you for your time tonight. I know this is a long one. Uh, my name is Todd Walters. I'm the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 135. We represent over 13,000 essential workers in San Diego County. I know this is a tough one and this is a big decision, but I got to tell you guys, our members are facing violence and biohazards every single day. I can give you story after story of violence that our members must face that they didn't sign up for. They're here to support the community. They're here to, to get fresh foods and, and groceries and drugs to, to the community, not to have to fight people in their stores. Uh, I'm asking you to support this measure. Uh, please think about it and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Karen Lee. Good evening, my name is Karen. I'm with Alliance San Diego. Uh, the proposed encampment ban is not a plan to solve the housing crisis in San Diego. This would affect people from many walks of life, but I hope to draw your attention to the more than 11,000 homeless students across the city of San Diego. As a result of this proposed ban, these students will be pushed out of the city, away from their schools and support services, which directly violates their human right to housing and education. Therefore, I respectfully ask the council to vote against this ordinance, which would criminalize homelessness and instead update and implement the already existing Community Action Plan on Homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Paul Hankin. Paul Hankin, if you can please unmute. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, a 32% increase in homeless, the homeless in San Diego City, 22% uh, in the county. So what's San Diego doing that's so bad? Maybe passing this ordinance without a real plan? So this ordinance and the harassment it threatens reminds me of a meme. In one panel, there's a man in a boat in a lake raising his hands and proclaiming, may God strike me dead if I'm lying. In, in the other panel, you see God getting his thunderbolt ready, and Gabriel asks him to add a note, uh, do not do it again type, to make it a bit stronger. Well, that's what this ordinance does. It makes enforcement a bit more sketchy than it is 
right now, and the homeless, aka Your time has concluded. all these castaways, Your time has will still be moved we around in Harris. Move on. Julie Coker. Julie Coker, if you can please unmute. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Julie Coker, and I'm the president and CEO of the San Diego Tourism Authority, and I am also a downtown resident. It is my job to ensure that San Diego is a desirable destination for both business and leisure travel. The condition of our city directly affects tourism, which directly affects San Diego residents. This is why we are in support of, of the unsafe camping ordinance. Large obstructions, human waste, and litter have negatively impacted the perception of our city and continues to threaten public health and safety, as well as tourism. Tourism is a vital part of San Diego's economy, and we cannot afford to lose visitors. Last year, tourism had an impact of more than $22 billion in our region. For residents, this means 200,000 jobs for San Diegans and funding for vital services such as police, fire, rescue, parks, and infrastructure. Losing tourism would mean losing the jobs and vital city services. Thank you, and I urge you Thank to vote yes. Thank you for your comments. Next is uh, Larry. Larry, if you can please unmute. Help desk Larry is your name. Okay, hi, hi. my you. name's Larry Stoll. I'm a long-term resident of District 1. I'm speaking against the approval of this inhumane homeless encampment ordinance and believe that a more comprehensive plan must be adopted to provide shelter and services for the unhoused in San Diego. According to the city attorney, to be in compliance with Martin v. the city of Boise shelter requirements, the city shall offer shelter that an individual can actually accept based on individualized needs. For example, the city should not conclude that an unsheltered woman who cannot physically accept, access the top bunk has been offered avail, available shelter if the only shelter beds available at the time are a top bunk or a bunk in a men's only shelter. The ordinance does not meet the legal requirements for shelter that an individual can accept. The ordinance should not move forward until there is shelter for all homeless persons that can accept more of, there is no reason to revisit the ordinance until adequate shelter or housing is available for the most unhoused people. Please vote no on thank, this ordinance. Thank you for your comments. Next is Chris Marvell. Please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, all right, good evening. I live in District 9 and I've worked in nonprofit, nonprofit disability services in San Diego for 20 years. Many of my clients and coworkers and friends have experienced homelessness here in San Diego. I'm asking you to vote no on this ordinance. Criminalizing unhoused people does nothing to improve the material conditions for those suffering the most, the unhoused. Housing first works if we actually implement it, which we have not here in San Diego. It makes zero sense to spend our precious resources on enforcement when adequate housing nor shelter is available. We have limited resources. We must prioritize solutions that we know work. Immediate humanitarian release and housing are needed, not more police overtime and useless tickets. Policing is not needed to connect unhoused people to resources, which are few. Supportive social services and investment in the people are needed. The needs of tourism should not supersede the needs of the residents. Vote no on this cruel and ineffective ordinance. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah. Sarah, if you can please unmute. Hi. Um, I, my name is Sarah Kennedy. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. My name is Sarah Kennedy, an educator and community organizer in District 3. I taught downtown in East Village for several years, and we did experience the ugliness described tonight. I also had the opportunity to get to know and even teach some of our unhoused neighbors and hear about the barriers they experienced, which kept them from accessing housing and which made shelter beds inaccessible, even while technically available, barriers that would not be solved by this ban. There are plenty of concerning neighbors here in San Diego, empty luxury apartments and greedy developers come to mind personally, but this ban would harm our most vulnerable communities. Knowing the racial demographics of unhoused San Diegans and the track record of the San Diego Police Department when it comes to policing black and brown communities, we need a plan, not a ban. This council approved a comprehensive community action plan in 2019, then didn't implement it. Vote no today and then revisit that plan. 
Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Flower Alvarez Lopez. You can please unmute. Flower Alvarez, um, Flower, I can unmute for you. There should be a pop up that comes up to say to unmute. I'll come back to you before we end public comment. Next is Wendy. Hi, my name is Wendy Galerter, and I've been a homeowner in Pacific Beach for 37 years. I urge the council to vote no on this ordinance, which will unfortunately not solve any of the problems that previous speakers have listed. Instead, the ordinance is merely going to shuffle homeless people from one location to another. It will increase their economic and emo emotional problems that led to homelessness in the first place and will jail homeless people rather than help them. And therefore, it's going to increase rather than decrease homelessness. Voting yes is an easy way for you to claim that you're doing something, but we didn't elect you to do easy things. We elected you to do the right thing. And the right thing to do is to take a truly comprehensive approach that includes more housing, more services, and more shelter, and that does not criminalize homelessness. The right thing to do is to vote no on an ordinance that does nothing to address the crisis and the tragedy of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the original. The original, if you can please unmute. Yeah, so I love how we're talking about public property, yet it's only for certain parts of the public. And, you know, it's interesting because as we talk about this as a public health and safety issue when really it's about aesthetics and um, things not being conducive to the eye when we're getting into a you know smart city and all of the things that the un wants to put us in which is densely populated slave cities where you can't get out and as we people should realize these are corporate entities that are doing these things so that's why they talk about tourism and care more about the tourists than they do about the actual community and that's why it's up to the people to understand that if we really want the county or the cities to do anything for us we have to take the power back because we are letting these people dictate things when they're supposed to be our servants and when they do not serve the people it's up to the people to take their power back and stop letting these people protect tend to do things when all they do is waste the money and people keep people in slavery and criminalize people for things they shouldn't be criminalized for. Our next speaker is ending in 1571. 1571, if you can please unmute, star six. One five, there you go. El Cajon has a second highest population of homelessness, yet we don't allow encampments for good reasons. First, health and safety. We saw that encampments facilitated drug use. With a fentanyl crisis raging, we had to stop seeing lives lost. We also saw homelessness on homeless crime, including sexual assaults and worse. We couldn't call ourselves compassionate and let this continue. Second debris. In the past three years, we picked up over 1.4 million pounds of soiled items, including needles. This was a health issue for all. Third, quality of life. We regain control of our parks and now kids play anywhere they want. And our sidewalks are clear, complying with ADA access and not soiled with hazardous waste. At the same time, we increased our hundreds of beds by adding a tiny home village because not everyone can function in a large shelter. Built with volunteers from Amicus, these cost only $10,000 each and go up in weeks, not years. The VFW Hall could host one for veterans, a church for seniors. It's scalable, affordable, and fast. Thank you. Next is Kara Camden or Kara Camden. If you can please unmute. Kara Camden, we will come back to you. Next is phone number ending in 0179. Please unmute. Press star six. 0179. Hi, my name is Genevieve Jones Wright, and contrary to what was said, there is nothing improved about this ordinance, and it will not help people. This rhetoric about police officers being compassionate yet firm when enforcing this ban is reminiscent of George W. Bush's compassionate conservatism. You know you're on the wrong side when Jim Desmond supports the proposal, and you're going in the same direction as Mayors Bailey and Wells. 
You want to make police officers, social workers, and the duties you will be piling on their plates will not be done efficiently, nor from a place of human centeredness. More training on implicit bias is not enough and has never been. This proposed ban will only deepen systemic issues relating to law enforcement's racialized narratives and behaviors towards black San Diegans who disproportionately experience homelessness in our region. With this ban, you will be criminalizing inequitable outcomes, but not racial inequity itself. I hate how the mayor, Whitburn, and others have weaponized our children against unsheltered community members. And instead of providing shelter and affordable housing for Your time has concluded, ma'am. We're going to go to phone number ending in 9100. 9100. Please press star six to unmute. 9100, if you can please press star six to unmute. Star six to unmute for 9100. Star six. Thank you, we can hear you. Please proceed with your comments. You just muted yourself again. Star six to unmute. We will have to come back. There you go. Uh, yeah, you can hear me now? Yes, please proceed. Uh, yeah, so I just, I just wanted to, just to say a couple things. Uh, what I want to say is like California is having like a really weird situation with um, huge rent increases for the working class. This has happened in San Francisco and in San Diego. Like the last, I want to say the last two years, the rent has increased a lot. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. I don't know why that is. Um, yes, we do have a huge homeless population. We have a huge homeless issue. That is, that is not a lie. But we also have this other issue in California where the rent is going up. And the minimum wage, you know, doesn't meet that. But again, I'm just curious about the history of why these rents keep going up in California. And if we don't figure that out, we're going to have bigger problems down the road. And um, that's really what I wanted to say to you guys. Um, and we need, to, we need to figure out why that is. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Lydia Morales. Lydia Morales, if you can please unmute. You had some, there you go. You are unmuted, but we do not hear you in chambers. Please make sure the device you're speaking into is also unmuted. Lydia Morales, please make sure the device you're speaking into is also unmuted. If you'd like to drop off and re-log in to see if that helps, we will be sure to take your uh, comments with your name since you did have your hand raised. Next is Alex Vizotsky. If you can please unmute, Alex. Alex Wisotsky, if you can please unmute. There you go. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Wisotsky. I am with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. The Alliance has for three decades looked at data on practice in the field on what works and what doesn't. Uh, we know what ends homelessness. It's person-centered services and connections to permanent housing. Uh, we also know from looking at jurisdictions around the country what doesn't work, and that's restricting people experiencing homelessness from being in public space. Uh, ordinances like the one proposed are going to make it harder for case managers and service workers to keep in touch with their clients and will lead to people losing critical documents like their IDs that they need to get into housing. Uh, we've seen cities around the country again and again take this tactic and try ordinances like this one over the years uh, to try to address homelessness, and it has failed every time. Uh, I encourage the council to oppose this ordinance. Thanks so much. Thank you. I would like to remind people that the five-minute timer did conclude, so if, uh, if you're raising your hand now, we are lowering it because we've already taken those. Next, we'll go to um, Flower again. If you can unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. My name is Flower Alvarez, and I'm with Universidad Popular. At Universidad Popular, we stand firmly by civil, constitutional, and human rights for all. What you do in the city of San Diego impacts the whole entire region. I have found myself homeless in the past. I have lived at homeless shelters. 
And I know firsthand the hardships of establishing housing security and stability. It is that it is with that lived experience in my heart and in my mind that I stand up strongly against the encampment ban ordinance. It's okay to admit when something is not gonna work. And this is one of those situations. And like everything else, we cannot incarcerate or criminalize ourselves out of an issue. And this is one of those issues. For me, um, just hearing everybody speak, uh, I, um, I appreciate the honesty. So let's be honest to those that are putting profit over people. Thank you. Thank Your you. time has expired. Next, we'll go back to Anne Manash. If you can please unmute, Anne Manash. Anne Manash, I've asked you to unmute yourself. We only have a couple more callers, so I'll come back to you then. Hopefully, you can fix your technical difficulties. Juan, Juan, if you can please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. So I just want to say that I'm part of Whitburn's uh, district, and I'm very ashamed of him for uh, bringing this ordinance into the stage. And I want to bring the attendance to everyone else that just the same way that everyone was voted into this position, y'all can be voted out the same way. And I want to bring shame on anyone who approves this ordinance. Thank you. Next is Lizzie Broughton. Lizzie Broughton, if you can please unmute. Please proceed. Hi there. I am a small business owner in East Village. I've had my business there for 10 years. Um, we have had a homeless person come in and shoot up in front of my team. We have had a homeless person come in and completely drop their things and go to try to attack one of our teammates. In March, within one week, we had a naked homeless person come in with an underage client sitting in the waiting room. I am a very compassionate person, um, but something has to change for us to feel safe as a storefront business. We made it through COVID, but I'm really fearful for the storefronts in downtown San Diego that many are not going to make it through this. I hope I bring this, possibly some structure comes in and that housing is there for them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to the phone of writing in 3672 to see if that is Ann Manesh who's called back in. And Manesh, if that's you in 3672, please unmute. Hello? Hello, is this Ann Manesh? Yes, hello. Uh, no, this is Lydia Morales that I've been trying to call and I did it in my phone. Okay, um, hi. Can please. you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear you. We'll reset your time. Please proceed. Okay, yes. Hi. Um, good evening, um, council members, um, council president. My name is Lydia Morales. Um, I'm an ACE member. Um, I live in District 8. I'm calling because I'm against uh, the proposal in encampment in ban. Um, I'm a mother of three. Um, and working hard, mom, I'm working, um, facing uh, potential homeless because of the raising rents. Um, for 20 years, I've been working in hotels. Uh, hotel industry, be believe me, they're, 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 they don't, they really um, only on the money and, 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 and it's all that. That's why they're asking uh, for you to, to, um, to uh, do that um, in, in, do that for the ban. Um, the crisis is the result of the San Diego government officials serving landlords, real estate investors, organizations like Blackstone. This ban is unhuman. Put a rent limit. Thank you. That um, does conclude your time. Gonna, um, Thank you. That does conclude your time. Um, that does conclude public comment. Just for the record, there were eight speaker slips submitted of no wish to speak. Again, that concludes the comments for item 613. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fuentes, uh, to you and your team for helping um, ensure that the public could provide their comment. Um, we will now turn to the council for consideration of the item, beginning with Councilmember uh, Whitburn, followed by Councilmember Von Wilbur. Thank you, Council President. 
I want to start by thanking everyone who has participated in our meeting today. I heard each and every comment, and I appreciate you sharing your perspectives. We heard repeatedly from speakers today that if we want to solve homelessness, we need more housing that people can afford. Absolutely, we must add housing. That is why this city council has approved every housing proposal that has come before us, including income-restricted affordable housing. Yes, we must build more housing. At the same time, we have to address the very real public health and safety hazards caused by encampments. We heard from residents with children who have been forced to walk out into the street to get around encampments blocking the sidewalk. Children walking to school have to walk out into the street. We heard about the canyon fires that start near encampments and come close to homes. We heard from people who are afraid to walk in their neighborhoods. We heard that hospitality workers are quitting their jobs and grocery workers don't feel safe. There is one group that we did not hear from today. We did not hear from the people most impacted by the public health and safety hazards of encampments. We didn't hear from them because they died. Hundreds of people have died in encampments on our streets in just the past 12 months. Hundreds. Preyed upon by drug dealers and overdosing on fentanyl. Hit by cars. Randomly attacked. People died during the hepatitis outbreak in encampments several years ago. Given the city's interest in protecting public health and safety, given our obligation to protect public safety, I believe we need reasonable regulations on the use and location of encampments. And that's what this ordinance does. It puts reasonable regulations on the use and location of encampments. Our city can do both. We can work to help people get back on their feet, and we can have reasonable regulations on the use and location of encampments. I'd like to follow up on several of the comments we heard today with some questions for Ms. Jarman and Captain Takeuchi. Um, can you describe how homeless strategies and solutions will work together with the Neighborhood Services Division to conduct outreach prior to the enforcement of the ordinance? I'm happy to. Thank you, Council Member. Um, if the ordinance is passed as proposed, my outreach teams would ensure that we do outreach and education within the communities that Captain Takeuchi identified, which would be schools and parks at the beginning of the implementation of this ordinance. And so my outreach teams would be able to go out, ensure that education was occurring, even in advance of any signage or implementation of the ordinance. Thank you. And how much shelter do we need to enforce this ordinance? I can take a piece of that question and then I'll probably ask Heather Ferbert to expand. Uh, but from my understanding from the legal analysis, if captain's teams were to enforce, they need to have one suitable bed available for the person that they are encountering at that time. Thank you, Captain Takeuchi. How will this be enforced so as to not push unsheltered people to other areas? Yeah, so as Director Jarman had said, our, our, our plan is to go to those parks and schools first. Um, and please understand that the, the non-law enforcement outreach groups are going to be there first. And my goal is for those outreach groups to connect with the unhoused and, and make every effort to get those individuals into a shelter in the event that we have someone that does not um, accept those offers and my enforcement team goes, then we will make every effort at every touch to offer a shelter bed. Thank you, Captain. And my last question for you, do you have enough officers to enforce this ordinance? Yes, sir. Um, obviously, I would love more. Um, the, the chief has been um, very vocal about the lack of officers. Um, the, we're down over 200. However, my job as a commanding officer of the neighborhood, neighborhood policing division is to utilize the, the resources I currently have. And I'm confident that with the resources I have, um, I can enforce in the method that I that described earlier today. Thank you, Captain. Thank you very much, Ms. Jarman. And I want to extend my deepest thanks to all of the city employees from so many city departments who have come, to, come together and collaborated to bring this measure forward. Based on the risk that encampments and tents on public property pose to public health and safety, based on the comprehensive shelter plan, which was presented as a companion item today, and based on the facts on the record, I move the staff recommendation to adopt an ordinance regulating encampments on public land and the companion CEQA resolution. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Whitburn. Councilmember Von Wilburn. 
Uh, thank you, Council President, and uh, thank you to the Councilmember Whitburn and your team for all the work on this very difficult issue. Um, we're all struggling with this, and I want to tell a story about something that I saw um, up at a local coffee shop here a little while ago on 7th and Ash Streets. I was walking back to City Hall, and um, Achilles Coffee Shop is on the corner. And if you've been there, it's all glass windows around. And there was a line of people standing outside in a panic, and the young barista, she couldn't have been more than 21, crying on the phone inside. And I said, what's going on? And a woman waiting in line for coffee said, the barista's on the phone with 911. And I said, why? She said, because that man over there across the street who was clearly suffering. He was barely wearing clothes. He was talking to voices that weren't there. He had been coming up to the glass window and exposing himself to her and terrified her. And I looked down and at the other glass window, there was another gentleman who had been forced to sleep on the street all night, waking up in his torn up sleeping bag with food wrappers and alcohol bottles around him. And I look at this barista I look at the poor men, man experiencing a mental health crisis, and I looked at the poor man waking up, and I realized here, everyone is suffering here. Everyone. People who have mental illness and drug addiction or people forced to sleep on the street are suffering just as much as the business owner and the barista who put their life savings on the line to open a coffee shop are suffering. I don't believe this problem is gonna be solved by blaming one side or another. We are a community. We are all human, and we're all suffering here. You know, I have a really unique perspective on this item because in my work as a deputy city attorney, I administered the prior settlements. I administered the Isaiah settlement, the Spencer settlement, and I negotiated the Arendelle settlement in progressive enforcement with people currently experiencing homelessness at the table, as well as others who have been in this room talking to us about bringing lived experience. I made sure they were there. We're also not the only city dealing with this issue, and it has gotten much worse since the pandemic. The level of suffering I have personally seen on the street, of my many ride-alongs with the HOT team and others, it has gotten much worse. And George, if you could bring up the slides that I sent, please. Um, this is one of our headlines. San Diego County sees a record number of homeless and deaths this year. Please go to the next slide. This is from The Voice of San Diego. Fentanyl plagues San Diego's homeless population. Can you go to the next slide, please? These are the deaths of unsheltered people on the street, according to the medical examiner. They're going up each month. Please go to the next slide. In 2018, there were 86 unsheltered people who died from accidental drug overdose. In 2021, there are 317, nearly four times. We are all suffering here, and the status quo is not helping. Please go to the next slide. This just came out this morning from Voice of San Diego. Homeless deaths are rising at a much greater rate than homelessness. And the tents on the street, the author goes in to talk about how most of the people in those tents died. I have been asked multiple times by service providers, can you please deploy more police to keep people safe on the street? Because fentanyl dealers are going tent to tent, dealing fentanyl and preying on people. I don't believe we can deploy enough officers throughout the streets to keep people safe. I don't have a problem with people living on our streets, but I do have a problem with people dying on our streets. And the question is, how do we address such a scale of human suffering with humanity for everyone? So we have a legal framework handed down by the Martin v. Boise case, which I litigated myself in court on behalf of the city. Not that case, but cases after it. And I know we cannot enforce the law if we don't have a place for people to go. And I understand that from a human perspective. So Sarah, if you could please come up again. I want to talk about, next slide please, the safe camping areas. Can you tell us how these safe camping areas are going to keep people safe? 20th and B with 136 spots, one of the things I had mentioned in the previous item is that we ensure that we provide a whole host of services, uh, wraparound services for the individuals at that site. That will include ensuring that people are safe inside their tents, that will ensure that there are county nurses that are able to help provide vaccinations and screenings for the facility, and it'll make sure that our outreach teams are able to connect people that are very much so in need of shelter 
to the shelter location once it is open. Okay, and will Narcan be available? Yes. And people on the street have found communities and neighbors and buddies to keep them safe. Can they all go together as a pod so we're not separating folks? Yes, it's a very exciting opportunity for this facility that pods can come together. Okay, and couples can come together, pets, caretakers, you name it. Okay, and there will be wellness checks each night? Yes. And there'll be security to make sure that drug dealers are not coming and preying on people? That is correct. Okay. Um, thank you. I want to also ask, um, I, this is a crisis management tool, by the way. I know that this is not permanent housing. We all know that. But we have a crisis on our street. And when I was on a walk along with ESC doing a cleanup, we found someone had died in a tent. It was horrible. And it was on 17th and Imperial, right down the street from Homeless Services. Can I have th three more minutes, please? So it's not just about outreach. It's not just about you know, providing services, it's also about making sure we have a safe place, and I do believe that these camping or safe camping grounds will be a temporary safe space. Um, Captain Takeuchi, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Sarah. I have a couple questions for you, please. Uh, next slide, please, George. I also do not believe we can arrest our way out of this crisis. I do not believe arresting people is going to help a lot of folks' situations, but we do have to manage our public spaces. I understand that. We had a hepatitis A outbreak recently because we had unchecked encampments on the street that were not safe. So this is a draft training bulletin that I've used before in these cases. I negotiated the one in Arendelle with homeless individuals for progressive enforcement. This is just a draft, but I'm putting it up here to show what we're working on. So please go to the next slide. Can you explain to us how the progressive enforcement model works and what it means to say, is there available shelter? Absolutely. So the progressive enforcement model is, is the compassionate side of, of, of our mission statement. Um, it is every opportunity that we talk to an individual who is unhoused to ask them if they want shelter. Will they accept shelter? Will they accept services? As a matter of fact, in my pocket, I carry a card that we hand out that has a QR code. Um, my lieutenant came up with this several months ago, and we hand this to the individual. When they scan the code, it goes directly to 201. It's got numbers available. It's got locations available if they're not ready to talk to us. And because we understand that that's the trust part of relationship building. But back to this enforcement. So the first contact we make, make with an individual, we will ensure that this is the first time we've contacted them and we will educate them of the law and we will offer them a shelter bid. Unfortunately, in, 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 in what neighborhood policing does, it's less than 10% of the time a shelter bid is offered. Therefore, when we need to progress to the second step, the second step would be um, contacting an individual, doing a check to see if we've spoken to them. If we have and we've already given them a warning, then it's offer of a shelter bed, and if, if they refuse, then it's issuance of a misdemeanor citation. If they accept a shelter bed, then that's when we can then hopefully contact either 20th and B directly or go through coordinated intake system and find adequate shelter for that individual. What has me very excited is what Director Jarman just said about the camping sites at 20th and B. It's a campsite. It's a 10 by 13 piece of property. Um, and I think that's going to be um, accepted well with individuals who don't want congregate settings. Um, it's also um, encouraging for me because, um, as Ms. Jones from the Housing Commission earlier stated, we're at 97% shelter capacity. Um, we have individuals that cannot take a top bunk, and that's what's only available. So with this 20th and B site being a campsite, I think it's going to accommodate a majority of folks. And, and an individual who says no, they are choosing for whatever reason they're saying no, they're choosing a reason, and it's not because the, the, the bed is not compatible. Let me move to the third step. The third step is, again, contacting an individual. Mm -hmm. It's determining have they been contacted prior. If they have, did they receive a warning? And then did, did they receive a misdemeanor citation? And if those two requirements are met, we offer a shelter. If, but if they say no, then we can make a custodial arrest of that individual. And that would mean placing handcuffs. That would mean identifying their personal property, and we would impound that property. That is our obligation. That is what our policy and procedure says. As long as the items are not soiled, as long as they're not perishable, as long as they don't contain biohazards, and then we will take possession of that property, impound it at our police headquarters. The individual is then given a receipt, and that person is then booked into jail. Currently, jail is holding individuals for about four to six hours, upon which they are then released, and they have every right to then come down to our police headquarters to, to, to retrieve their property. Um, again, my goal is for a person to say yes, and at any moment, 
they say yes, um, I will be directing my officers to contact a shelter, ensure that we've got a, a sh shelter bed that, that meets their needs, and then transport that individual directly to the shelter. Because we understand getting them off the streets and getting into some type of temporary shelter is what's the start of, of their, their, their climb out of homelessness. Got that's what I appreciate that. That's why I wanted to highlight this. We're not just putting out an ordinance that says, if there's available shelter somewhere in the county, go find it. So no, we're going to call a shelter, offer you a ride. And if you don't want to come to the hot team, there's other ways to get transportation now because we have more outreach services. But when I was a deputy city attorney doing these ride alongs, we would offer someone a ride. We put the tent in the back of the van. Any pets could come with us, all their belongings. Is that still going to be the offer? Yes, ma'am, that will. That has not changed since you experienced it several years ago. That's what we do now. Okay. And if someone says no and you do have to make an arrest, if on the way to the jailhouse they change their mind and say, I want to take services, will you turn that car around and make sure you get them in a good place? I'm ready to tell my officers that's the direction I would like to take with anyone that says yes to a shelter bed, assuming they don't have a warrant of arrest, which may happen, to, you know, which happens actually frequently, um, as long as I don't have a judicial order requiring me, um, requiring a, a person be taken into custody, I, I believe that is the workable solution. Of course, I know. And, and I understand if someone does have a warrant for an arrest, that's a completely different issue than, than encroachment. Um, so I do have um, one amendment I'd like to make the ordinance, if you could please put the slide up. One of the issues is, I know a committee it got amended so to make uh, a pro prohibition on camping in all parks at all times. We are not going to have the capacity to enforce at all places and all times in parks. And so while the, the prohibition will be there, I do believe that we should dictate our resources for enforcement in a reasonable way. So my amendment is in any park where the city manager determines there is a significant pu public health and safety risk and provided that signs are posted prohibiting camping that are clearly visible to pedestrians. Um, so would the, would the mayor's office and PD be, be, be amenable to this? The mayor's office is amenable to this. Oh, all right. Um, would uh, Councilor, all that Councilor Whitburn answer if he would be? Yes, I'm happy to incorporate that into the motion. Okay. Um, I believe that's important. The reason that we are doing this ordinance is we're not going to solve homelessness with this. I know that. But we are going to tackle an important public health and safety issue, and that's why I believe we should be directing these enforcement resources to where there is public health and safety issues. So the last thing I have is, um, next slide, please. I would second the motion with the following requests. One, that we create a monitoring and working group to monitor and discuss the implementation of the ordinance. This group should include people with lived experience. Two, evaluate for consideration additional safe sleeping areas throughout the city, including evaluating smaller safe camping areas where there are known existing encampments inside the city that are outside of the downtown area. If we want people off the street, we should give them a place to go. Three, I want to explore creating, we're calling it the OSAT, we can change the acronym. We like acronyms in government. The open space outreach team to perform outreach to unsheltered individuals in the city's open space. One issue I have heard, um, Council Warden, do you have any time left over that I could use? I believe I had about a minute and a half. Could I use that please? Is that okay? Thank you. One criticism of this ordinance I keep hearing is, if we enact the ban here, it'll push people into open space. In the IBA's memo on page two, there's already a statement from the San Diego River Park Foundation estimating that 238 individuals are unsheltered living along the San Diego River bed already this year. I know from administering the Isaiah settlement, I got calls all the time for cleanups in the open space. Folks are already there. We need to make sure we have an outreach team that can reach them and help them. And finally, one thing I have learned from the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, you guys brought forth guiding principles on how to address encampments. Um, one of the principles that's outlined in the IBA's report is when circumstances and resources permit, encampments and abatements should be conducted at the conclusion of a multidisciplinary assessment that includes evaluation from street outreach personnel and other stakeholders uh, before law enforcement personnel is utilized. So in my motion, I would like to conclude with this ordinance will not go into effect until 30 days after the first safe sleeping law is open on 20th and B to provide an opportunity uh, for non-police outreach workers to be the first contacts to move people off the street and into the safe sleeping lots during the first 30 days. 
Uh, would the mayor's office and, and Mr. Whitburn be okay with this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for being here, for being engaged. This is an incredibly difficult issue. I know that it takes a village. I'm wrapping up and that no one ordinance or program is going to solve all these problems. But I do hope that providing a safe place for people to go away from fentanyl is something new, y'all. This is not the, the landscape we dealt with four years ago. I just hope by providing a safe place for people to go and compassion enforcement of how we use our public safe or public space, we can keep San Diego safe for everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Von Wilpert. All right, so we've got a motion and a second put forth with the. Um, Incorporating the um, request from Councilmember Von Wilpert, we'll now turn to the Office of the City Attorney for some comments. Thank you, Council President. I would ask Senior Chief Deputy City Attorney Heather Ferber to see if she has any clarification for the motion. Thank you, Councilmember Von Wilpert. I just wanted to clarify that your motion with respect to the effective date would be an amendment to Section 7 of the ordinance. We could add language such as Right now it says the ordinance shall take effect and be in force on the 30th day from and after its final passage. I would recommend that we add or 30 days from the date the first safe sleeping lot at 20th and B streets is open for use, whichever is later. That way if the second reading is delayed and the 30 day referendum period somehow is later than the opening of the safe lot, we are legally compliant with both. Okay, that would still guarantee though that at least 30 days will have gone by for the safe sleeping, safe sleeping to be open before the law goes into effect? Is the request that the safe sleeping lot be open 30 days? This doesn't go into effect until at least 30 days after. The safe sleeping, okay, so we'll have to revise the language slightly, but I would still recommend that we retain the final link passage language as well. Okay, you are the city we'll attorney drafter. I totally defer to your judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ferber, do you need a few moments to catch up? Would you like a recess? I hate to hold things uh, up. Um, <laughs> we got to do this right, and there's, this is probably not the end of amendments today. So I, I imagine. Uh, yeah, a few minutes would be great. Okay, and then there's a request from the clerk's office as well. I can, I can go down and speak to you, but just some language in regards to there being some notification to the to my office in regards of the ordinance at the end. If it does go to that ladder, somebody either from the mayor's office, a memo, something to notify my office, if it's not gonna be the 30 days and it'll be the ladder. We can work with you on that. Thank you very much. This is for uh, 10 minutes? Five. five? Okay, all right. Uh, we will take a five minute recess. We will reconvene at 9.01. Thank you. It sounded like he sort of wanted a break, to be honest. Do we need to put
All right, we will, um, we will reconvene. Ms. Fuentes, if you'd uh, please call the roll. Thank you, Council President, for keeping us straight. Council Member LaCava. Council Member Campbell. Council Member Whitburn. Council President Pro Tem Montgomery Stepp. Council Member Von Wilpert. Council Member Lee. Here. Council Member Campillo. Here. Council Member Moreno. Present. Council President Elo Rivera. Present. And for the record, Council Member Campbell is present as well. Thank you. Here. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've got a motion and a second on the floor now. Um, we will uh, now go to Council Member Lee. Thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you to Council Member Whitburn and Mayor Gloria uh, for your efforts to address one of the most challenging issues we are facing as a society today. Um, thank you to the public for your input and to many for sharing your experiences. Uh, none of us believe the current situation is acceptable and I think all of us can agree that we must do better and we must do more. Um, I wanna jump right into questions that I have following up from the committee hearing that we've had previously and uh, requests from the motion that was passed. Um, first off, what is the status on the community action plan on homelessness? Thank you for the question. Here comes Lisa from the San Diego Housing Commission. Uh, several months ago with the direction of the Leadership Council, uh, the Housing Commission contracted with Corporation for Supportive Housing to update all of the goals of the action plan, understanding that a lot has changed um, since it was enacted and, and accepted in 2019. Uh, with the 2023 point in time count coming out about a week and a half ago, uh, CSH is now updating that data again. We anticipate bringing that forward to the Leadership Council in early July, but should have information within the next couple weeks on uh, what anticipated need is for both shelter, permit supportive housing, and other housing and homelessness interventions. Thank you. Um, this might be more so for the regional task force. Um, um, if Tamara is still here, give her a moment for her to come up. Thank you, Cameron. I, um, I know this was one of the items that were placed into the motion um, in order to bring it back to council. I wanted to know if the regional task force has been engaged after the committee hearing to provide feedback as requested. You know, we have talked to the mayor's uh, team of which Sarah was a part of on point in time uh, data to inform them of, of the increases. We haven't been actively engaged in the shelter strategy. It's very new that they put out and have a commitment from Sarah to continue to work with us on those strategies. So uh, as it's been moving very quickly, but we have talked to him about the increased numbers and challenges. I'm curious, does this ordinance align with um, RTFH's best practices when it comes to dealing with encampments? So the challenge I think that the council has is adding the additional enforcement is not best practice. Uh, it doesn't align with the directions on engaging uh, unsheltered populations and invading uh, those encampments when there is a public health or, uh, safety or a hygiene issue. I think uh, Council Member Whitburn, or excuse me, uh, Marnie Van Wilpert has kind of addressed that. I think it's the importance of identifying why you're abating something, having the multidisciplinary engagement uh, with a focused approach on housing and shelter and having uh, the adequate shelter is the, is the critical element. Anytime we're increasing uh, enforcement, uh, arrests of homeless individuals is not best practice and it doesn't align with the uh, RTFH or the Continuum of Care's uh, standards of practice. You should. Um, given that much of our implementation for new shelter and other homelessness strategies will require funding, would today's ordinance impact any potential federal funding? It's a very uh, good question. The continuums of care are funded through housing and urban development and in 2015 they started asking continuums of care specifically what our activity was in preventing and reducing criminalization, specifically enforcement. So it is a scored part of our funding that comes to the community. We did apply for a large unsheltered grant uh, 
through HUD. It was a one-time funding source, and that was one of the questions that we're required to answer. Uh, so uh, activities like this can put um, our ask for funding uh, in a less competitive uh, position. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, moving back to shelter availability, um, I wanted to understand how are we defining available shelter and will it account for individual needs such as disabilities, family units, caretakers? Thank you for the question. Um, uh, yes, available shelter is only available if the individual can access it. Um, I know I asked this back in the committee meeting as well, but how will people know whether there is shelter available and when or where they might be at risk of enforcement? With Councilmember Von Wilpert's proposed amendment to the motion, there will be likely two options. I can speak to one would be the availability of doing the education for the first 30 days before enforcement would take place. Uh, in addition, it would be the signage at all of these new locations. Uh, given that uh, a single bed of an available type might be enough to offer enforcement, um, would it be reasonable to assume that that might um, create some confusion as to whether folks will understand any given day whether they can be it can be enforced? Captain, I don't know if you want to talk about the current process now. Sure. Let, let me talk about the current process, Councilmember Lee. So the current process we have is we, we use the coordinated intake system that the Housing San Diego Housing Commission administers. What that means is every day, um, myself, all my supervisors, we receive what the, the, the vacancy rate, if you will, of the shelters are. Um, and if there are beds available, we don't know at that time exactly what type of beds they are. However, when my teams go out and we encounter an individual that says yes to a shelter bed, we will ask a series of questions. For example, what is your name? Um, do you have any disabilities? Do you have any medical conditions, your age, what have you? We then contact coordinated intake. And um, in some cases, we will text coordinated intake. They will respond back once they do their due diligence of searching the shelter system to see if there's a bed that then can accommodate that individual. In cases there are, then we are then advised where the location is and that person is then di taken directly to the shelter. With 20th and B standing up and with the low barrier that I'm anticipating, um, I think it's just gonna be a matter of knowing if there's a space available and Director Jarman and I have had conversations already and as we continue to finalize these, these plans, um, what I've been told is that um, I should be receiving that same daily contact, uh, email, if you will, to let me know and let my supervisors know that 20th and B is, has sites available. And because I know it's a low barrier, it's not a top bunk, bottom bunk issue, it can accommodate uh, you know individuals with pods that we talked about or, or friend network or even with animals, um, I'm confident that just knowing there are spaces available that we can go out and conduct enforcement yet again offering a shelter bed at every single encounter. Um, do we know what, what's the latest count of homelessness in downtown San Diego alone? Approximately 2100. Okay, I ask that in part because I, I presume once the um, safe sleeping sites might be filled that that ease of access would be a little bit different because we'll be relying more heavily on the coordinated intake system in particular. Um, maybe a question more for the Housing Commission, um, but I was curious if we um, anticipate that we'll need increased outreach to address any potential dispersal into more remote areas or any other kinds of sensitive sites. It's certainly something we would wanna plan and prepare for. So the conversation around some form of open space outreach team or an outreach team that is more well equipped to get into some of our canyons and rivers would be a sensible approach to mitigating that and making sure that if people are dispersed, we are still reaching them, knowing that some folks are previously engaged and or matched to resources. So still wanting to carry on that sort of housing placement opportunity with folks. Thank you. Um, I know a lot of folks have addressed today whether this ordinance will have an impact and how so on homelessness as a whole. So I'm just gonna ask um, more directly if this ordinance is anticipated to help reduce the total number of homeless throughout the city. Thank you for the question. I believe what this ordinance will do is it will address public health and safety and by linking people individually through the outreach 
then people would be connected to housing. And the hope is that they'll be able to secure safe camping, safe sleeping. This was a line to go with safe sleeping. So we could hopefully move more people into different locations, into shelter, into different services in a more expedited way. That's certainly the hope. Um, understood. Um, I'll go ahead and just move to enforcement. Um, thank you, Kevin Taguchi, for answering some of that. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but I just want to make sure that this, in this new setting it's clarified. As it currently stands, are encampments currently allowed on sidewalks or in parks? We, we have an encroachment uh, ordinance in the city of San Diego. So that's public property on the public right of way, um, blocking the public right of way. So it's not an encampment ordinance, it's an it's a encroachment violation. And there is a difference there. Um, an encroachment violation is blocking the public right of way with private, with private property. I asked that in part because in committee, I think multiple times it was expressed that encampments are already banned throughout the city given the current municipal code. I just wanted to confirm that that was still the case. I'm sorry, what was your question? I can, I can answer. That is the case. However, what this ordinance does is clarifies that in specific locations like certain parks, encampments are banned regardless of shelter bed availability. Um, I know many residents and businesses today have shared a lot of frustration with numerous activities that would seem to be considered a crime. Um, certainly that is reflecting a lot of the stories that we heard. Um, and a lot of those are, I, I think, regardless of what their housing status is, it would still be a crime. Um, is there anything keeping us from enforcing against these crimes as they currently stand? Yes, council member. So many of the crimes that were described today um, are misdemeanor crimes. In order for us to take enforcement action on a misdemeanor, an officer must be present and witness the crime. If we don't witness a crime, then what we need is an, a victim to, uh, to tell us that a crime has occurred and to essentially place the, a citizen's arrest. That doesn't mean physically going and arresting an individual, it's es essentially signing a document, placing the person under citizen's arrest. And, and that, that, that is the challenging part of misdemeanor crimes. I guess I, I also just wanna make sure to help, um, you know, set expectations correctly, but this ordinance would not therefore address issues like those crimes. Well, I think the, the, goal, the goal is, and as I stated in my presentation, it's to get people to say yes to a shelter, get them off of the streets, um, get them to an alternate uh, housing solution. So I believe it, it, it is towards that direction so that those crimes don't occur. Thank you again for clarifying that as well. Um, in fact, because you've been talking about um, the progressive enforcement model, I wanted to see if you could um, highlight that again as well, especially since I think the IBA pointed out that um, there are some differences between encroachment and this ordinance. Is this a three-step model for progressive enforcement, and how is that different from what's being used in encroachment? Yes, this is a three-step model. Um, the first step is, is offering of a shelter and education of the law. The second step is offering of a shelter and issuance of a misdemeanor citation. And the third step is offering of a shelter bed and taking an individual under custodial arrest. This is different than the current process that we use for encroachment. For encroachment, we use a four-step process. The, f the, the second step is an infraction ticket. So in encroachment, what we do is we do the first contact is education and um, a, 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 a referral to the safe storage program. The second step is, again, referral to the state storage program, and it's an infraction ticket. Third step is referral to the safe storage program and a misdemeanor ticket. To an individual, there is no difference. It's still a, a, a ticket that you would get, uh, similar to a traffic ticket. The fourth step would be uh, referral to a, a safe, safe storage and custodial arrest. So that infraction um, process has been removed. Um, George, I'm gonna ask you to pull up the slide earlier that actually, that showed these two, the process that's outlined. Um, I, I wanna confirm that in order to utilize uh, this progressive enforcement model, we would need to be, it, be confirming the shelter availability first. So something I'm noticing, I'm, I'm gonna ask this in this policy, but what I'm noticing here, the way I'm reading this, is that it suggests that we're gonna be asking um, for if they will take shelter. And if it's refused, we will offer a misdemeanor citation. 
if it's accepted, then we'll be checking shelter availability. For the city attorney's office, does this issuance of a citation or arrest prior to verifying shelter availability meet the legal standards that you had discussed previously? The training bulletin is a draft at this point. It's something that we would work closely with the police department on. I would um, believe that the shelter should be offered before a citation or custodial arrest is made, and if, if accepted, then the citation or arrest should not proceed, but I would ask the captain if that's the practice. That is currently our practice. We will ask if you want shelter. If they say no, then we will c continue with our enforcement step. If they say yes, then we will make every effort to find that shelter space for them. But you won't be checking for that shelter availability prior to asking? <laughs> All right, so, um, sorry, Captain. Um, we're gonna ask that the public um, res All right, so um, we've done a really good job up until this point of respecting the process of allowing everyone um, the speaking time that they're allotted. We're, we're almost there. I, again, understand the passion that folks have um, for this issue, but I'm going to ask once again that the public uh, allow for the conversation and the discussion um, amongst the council members and staff now to occur. Um, just as we respected the time that you were allotted, I'm going to ask that you respect the time that we're allotted. Um, Captain Takahichi. Thank you, Council President. So what I am aiming towards is every morning knowing that there is space available, either through coordinated intake, which currently is the process now, or and then with 20th and B to be notified in the morning that there are spaces available for for referral. And th that is that is what I'm going to be using to allow the teams to go out and conduct enforcement in the area of a school or park that we've identified. Thank you. I, I will only express that I think this, this does give me some concern over um, how the nuance of enforcement could certainly have an impact on the legality. Um, I will ask um, for your division, um, what is your current staffing rate and the, the vacancies that you're facing? So currently I have approximately 58 sworn personnel assigned to the division, um, and that includes 10 hot personnel. So we receive anywhere from 800 to 1,000 get it done requests a week. Um, our current response time for get it done is 15 days. Um, and so we will utilize our current um, resources, the current officers to, to um, move forward towards enforcing this ordinance if it is passed today. I know the IBA pointed out that um, this, this, in, this ordinance would likely require more proactive versus reactive um, response. Um, would you be able to enforce this ordinance using existing resources without impacting other response times? It's a difficult question. Um, the IBA is recommending proactive enforcement. If uh, if the decision is made to proactively enforce, I'd have to um, view where we can proactively enforce, where we can be effective, all the while ensuring that uh, get it done are still being responded to. In addition to that, I have a commitment to ensure that Environmental Services Division, our ESD, their staff is 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 feels safe, um, and that officers are present when abatements are conducting or are occurring. So I would have to balance those three issues to ensure that I, I can move forward. Thank you. I, I've got a couple last questions that are perhaps more for the city attorney's office, but when this item was moved from committee, the one significant change was um, the addition of parks, and I know with the emotion that is um, changing a little bit in terms Absolutely. of how Would you like to request the additional three minutes? Yes, please. Um, uh, but there was some uh, an answer at that time that noted concerns um, as the list of prohibited sites um, is expanded. Could you discuss, again, any legal considerations that we should be considering? Thank you, council member. Yes, when considering whether to ban camping in specific locations that would be applicable when shelter is not available, our office recommends the council's decision be based on facts in the record supporting a strong public health and safety reason for the ban. And council should also consider the collective impact of the specific bans and whether they leave a place for people to go when shelter is not available. Um, in understanding the legal ramifications of encampment actions throughout the state, and certainly there have been many, um, San Francisco has at times been discussed to, due to the injunction that they've faced from earlier this year. Can you share more about what you understand of their case in particular? 
San Francisco is currently in litigation over whether Martin versus Boise requires for enforcement of their no camping laws, whether they must have sufficient shelter to um, house the entirety of their unsheltered population in accordance with a point in time count, or whether the offer of a bed to the person is sufficient to enforce the ordinance. It's currently undecided and there's no guidance in the case law. Sorry, there's limited guidance in the case law as discussed in our memo. Thank you. <clears throat> um, that concludes my questions. I, I think at this point, I will note that since the committee hearing, many of the questions and concerns I have shared regarding this ordinance have not been adequately addressed. Uh, I do applaud the much needed shelter strategy that we've put forward, as well as the additional funding in this year's budget. And I recognize the desire that we all share to do something. Um, I think the hard question is, what actions will ultimately improve the situation? What actions could possibly make it worse? Um, I continue to support many components actually in this ordinance focused on addressing health and safety concerns and by identifying specific sites that have broad support and that we could confidently defend in terms of legality, such as schools and high fire risk areas. The additional efforts to codify settlement language and clarify our abatement processes um, is also very much welcomed. However, I think this ordinance itself goes far beyond just seeking to address unsafe camping. And in being nearly identical to its original version, includes inadequate definitions of available shelter, few details about how exactly enforcement will be conducted that will match up with legal concerns, and I believe as a result could put us in a precarious legal position. Fundamentally, this ordinance makes a promise to the public that we will never be able to deliver. As supporters, understandably, might be believing that banning encampments means that there will no longer be encampments. And I believe that without an abundance of available shelter, that simply won't happen. In fact, we'll simply move encampments around, creating a more chaotic and volatile situation for every person, business, and neighborhood involved. Next, I am deeply concerned about the potential strain we will place on our public safety resources, given how thinly stretched our police department is and the challenges we already face responding to serious and violent situations. I do not see a realistic scenario where this ordinance would not invite heightened expectations of a response that we are simply not positioned to meet. This ordinance creates legal liabilities for the city, creates widespread confusion and pushes encampments into dangerous, hard to reach areas further away from the services that are proven to successfully reduce homelessness. I'm also concerned that we could likely be spending millions of taxpayer dollars defending a policy that at its core, we can't say will actually reduce homelessness. In fact, an overly broad court ruling like we've seen in other jurisdictions could tie our hands even more. To the extent that we do have success reducing street homelessness, I believe it will be a result of the expanded shelter capacity that we have been working on, will continue to be working on, not because of this ordinance. Lastly, we need to be careful about stigmatizing an entire population that is already extremely vulnerable. While there are certainly individuals who are refusing shelter for a variety of reasons, the data, clear, the data clearly shows us that we have far more people seeking shelter than we have shelter available. More than half of the people who exit homelessness do so without housing subsidy. And we need to recognize both the resilience and the vulnerability of the people who are experiencing homelessness. And while we absolutely need more behavioral and mental health services, we cannot ignore the economic drivers of this crisis. Enforcement should be focused on conduct, not on economic status. Ultimately, we cannot turn away from the fundamental question that this ordinance fails to answer, which is where will people go? Given all this, I strongly believe that our responsibility should be to pass effective, actionable, and legally sound policy over our desire to simply do something. Our communities deserve affordable homes, safe neighborhoods, clean sidewalks, and regardless of this vote, I will continue to work with my colleagues and the mayor towards this shared goal. Without significant changes that will clarify and address these many concerns I have addressed, I will not be supporting today's ordinance. Council President, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Council Member Lee. All right, um, again, with a motion put forward by Councilmember Whitburn, uh, seconded by Councilmember Von Wilper with um, additions that were accepted by Councilmember Whitburn. Um, we will now go to Councilmember LaCava, followed by Councilmember Campbell. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gloria. Thank you, Councilmember Whitburn, to your staff. I wanna thank everyone that spoke in chambers who called in or have written to my office. Ironically, perhaps this is the most robust conversation on the most pressing issue facing our city that we've had in a very long time, if ever. I had a lot of questions when, this, uh, when I first heard about this and even more when it was presented at Land Use and Housing Committee. 
what is our available shelter? Where are we adding more shelter? How are we supporting outreach and following best practices? What is the role of enforcement in this new language? Those are just a few of the asks attached to moving this item to full council without a recommendation from the committee. Since then, committee meeting, since that committee meeting, we have received the point in time and the latest downtown monthly counts. These tell us exactly what we expected. More individuals are becoming homeless in San Diego than ever before. Further, we're transitioning out of existing shelter locations. Rents are becoming less affordable. Landlords are exploiting our vacation rental laws and forcing San Diegans out of their homes. I want to thank the mayor's office, the city attorney's office, homeless services, housing commission, and police department for the briefings, your responsiveness to the committee's request, and for the information you've provided to council and attached as a backup to this item, including the comprehensive shelter st strategy that we heard in the previous item. Uh, I appreciate the nuance that Councilmember Lee was pursuing, but I recognize that by distilling a disparate set of laws and regulations currently on the books today in a, into a single section of our municipal code, we can then focus on, and on an effectively working systems to ensure that people are moving from encampments to shelters to housing. This ordinance takes the multiple legal statement settlements, the charter, the multiple parts of the municipal code, and employee protocols and consolidates them into a clear and defining document, adding clarity and removing ambiguity. And that is critical in my mind to today's discussion. The laws on the books already make it illegal to block a sidewalk. It is illegal today to camp in our parks and our canyons. It's illegal to set up campfires. If you want to go with nuance, I say we're already there. Further, the city has previously cleared blocks of encampments and prevented reestablishment. We're already doing abatement for public health reasons. The critical conversation in my mind is not the ordinance, it's what today's action portends. What does it change in operations from what we have been doing? What does it change in our commitment to best practices in advancing the community action plan on homelessness? So let's start with the housing pipeline. Can we stop families from falling into homelessness? The Tenant Protection Ordinance, Eviction Prevention Funding, Shallow Subsidies, Rent Assistance are powerful tools that this mayor and the council have adopted. But economic conditions and more seem to be unstoppable as more persons fall into homeless and are being housed. Can we make housing more plentiful and more affordable? That's what I hear everybody calling for, and I agree. This city is a leader in making it easier to build. But neither private industry nor government subsidies can deliver affordability at the scale we need. That is just today's reality. That leaves us with the middle of the pipeline, when people fall out of housing. And that's what we're talking about today. What have we done? What worked? What is falling short? In short, we can do more in prevention, and we will. We can do more to drive affordable, truly affordable housing, and we will. Today, we're focusing on those already unhoused and unsheltered. Beyond the laws that are already on the books, today's discussion says something that we can all agree on. Being unhoused and unsheltered is inherently unsafe and unhealthy. We have a responsibility to help people off the streets, connect them to resources, assist them on the best path that leads them to permanent housing. And that is why success for homelessness response is not about the ordinance. Instead, it comes down to implementation. As the advocates have said and shouted, it comes down to implementation of a plan. If we're going to tell someone where they cannot be, we need to give them real options on where to go. This city has previously committed to outreach best practices, and this council needs reassurances that our council policy on homelessness and outreach best practices are consistently adhered to by city operations. If we abandon or disrupt the tireless efforts already put in by our outreach teams, we risk losing the fragile relationships and tenuous safety nets that, is, that they have established. And that is why implementation is so important. And as we've heard in response to many questions, we need outreach to precede all other interactions. We need shelters and programs that fit individual needs. And never forgetting, if shelter is the next step, shelter cannot be the final destination. I'm grateful for the shelter beds, safe parking, and safe sleeping sites being added in the coming months. Thank you, Ms. Jarman, for committing to quarterly progress reports to the council on the shelter plan and outcomes. But I need more. We need more. We need to know that caseworkers are not losing clients, that vulnerable indiv individuals are not criminalized, nor are they merely pushed around in a way that does not address their health and safety. So in addition to the quarterly report, I'm asking staff, not as part of the motion, but asking staff you can commit to report out on the shelter's type 
bed count, occupancy averages, enforcement, the location, number of persons, dispersal and displacement patterns, including referrals to shelter and when shelter was not available. And I believe you have a hard copy so you don't have to write this down. Citations and arrests, if any, from enforcement action. Abatements, where are you doing abatements? The dispersal and whether they're returning back to the same side of the street. Belongings collected or disposed by volume. Looking into hospital discharges. Looking into shelter conditions and reports of unsafe conditions. Can we get a commitment by staff that you report on that when you come back quarterly or six months, depending on what's an appropriate time? Yes. Thank you. As I mentioned at the outset, the ordinance needed polishing. The draft ordinance in front of us is better than the one we saw in April, but a little bit more is needed, and I appreciate Council Member Von Wilpert's contribution. And as such, I've offered two amendments for clarity. And I believe we can put a slide up. And we've run by these by the city attorney, so hopefully they're in good shape. So uh, on 630404A, and I believe there's hard copy coming around, it is unlawful for any person to camp or to maintain an encampment in upon any public property, including in any street, sidewalk, park, and we're adding beaches and open space to be internally consistent with the red of the ordinance, waterway and banks of a waterway, unless specifically authorized by the city and manager. That's just, again, to make the whole entire ordinance internally consistent. The second one, to me, is much more important, and that is the definition of available shelter to in section 630405B. And I'll just kind of skip to the end. Or when a, the person is on a proper, public property at a time when there is no available shelter, period. This is the addition. For purposes of this section, 630405B, available shelter means the shelter that is reasonably available to the person at the time in, enforcement is taking place and taking into consideration any disability or other specific circumstances applicable to that person. I think we were hearing that from the captain, but I think actually putting that language in the ordinance so everybody understands uh, what that means. Yeah, yes, this is consistent with how enforcement is done now. Okay, I, that's what I heard in the briefings, but I wanted, I think it was important. Uh, Council Member Whitburn? Yes, and I'm happy to, Von okay. happy to incorporate that. All right, well, thank you, I'll stop there. Um, a lot of great discussion, I appreciate uh, what we heard from the public on both sides of the issue, um, and I appreciate the comments of my colleagues and Council Member Lee as well. Uh, thank you, Council, uh, Council President, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Council Member LaCava. All right, um, with that, um, again, motion put forward by Council Member Whitburn, seconded by Council Member Von Wilpert with some additions made, um, now uh, modified through the amendments put forward by Council Member LaCava. Uh, we will go to Council Member Campbell and then I will be jumping in. Thank you so much, uh, Council President. I want to start off by thanking my colleague, Council Member Whitburn, for bringing this forward, but for waiting, because he first mentioned the, the idea of going outside the box of shelter and that if a homeless person is in an encampment and has a tent and prefers to be in a tent, that perhaps we should think about using that as a place where they could shelter while they're waiting for permanent housing. And that was over a year ago. And I wanna thank Council Member Whitford for waiting to bring this forward until he had secured two different places where the encampment model would work. And I also want to say for my sake of my colleagues who are so new that several years ago we passed a vehicle habitation law and we had safe parking lots that we were using after that and we are still using and expanding. Why? Because that is the model we're going we're gonna to use for this because that model has been extremely successful in housing the homeless within six months even of getting to the safe parking lot. But many of the people who have the tent, they don't have a vehicle, but they have a tent. So if we can get them to a place where they can get a new tent from the city that's clean, spanking new and sounded quite large, 10 by 13, you said? That's bigger than my smallest bedroom. So I think, um, that would be a good incentive, but the best incentive is what we've done in the safe parking lots, which is the homeless come in, they immediately get a social worker assigned, they immediately start to get their problems worked on, 
It's figured out what it is they need and how it, how it will work to try and help them get out of homelessness. And when we uh, started this with the safe parking lots, and thanks to Jewish Family Service for their excellent social work and other care, they have bathrooms, showers, three meals a day, and the social work that they need, along with any medical or psychological situation that they find themselves in, medical including addiction situation. And, and we found that uh, in various years, between 33% to 47%, and these are university done studies by UCSD, within six months, 33 to 47% were permanently housed out of the safe parking lots. This is one of our most successful programs for the homeless. And so by doing these lots with the tents, we're hoping that those homeless in those lots will then get the help they need, that if they want to go into personal, uh, to long-term permanent housing, they will be able to do so because they will have the help and the step up that they need to help get them there. And so that's why this, this ordinance is so important. And uh, I wanna also thank Mayor Gloria, as well as my dear colleague here, for bringing this forward because it, it, it takes a lot of bravery to do this. And I understand that completely. This is a win-win ordinance because our homeless neighbors living on the unsafe sidewalks in unhealthy conditions will be able to live in a clean, healthy location with 24 hour a day service, safety, meals, showers, restrooms, and social services, all the while being helped to find permanent housing. And so meanwhile, the families that are walking their children to school who live in that section of town will no longer have to navigate through items blocking the sidewalk and health hazards such as human waste. I'm proud of the work the city and our partners have done so far to help our homeless population receive immediate care and assistance whenever we can do it. But we must expand our efforts to ensure the transition for as many people as possible who want to get into permanent housing. And so I do have a question for staff that concerns residents in, in District 2, and that had to do with the beaches. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, Captain Tak Takeuchi or Chief Neslite or whoever should answer this, can you elaborate on how the city will address concerns about encampments at the beaches, which I have heard from some constituents? Yes, Council Member Campbell, I, I can address that. Um, we currently receive get it done requests in the beach areas and we are able to, to resolve those get it done complaints. Um, with the passages as ordinance, um, I see the same thing. We, we will be effective in, in connecting people with shelter. We will offer shelter and try to connect them. If not, we are able to enforce. Thank you. It is very clear both in the ordinance and especially with the addition of what you did to 63.0404. Uh, about the beaches, I really appreciate that. Um, it's very clear that the beaches are not a place that one should camp in any case whether they're homeless or not. So thank you for your thorough responses. And with that, I would like to state that I am proud to support this ordinance. I think it will indeed help us decrease homelessness. And I think it is a good idea. And I wanna thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Um, all right, uh, we will now go to um, Council Member Moreno, followed by Council President Pro Tem Montgomery Step. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I do appreciate the work done by my colleague, uh, Council Member Whitburn, and your staff, Ms. Naso. Um, I also want to thank everybody who provided public testimony today or submitted your views in writing to the Council. Um, at the April Land Use and Housing Committee, I supported moving this proposal to full council with no recommendation, with a number of requirements to address the questions and concerns that were raised by the committee, including a revised proposal that included all city parks, a written enforcement and operations plan, a plan that identified specific sleeping sites, and a written legal analysis from the city attorney on the proposed ordinances on the proposed ordinance, um, including how it 
how it's determined which public areas the city can include in the ordinance for enforcement for both when shelter is available and for when shelter is not available. Now, some of those uh, requirements have been met and some have not. Um, I do thank the city attorney for your memo and your, and your legal analysis. Um, I had appreciated the updated language for the ordinance to include all city parks. Um, as the previous proposal only singled out just four parks in the entire city for enhanced enforcements. Um, the parks were all in wealthy neighborhoods and I was not comfortable with the idea that wealthy neighborhoods and wealthy tourists deserve a higher standard of park experience than residents of a working class department, uh, working class neighborhoods. Um, I'm not in support of my colleagues uh, modification uh, to this as I know it will um, leave behind uh, working class communities. Um, the comprehensive shelter strategy presented by Ms. Jarman gives us a better idea and timeline on how many beds will be available and when. However, a very important part of this item is seeing, uh, seeing a written enforcement plan that uh, communicates to the council and the public how, when, and where resources will be deployed to enforce the ordinance. Although I do understand that the police department is working on a training bulletin to help lay out their procedure for how officers will enforce this ordin ordinance, this is not an enforcement plan. It's a procedure for officers, not an enforcement plan, and I think those things are two very different things. Um, it appears that police department is now going to have this ordinance to enforce with no additional resources um, at their disposal. Um, and this makes me think that this ordinance may result in giving San Diegans false hope that we can make a dent in how many people are camping in parks or on sidewalks, uh, preventing them from being um, used uh, by other people. But the absence of a solid enforcement plan gives me great hesitancy to approve this ordinance today because I can't tell my constituents how resources will be deployed to enforce this ordinance and stop the unauthorized street camping that is happening in the neighborhood right now. Um, right now, many of my constituents believe that conditions related to encampments that are, that are tolerated in Logan Heights, Sherman Heights, and Barrio Logan would never be tolerated in other parts of this city. And they're right, they're absolutely right. The police department routinely tells my community that they don't have enough resources to address this issue. So seeing a concrete enforcement plan is critical to ensuring this ordinance is enforced in a transparent way and applied equ equitably throughout, the whole, throughout all neighborhoods. Um, those are my concerns that may limit my ability to approve the ordinance today. However, I do want to be clear about my feelings on this issue. Unauthorized camping in public areas needs to be addressed. And cities throughout the United States are grappling with this very issue. And the city must do something. I think doing nothing is not an option. But some comments we've heard today indicate that we should essentially do nothing and that people should be allowed to set up camp camps wherever and whenever they want, and that removing those camps from public sidewalks and parks is inhumane. Unauthorized camping on sidewalks or parks is not a safe practice for people who live in those uh, encampments, nor is it a safe environment for residents who simply wish to use city sidewalks to get to school or work, or use city facilities like a park for family activities. Now, with the pro proliferation of encampments in public spaces, San Diegans have essentially lost their rights to those public spaces because of unregulated camping. <coughs> if I may have the additional three minutes. Um, additionally, allowing this activity to continue um, results in a heavy burden on working class neighborhoods. While people in wealthy areas can retreat in gated communities, residents in areas that I represent like Logan Heights and Barrio Logan, are faced with these conditions every day. So I truly believe that this situation is unsafe and needs to be addressed. However, I think it needs to be addressed with a real enforcement plan. A six-slide uh, PowerPoint presentation is not a real enforcement uh, plan. A real, a real plan would lay out the goals of enforcement and match it 
with sufficient resources to meet them. There are no new resources proposed for the enforcement of this ordinance. And by contrast, the enforcement plan for street vending ordinance proposed 44 new positions and $5 million in new funding. Now, this is not a small point, right? Passing a new law with no real plan for enforcement will achieve, in my opinion, very little. The emails that I've received in support of this ordinance all mention removing encampments on sidewalks and from canyons. Presentation today suggests we're years away from that level of enforcement. With no new resources, the city will only have the capacity to deal with a handful of schools and parks each month, which is far short of what even, what, um, even the supporters of this ordinance are calling for. Now, there is a long history of this city overpromising, promising um, but failing to deliver on reducing homelessness, and I don't want this to continue. The public and the council deserve to see a real enforcement plan before this ordinance is approved. And in order to provide staff with ample time to complete an enforcement plan and the police department training bulletin, I would move to continue this item to September 12th 2023 and request that a written enforcement plan and a final draft of the training bulletin for police officers be provided to the council and the public. That concludes my comments. All right, um, we have a motion to continue um, from council member Moreno. Um, do we have a second to that motion? All right. um, absent one um, that will, um, that will, um, the motion to continue will will die and will um, can i finish yeah 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 absolutely thank you about 30 um, seconds left sorry without the inclusion of an enforcement plan that clearly lays out, lays out goals and associated resources i cannot support this ordinance today and i will be voting no on this motion thank you councilmember moreno all right um, we will now go to council president pro tem montgomery step um, thank you for the presentation. There's still quite a few of us in here. Um, so I, I want to first start off by saying that my community members also called my office about unauthorized encampments. Um, we deal with the neighborhood policing division. Uh, oftentimes it has been reported uh, in the um, reports we get at the mid-year about the, the collaboration with community and in particular um, Imperial and Euclid and what police officers have done there in response to community concerns about encampments there. Um, by the way, it, those were removed based on the previous laws. Um, and they were removed successfully after contacting folks that were living in those encampments um, and asking if they wanted or needed shelter. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that this is an issue that we deal with in our communities um, almost daily, probably not the way that downtown does, but certainly we, we try to strike a balance there and I will continue to do that. However, I, um, I don't think that what we have before us today is going to satisfy what people think it will satisfy. Um, I, I really, and I, I am not being facetious, but I really want to know the process of arresting a drug dealer. Can we arrest drug dealers? This is an issue that I've had, right? And I just wanna know the process because we're hearing about crimes that none of us want to see or witness or be a part of. Um, and I'm, I think that there is a distinction. Um, and so I wanna know what is the process when we see a, a drug dealer taking advantage of vulnerable people. How do we handle that currently? Uh, Council President Pro Tem, yes, 
the San Diego Police Department is committed to enforcing uh, narcotics violations, specifically your, your question about drug dealers. Um, we have undercover narcotics officers, detectives, that go out um, to locations. Um, they have to witness the transaction. Um, and then when we apprehend an individual, we have to have the evidence that supports that the individual was in fact dealing narcotics. And we do that on a daily basis. So I can, I can assure you that we do have um, our police response is addressing narcotic sales. And do we do that with it encampments now? I do know that our narcotics unit does go down to Imperial Avenue, uh, 17th and Imperial down in, in, in that location, yes. The frequency, I, do, I don't know, but I do know that they do go down to that location. Okay, thank you for that answer. Captain, when you talked about the process for enforcement, um, my concern is that if we ask someone do they want shelter? And then they say yes, and then we don't have it. How that erodes the trust, I think, that we're trying to build. So have you experienced, what has been your experience in having the process outlined in that way? Yes, that has been brought to my attention, where when we contact an individual and they say yes, the current process is through coordinated intake, and so we will ask a series of questions then we will relay that information to the coordinated intake um, pro system. And then unfortunately, right now, we are told that there is not a match for that individual. So it does, um, it does prove to be difficult. That's why I'm highly encouraged about 20th and B. I'm highly encouraged about the O lot um, because I think it's gonna overcome those hurdles. Yes, I definitely appreciate that. And I do wanna say I appreciate Councilmember Whitburn and the work that you have done on this uh, along with in, in the mayor uh, as well. Um, I, I still don't think the numbers are there uh, with the upcoming sites that we have going online in order to mitigate um, this process. Um, and I also am wondering about, about the new amendment around the parks and um, determining whether there's a significant public health and safety risk. I am also concerned that certain parks will get prioritized and, and my main concern with regard to that is the fact that community groups were um, pitched this ordinance and I believe that that was a part of the pitch that um, all parks would be covered. Is that accurate or no? Uh, Council Member, let me speak to how we're going to develop which parks will be, certain parks, which ones will have signage and be intended for enforcement. Um, we anticipate developing administrative regulations or something similar to that effect um, that will set the standard and outline that process. So that could potentially include number of incidents, maybe wildfire risk, other indicators of significant health and safety impacts. And we're gonna develop that list both by looking at data like from Get It Done reports, but also in consultation with council offices and our constituents. We know not everybody uses Get It Done. We wanna put those lists together in consultation with, um, with your offices. Uh, and then of course, we will have the city attorney's office review that list um, to make sure that we have the facts supporting the health and safety um, standard that's been set forward on the record today. That will be posted publicly. It can evolve as population shifts, as you know, new parks see uh, potentially uh, change in the number of encampments there. We can add parks to that list and continuously update it. Okay. Do we have a lot of studies and a lot of audits? We created a whole office to deal with equity. Our neighborhoods don't get treated the same. And so what I'm concerned about is that the people in our neighborhoods will, will also not have access to resources because even in the first draft of this, there were only a few parks in, included. So I would just wanna put that on the record that just even in doing something that I don't, don't necessarily agree with, um, it's still unfair. <laughs> it's still being distributed unfairly in our neighborhoods. Last thing. In March, um, we had uh, SDSU researchers present a paper to us 
um, titled Black Lives Experiencing Homelessness Matter, a critical conceptual framework for understanding how policing drives uh, system avoidance among vulnerable populations. And that study found that when people experiencing extreme poverty, they face apathy, discrimination, and disrespect from police, the result is a reluctance to seek services proactively as well as to engage with, out with outreach when offered. Do we think that this ordinance, based on what we have before us so far, will contribute to people not wanting to accept services and continuing to erode trust based on the way it's set up right now? Or have we considered that? Do we think that's not the case? No, we believe this ordinance will encourage more people to accept services. Okay. And how will we track that, I guess? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Council, I, I would like to, uh, the opportunity to address it, and I think one of the other council members asked something, Councilman Lee asked something similar. I mean, I would refer you to the, this morning's U Union Tribune. When they were interviewing homeless individuals, who the 60-something-year-old woman, Mrs. Higgins, who said, if this passes, I guess I'm going to go to a shelter now. That coupled with the enhanced services that we're pro anticipating providing, the additional safe sleeping sites, the answer to your question is yes, because the message will be sent that it's no longer acceptable to deteriorate on the sidewalk, and that we will have people making offerings for more slots and more availability, not just the two safe sleeping sites, but everything you saw in the comprehensive shelter plan. So between the combination of more opportunity, coupled with more consequences for turning down the services that you know from our outreach workers and our police officers get turned down way more than they ever get ex offers of uh, acceptance. This will change that paradigm. That will bring more people into care and reduce the number of unsheltered individuals living on the streets of your district, Councilmember Montgomery Stepp, your district, Councilmember Lee, your district, Councilmember Moreno. It's your choice. Well, I, I think... You'll do it through the additional service offerings that are provided, plus the consequences. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the word of someone who's currently living on the street tonight who says she would accept shelter if this passes. Uh, okay. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Um, Ms. Jones, I have one last question, and I, you answered it. I just need, I'm sorry, it's late, 10 o'clock. And thank you for giving me additional time. When will the updated plan be coming before this council? So it'll be coming through the Leadership Council in July, which means we would probably get it to council and committee in September uh, for updated numbers. Okay. As well as any action items that's happened in the past year since last year's update. Can we have that plan address this particular ordinance? We did the plan did talk about criminalization. Yes, it um, is one of the key. It, will it pick this up too? We can certainly have the consultant also weigh in um, as well in how to um, implement it, this in a person-centered fashion should it pass. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem. We will now go to Council Member Campillo. Thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you to our city staff today for the presentation. Um, just before we get into the issues, uh, Council President, I want to thank you for standing up for our city staff earlier and enforcing the rules in that situation. I followed exactly what was happening from start to finish, and our city clerk staff acted appropriately, so thank you for enforcing the rules in that moment. Um, now, uh, Councilmember Whitburn, I regularly see you and members of your staff speaking with unsheltered individuals around City Hall, on the roads and streets in downtown, and helping them. In our first year in office, I remember uh, taking a 15-minute phone call in the breezeway, and when I started that phone call, I saw you speaking with a homeless person, and when I left, you were still speaking to that homeless person. Uh, and I'm sure you did all you could reasonably do to help that person and be supportive at that moment, and I'm sure that's not the only time you've done that. So I take deep issue with anyone saying that Councilmember Whitburn walks over anyone or that he treats anyone like a political football uh, because anyone who thinks that, that uh, 
he has anything but a caring mind for people who are suffering, simply doesn't know Stephen Whitburn. Lastly, before I get to the main issue, I want to emphasize something about legislation. To say that we must only pass laws that have only upside to everyone and no downside to anyone is practically impossible, and it's an impossible 